Good morning. Good morning, John. Good morning, Sammy. Good morning. Uh, Nicholas. Uh, not too bad. How is everything? Mm -hmm. Look who's here. Good to see yeah, you. Alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Salam, salam from Paisan, Chief. All good. How about you? All good? Looking well? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor. Yes. So you, you are in for a big feast today. You've got a long um, list of lectures, all by yes. great experts. I'm so happy to be part of this. Let me see. Thank you, you for accepting the fight. No, no. Why not? Do you want to okay. share this screen? No, we will just start in two minutes. Okay, so you're not ready. Yeah, I'm just putting the code on now. Okay. So how was yesterday? I'm sure it would be great. But sorry, I was operating whole day, so I didn't get a chance to see. Yeah. So we have stand for uh, 16 hours of non-stop yeah, education. <laughs> and we have a lot of fun. <laughs> This is this is a genus record, and we may uh, meet more in the future. Oh, brilliant! But I think the people get tired, so you need to take breaks. I think it's important. <laughs> How you been, Salman? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pretty good, but, uh, but, John. Hey, you look I, well. I tell you, we yesterday was our best day ever. I mean, we had the speakers were all on. You know what I mean, and and they even hung around after they finished to, to <laughs> kind of to kind of watch. That that showed me it really was good. You know, that they mm -hmm. hung around, so that was really neat. Okay, uh, do I have? I think it's amazing okay, what you guys are doing. Okay, to as go. long as it's recorded, so it's available for all. So if if someone need to take rest, he will take rest and come back and do which videos. It's something for the history. Brilliant. That never. Thank you. Okay, John, we can start now. Okay, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, Good morning, this is Dr. John Bennett from Miami, broadcasting from the home of uh, Neurosurgical TV, Miami Beach. We have the eighth uh, EWNS uh, Neurosurgical TV collaboration. We had a great day yesterday, Saturday. Today is Spine Day, and let, we'll let Sam, Sam run the proceedings. Good morning, Sam. Good morning, John. Good day for every one of you. Thanks a lot for joining us for the second day of our celebration. It's EWNC Academy, Spine Day. For the past eight years, we didn't stop learning and teaching new surgery, and it's research for eight years of non-stop, even a minute. And now we will start our Spine Day celebration by talk of my dear brother, Dr. Salman Sharif, which have Great assistant to me to put an all eminent speaker for today. Please, the brother, start sharing your screen. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, I'm grateful to John and to Sami and uh, to EWF and NS. I think, you know, you guys are doing a great job and to put this up both for brain and spine is really commendable. I think, uh, you know, all my friends uh, who were there yesterday and friends who will be there here today were really delighted. So uh, this is a talk that is on um, endoscopic lumbar discectomy and interlaminar talk. Um, and this is about tips and tricks for uh, young guys out there. So, you know, this, this is about uh, learning how to start, where to go, what to do when you're doing an interlaminar uh, endoscopic lumbar de decompression. Well, um, um, gold standard for treatment of lumbar disc herniation worldwide still is open microdiscectomy. MIS, endoscopic discectomy, dilating the paraspinal muscles and using tubular retractors and using an endoscope, it is thought 
that dilating the muscle rather than stripping the muscles decreases surgical morbidity. And many have proved that again and again. We wrote about this is full endoscope inter interlaminar lumbar discectomy um, gold standard yet. And we said many things about uh, the future that's going to come. And I think it's slowly and gradually it's proving to be right. Um, background microendoscopic discectomy started way back in 97. Uh, muscle splitting approach with serial tubular dilators, uh, tubular retractors, and special endoscope uh, to perform a discectomy. If you go back in history, I think you can see in 1934, Mixter and Barr um, explained the traumatic and degenerative origin of disc and its association with the sciatica. And then Forst and Hossman were the first insertion of modified arthroscope into a disc for direct visualization of the disc. This was way back in 1983. And then Camben described uh, his famous triangle, uh, which really evolved and changed things around. Smith of Foley introduced the microendoscopic discectomy system. And from then onwards, you know, it's the history is unbelievable. Uh, what are the advantages of minimally invasive surgery? Well, it can reduce post-operative pain because of less um, dis dissection, less cutting, less use of diathermy. There are tiny scars and shorter recovery time and shorter hospital stay. Um, obviously, when you use an endoscope, you're there directly onto the lesion. So you're improving your elimination. You have better focus on the spot. And there is superior circumferential view by application of angled optics. Obviously, it is less invasive, smaller, is less traumatic. We know this. What about the impact of muscle retraction? When we put in a retractor and dilate, what happens? Um, if you use an self ending retractors on paraspinal muscles, um, Taylor looked at this with 20 patients' intramuscular uh, pressure uh, measurements. 5, 30, 60 minutes into the surgery, and muscle biopsies were taken before and after retraction studied using ATP birefringence. And they found that was increase in IMP during retraction, reduced function following retraction. So they found decreased ATP in these patients, suggesting that you know, retraction for these times can cause problems to the muscle in that area, and obviously then significant pain. What is a the theoretical advantage of doing an MIS approach? Yeah, we talked about it, the minimal muscle trauma, maybe decreased scarring at the dura because of mini opening and higher magnification. So you're working with smaller instruments in smaller area and just specific to the spot. Significant patient demand, more and more people want it. Superior aesthetic results and less post-operative pain. So you could have a scenario like um, this in which you have a, a simple disc prolapse lying inside the canal, or you could have stenosis, or you could have a, um, a disc which is lying outside or in the canal itself, so exit foramen itself. So you know, whichever way you do this, this is uh, interlaminar approach is ideal for any of these um, uh, issues. So microendoscopic discectomy is slowly emerging as minimally invasive alternative to conventional microsurgical discectomy. And then we know that uh, slowly and gradually full interlaminar endoscopic discectomy is also taken over. And now newer versions are also available. Obviously, the results with endoscopic discectomy were not there. And now more and more people are thinking out of the box. And that's why trying to come up with newer versions. What about inter intralaminar endoscopic spinal discectomy? So it's a smooth transition from microscopic to microendoscopic discectomy and gives you a, an amazing view and anatomy and understanding of your surgery and technique with a reduced learning curve period. And there's no doubt about it. If you've done open before, then it's much easier so you know what exactly you're dealing with. Um, way back in 2013, Minamide uh, looked at 366 patients, microscopic, uh, uh, endoscopic assisted spinal decompression surgery for lumbar spinal stenosis. And they said that they looked at bilateral decompression via unilateral approach. So over the top approach, um, resection of the base of the spinous process, thereby preserving the supraspinous intraspinous ligament and contralateral uh, musculature was intact as well. And they looked at two years follow-up for 310 patients, and results were excellent in one-third of the patients, good in one-third, 
and fair and 20%. The results for poor and 8%. Um, in their initial period, they had 20 surgery-related complications with dural tear, wrong level operation, operation transient neuralgia, um, and infection. Obviously, the infection is much, much slow when you're using a tubular retractor and, um, or a microscopic or microendoscopic or um, uh, endoscopic uh, surgery. And this is because you have the tube as well that, you know, the skin is not being contaminated. All patients recovered. There was no serious post-operative complication. And their, their thing was that microendoscopic laminotomy is a safe and very effective, minimally invasive surgical technique for treatment of degenerated lumbar spinal stenosis. What about lateral resistenosis with interlaminar endoscope versus microscope? So Rutan looked at that with 161 patients with full endoscopic or microsurgical uh, decompression. Looked at VAS, the NAS instrument, and osphistory low back pain disability questionnaire. And they showed that three-fourths of these patients had no leg pain and 20% only occasional pain. So the results were fantastic. The clinical results were same in both groups at two years. So showing no difference. Complication revision was significantly reduced in full endoscopic uh, group. And I told you the reasons behind them. The clinical results of full endoscopic interlaminar technique are, are equal to that of microsurgical uh, technique. Advantages could be reduced trauma. Uh, what about uh, Sebastian Rotan's another study looked at, looking at 178 patients with endoscopic versus microsurgical? In these, 82% of patients no longer had leg pain, 14% had occasional pain. And they showed the clinical results of full endoscopic technique are equal to the, those of microsurgical techniques. Advantages in operative technique and reduced traumatization with the surgical device and possibility of selecting an interlaminar or posterior lateral to lateral transferminal procedure. Lumbar disc herniation outside and inside the canal can be sufficiently removed through the endoscopic technique. So they were very comfortable with these results and showing that equal results between microscopic and endoscopic approaches. What about the techniques? So I'm just going to focus on one particular type, which is interlaminar uh, lumbar discectomy. And this is for uh, comparing with the open versus um, endoscopic interlaminar. So we looked at this uh, EasyGo system, which is um, um, basically a, uh, came up uh, with the um, GAB, who came up with this um, particular system. And the advantage of this is it works exactly like the normal neurosurgeons work in, in an open discectomy. And you position exactly the same with decompression of abdomen and thorax. You give an skin incision, you use the dilators um, on the muscles, and you have an interlaminar fenestration, a localization of dura and nerve tissue. You do a sequestrami. Now we it is confirmed and we know that sequestrami and uh, uh, taking out the whole disc, uh, sequestrami have equal results. There's no difference. In fact, you can cause more harm when you take out the more disc in the majority of the patients. So root decompression is done, then evacuation of uh, spinal disc uh, segment, if indicated in particular cases when, you, when you're thinking about fusion, etc. Uh, so final tube looks something like this. So you put in a, a the smallest uh, tube to start with. You mark, and I'll show how you do that. And then you're, you put in dilators one by one, and then you eventually use uh, bring the uh, tubular retractor on top, the particular one that you want to use, and then you fix it. And obviously, um, then you can do your surgery with the endoscope. Um, skin incision has to be at least 1.5 to 2.3 centimeter. And the reason for that is you don't want to be causing risk of skin ischemia due to increased skin tension. You need to, if you give too small incision, you can cause problems with that. If you cause skin ischemia, you're going to have a risk of infection. So you don't want to be doing that. And the healing process will be delayed. And the whole advantage of doing a micro uh, minimally invasive case would be gone. So if we give an incision two centimeter paramedian to the midline, um, intraoperative fluoroscopes look something like this. We dock on the lamina, for example, if the disc is uh, just coming out on the disc space, then you, you need to direct your uh, tube, tube directly to that level. Um, and for example, in this particular case, L45, so we know that we'd have to partially drill 
part of the lamina here in order to get in into the space to take out the disc fragment, which is causing the problems. Um, it's important uh, that then uh, once you have given incision on the skin, you need to also incise muscle fascia. For that, you direct your um, knife down underneath a, a centimeter, two or three, depending on the size of the patient. And without the sufficient incision of this fascia, obviously you get compression of the paravertebral muscles at the tip of the working sheath. And then if you try to push the scope down, you will cause um, problems, bleeding, and the procedure could be aborted, and then you have to insert the work sheath again. So this is important that you cut the fascia before you do anything. Then position the trajectory of the trocar, depending on how uh, and where you go. For example, if there's a, a disc going above, then obviously you're going to be bringing it down like that. And so you can see the, where the disc is coming out and where the fragment is. If it's going down, obviously direct it down. And you can move the uh, tube during surgery itself. So the trajectory has to be perpendicular to the disc when you're just taking out the disc fragment, which is at the disc level only. And ideally, it has to be perpendicular uh, to the lamina. So you've got all the way down, so there's a minimal soft tissue present. Um, pitfalls, obviously, uh, you could, uh, you know, initially people were using needles, and with needle you could uh, perforate the dura and cause problems. Um, lamina has to be really looked at. Interlaminar window uh, is important for us, and dural sacking could happen, so you need to be careful with this. Tip of the crocar uh, not close enough to the lamina, obviously, then you will cause problems itself. So it ha you have to be on the lamina itself. You need to dock. And you can visualize ipsilateral and work in this fragment, or you can go into the opposite side and bring it like that, drill this, and you can take out uh, the stenosis on the other side as well. So this particular uh, technique, obviously, we can be shown that reduces tissue trauma, less trauma than standard microdiscectomy. There is integral uh, visualization, elimination, and it allows direct visualization, visualization of the nerve root and disc and enables bony de decompression unilaterally and bilaterally. There's a learning curve to using the system efficiently and safely, and uh, up to 20 patients is generally the recommended uh, learning curve for a, a good surgeon. Complications like dural tear can occur, can are difficult to repair, but really when you're putting a tube, majority of the time you do not need to repair. Um, I, if at all, any time I see su such a problem, either I do not repair if it's too small, if it's um, uh, a sizable um, uh, tear, then I would put in a taco seal. But, you know, we don't see dural tear because of this high elimination. Uh, these instruments are delicate and you can, they can cause failure or you can break them if you're pushing or in the early phase of your um uh, experience, you can cause problems with uh, problems with the endoscope itself. Um, if you look at uh, complications of this particular system, is there any difference with uh, conventional discectomy during the learning curve period? So with 138 patients, 37 using the microendoscopic discectomy approach, 100 by conventional. Complications, 9% in microscopic and 8 in microscopic um, endoscopic approach. Uh, relief symptoms, so uh, microscopic less, whereas uh, endoscopic uh, uh, more. There were no revision surgery in microendoscopic and 10 in microscopic. Um, uh, there may be a bias of uh, the author in this, so we need to be careful, but you know, it shows a trend that you know, the results could be better. Uh, complications of endoscope with easy go, what about the learning curve? So up to 25 to 30 cases this particular study showed an adequate expertise in microscopic discectomy, a precise selection of initial cases, a proper surgical planning, and careful uh, technique, which are mandatory to avoid unnecessary neurological injury in these patients. Another study with 40 patients exactly showing the same thing, the statistically significant variable among many studies, length of incision greater in, uh, in, in these uh, open, length of hospital space more, and operative time greater in microendoscopic when you're starting out. You need a drill uh, with a match head and as well as um, diamond, and, and you could drill just like that on your side and to the opposite side. 
uh, and you see the contralateral side and you can see the nerve root and decompress the opposite side as well without any problem with this. So let me just show you this small uh, video. And if I can fast forward it, so you dock, you see exactly where you're gonna go. Uh, this is the patient with the, a large disc fragment. And you drill initially with match head and then with diamond. Then you open up, obviously open the ligament. And then use a hook and a knife to um, cut the annulus and the, dura, the nerve root is retracted with this small retractor. And you once you've given an inc incision and then open up with a scissor, the disc comes out. Okay, let's see. So what about an intralaminar approach instead of interlaminar approach? So, you know, you need microsurgical instruments which are specific, there are various uh, sheets that you, should be available and you, you need to practice and learn from these. So this is simple steps of the same thing with putting an initial tubular retractor, then uh, keep on increasing the size, then going in, making sure, and then you dock uh, in the end and just connect coming from the top. So these are the multiple steps showing um, the same thing and the disc coming out. And it's really precise, you know, up to um, uh, 1.5 to 2 centimeter incision. Obviously, HD endoscopes are much better than the um, old endoscope. We use an uh, orange trocar, which is about um, with opening a fort into 6 millimeter. And it's uh, better results, better cosmetic results, reduced scarring. And it's been shown in multiple studies uh, since we've been using that. Uh, and it is much, much, much easier. Let me see if we can play this. So just initial diathermy and create a space. And uh, just remove the disc and go on. So inter, inter, uh, intralaminar approach is that we make an opening in the lamina and not open the whole of lamina. So it's a small incision with a smaller uh, tube. And it's possible to perform this when, you know, studies have shown that it has beneficial e effects compared to the bigger scope. So endoscopic spine surgery, there's reduced muscular trauma by use of sheath system. The smaller the sheet, the, uh, the smaller the muscular and soft tissue damage, the higher the necessity of application of an endoscope. They have, we know that uh, superior aesthetic results are there, and more and more studies are showing better results with that. Um, uh, same outcome with less muscular damage and superior cosmetic results. Endoscopy is playing a significant role in the treatment of degenerative spine disease and will continue to do so for some time. So thank you. It was really my pleasure to giving this talk. Thank you, uh, Dr. Professor uh, Salman Shri, for this uh, excellent nice presentation. Is there any question from panelist? I see I Dr. Atul. I I see <laughs> Atul and I smile every you know, Atul and we go a long way. <laughs> we we want to make a moderator today. <laughs> Salman, that was a great presentation. Obviously, you have done a lot in endoscopic and minimal invasive techniques. <clears throat> the way you do the confidence that you have in doing what you are doing is wonderful to see. I watched all your surgical steps and all, and I know who is going where and how he is going. I can smell. So I can smell some wonderful things, Salman. My best, I should not say best wishes, best wishes to each of us. And let's go further in our journey of learning and probably a little bit disseminating information on spine. Thank you, Atul. I think I think you know we learn a lot from you, and we um, I keep following you all over the world. I think you're doing a great job, uh, and we keep bumping into each other in various places, and and we'll continue to do so. Nicholas has a question. Uh, good morning from Thessaloniki, Greece. It is a great uh, pleasure to see you all. It's, uh, great friends such as uh, Atul Goel and you, Salman. A great presentation as always uh, for all of us young neurosurgeons around the world. 
Uh, your comments are uh, valuable as always. Uh, but uh, uh, as I have to mention that we have to uh, first to, uh, to be training in the open techniques and the classical techniques and after to to try to, to do endoscopic techniques. A young neurosurgeon, a young spine uh, surgeon has, uh, has to do, to, to be trained in the classical techniques and after to try the endoscopic techniques. So I think uh, you are, uh, you are agreeing in this topic, okay. I totally agree. Um, I think if you have experience of open surgery, then these surgeries become easier. And obviously what's happened is in many of our Western countries where the workload is not that much, uh, people have to do more MIS uh, because that's the demand. Um, but, you know, they can learn with cadavers, but especially with cadavers, uh, in, you know, if they are fresh frozen, then it's very, very good. But in, in some cases, it may not be as good simulators. So I think they need to travel to some other countries where there's more open work happening and learning, teaching, and uh, you know, uh, giving knowledge both ways. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Salman, for this excellent presentation and nice discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Thank you, John. And now we'll shift to next speaker, uh, Dr. Shane. Please start sharing the screen. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hello. Oh, OK. Uh, my name is Shen Ming Kui. Uh, you can call me Dr. Shen. Uh, I am the next speaker. Uh, OK, I will share my speaker topic. OK. Mm. Hello, can you see my screen? Yes, please. Okay, please go ahead. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, firstly, uh, I'm very th thanks to uh, Professor uh, Summer <coughs> for your request to attend the 18th EW NC Academic and new countries. Uh, today, my lecture is uh, to introduce the work of the mini, minimally invasive span surgery in the Third People's Hospital of Henan Province, uh, China. The title of my speech is Advanced in Struggle of uh, Technology Leads the Destructive uh, Growth. OK, uh, this is my resume. I am Shen Mingkui. Uh, you can call me Dr. Shen, the Associate Director of the Minimally Invasive Span Surgery Center. Uh, <clears throat> Spinal Minimally Invasive Surgery is the development of the Third uh, People's Hospital of Henan Province, which is located in uh, Zhengzhou City, Henan Province. Uh, our development uh, mainly treats uh, Degenerative disease of the spinal of the span through the minim minimally invasive technology of uh, spinal abdomen. Our department has been treated at, as the Chinese National Clinical Key Specialty and the Medical Key Cultivation Discipline uh, of Henan Province. In addition, our department have two wards and uh, uh, 29 doctors. Uh, Secondly, our department adopts the, the, primary, <coughs> the primary physician model response for the TIF export and the three level of uh, physician runs the diagnosis and the treatment model uh, for daily disease uh, diagnosis and the treatment. The, our department uh, includes two words, a clinical research translation station and a specialist alliance and a comprehensive service department. Uh, our department has been uh, divided into spinal sub uh, uh, specialties, including uh, cervical spondylosis, uh, thoracic spondylosis, uh, lumbar spondylosis, and so on. Uh, we believe that uh, clear. Position sensitive, 
uh, deep fields to release the change in medicine. <coughs> and uh, uh, the highlights of uh, our department, uh, firstly, <coughs> firstly, uh, uh, our department uh, conduct spinal endoscopy training since uh, 2019, uh, 164 sessions have been held to the up. Three, the trainers come from more than uh, five, uh, 600 hospitals and nearly uh, 4,000 doctors from all over the China, India, Singapore, uh, Pakistan, Iran, uh, and other countries. At present, uh, the spinal endoscopy training class has been scheduled to the January uh, to 2022, uh, 25. <clears throat> Secondly, the highlights of our development, uh, Alice, uh, is uh, we hold the training course on spinal endoscopy minimal invasive scan and the spinal endoscopy uh, chairly enter operation technology. At present, uh, uh, the only one in China has completed uh, the minimal invasive training course of spinal endoscopy in our hospital, uh, which integrates uh, live surgery, uh, thoracic tilting, highlight and spectacle uh, simulation operation, the whole uh, spans uh, simulation oper operation, and uh, the course operates uh, 103 sessions has been held every month with more than two, uh, four uh, thousand uh, training persons and uh, uh, 30,000 uh, 30, uh, online class room exchange per season. Uh, the third one, our the form of cooperation in specialist legals are uh, general cooperation, closed cooperation, and uh, deep cooperation. Mm. <clears throat> there are more than 100 uh, hospitals, the securities and the presence uh, in China, uh, who leads their team to visit and exchange our uh, department. Our center, the doctors were invited to prefer, uh, perform surgery and uh, academic uh, lectures in 100 uh, of uh, hospitals in China and uh, the annual operation uh, vo uh, volume outside the hospital has reached more than uh, 1,000 case, cases. Uh, in addition, our department uh, holds uh, multiple professional experts uh, during the uh, large-scale public aware uh, free clinic uh, starting from uh, uh, the 2021, uh, 16 large-scale published aware free medical consultations uh, Consultations uh, jointly con uh, conducted by experts from more than one province uh, were held in China. And, uh, uh, and we also hold uh, uh, multiple province experts uh, during the uh, like, la larger scale uh, warfare, the uh, cl uh, free clinic, spinal consultation. Center of Spinal Experts from many hospitals in China has joined uh, 2016. Uh, 60 consultation every uh, Thursday. A total of uh, 2016 patients were consulted. <clears throat> Thirdly, the position of our department in the specialty uh, China field are listed as follows. The first one, we have established a special academic uh, committees uh, uh, for our department. The second one, we hold, uh, uh, our department have held academic conference from 2015 to uh, 20, 20, uh, 23. <clears throat> the third one, our uh, centers uh, doctors were invited to uh, 
attend the famous academic conference for promoting minim minimally invasive spinal technologies. We also published uh, one book. The book is uh, Practical Technology of Cervicals uh, Through Lotsin's uh, Lambro Spinal Endoscopy. Uh, <clears throat> in scientific research, uh, we also published uh, uh, many academic uh, papers in terms of spinal degeneration and uh, uh, minimal invasive treatment. In addition, our, in our center, uh, eight scientific research projects uh, were approved. Our department uh, has applied for uh, 11 national patients. Uh, and finally, uh, our department has been granted the two medical science and the technology awards of Honan province. Uh, in, to, in 2023, our department established the clinical application of uh, uh, RD transformation center of spinal minimal invasive surgery robot. And uh, <clears throat> in 2020, uh, our department uh, uh, de established the China uh, the China German spinal minimal minimally invasive technology exchange center. <clears throat> the last part is the discipline of uh, discipline development plan of uh, our department. The first one is uh, we have uh, development uh, the work of uh, 2024. Uh, work plan of uh, our development. Uh, the second one is uh, we will uh, uh, to develop and popularize the, the standardization of uh, minimally invasive spinal surgery te technology at home and abroad. <clears throat> the third one is uh, uh, the strategy coverage with my, uh, cooperatives promote the development of meaningful, minimally invasive spinal surgery. <clears throat> Importantly, the constru construction of spinal minimally invasive surgery, scientific research, experiments, uh, plan uh, platform, the implantation manners are the experiments uh, platform cooperation outside of the hospital. <clears throat> Establish clinical and scientific research library of our department in Henan province in 2024. Uh, the other is we will determine the, our uh, department the clinical and research direction. Uh, we have the determined the, the seven directions in our uh, in our department. Uh, the thinking and the, the prospects. Uh, we want to we want to build a, a national region medical center. My presentation is over. Thank you for your listening. I wish this meeting is a complete success. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Doctor Shen, for this nice presentation. And I hope we can uh, make more collaboration with our Chinese guys and friends to uh, break in the borders between us and the world. Thank you, Dr. Shen. Thank and you, Sam. Uh, uh, do you have some questions? Uh, maybe my English language is not good. Uh, so uh, uh, you can... It, it will become more better in the future. Thank you. And Thank you, Sam. And now shift to next speaker, uh, Dr. Song. Please start okay. sharing your screen. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello, uh, Dr. Simon and uh, every, uh, every friend on the land. I'm Dr. Song from the people, people of the province, China. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, everyone? Yes. yes. Please start sharing your screen. Um, it's, it's time to, for uh, for my lecture. 
I'm sorry, the Dictionary can't log in online. Uh, we uh, could have you screen, we... share your screen, please? Could you share? Your okay, screen? no problems. Okay. 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 Can you hear my PPT? Yes, LC. please uh, make it. Okay. Sorry. Oh. Yes, that's it. Perfect. Okay, hello everyone. I'm Dick uh, Chesong from from China. Uh, today I give. Um, I'm very happy to join. Uh, uh this conference is my player. Uh, and a very great honor to to join this conference. Um. The my lecture name is an important end of your BD for the uh, Excuse me, excuse me. I'm, so sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but the screen okay. is completely black, right? Sam, is the, is, is the screen oh. black? I see is, it uh, here. Okay, for is, myself. Is it okay, the screen? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Continue, please. Sorry. Okay, okay. You, you can okay? start again. Okay. okay. Oh, okay. Uh, as we all, uh, as we all know, number number spinostonosis is one of the most common de gener uh, generative disease of the span span in elderly patients. This in studies reach is second only to number disease coordination. The main the main pathogenic factor included lumbar disc formation and uh, percussion, uh, hyperplasia and uh, cohesion of fractured joints, and uh, hypertrophy of uh, ligamentary fibrum, hyperplasia of the posterior edge of the end plate, the instability of lumbar span, uh, spandid uh, spandid um, in the past, the, the main surgical options for lumbar spinal stenosis, including a, a traditional open fixation, uh, fixation, uh, fixation fusion uh, and uh, mischief. However, the most patients fear surgery and, and uh, post uh, operative complications such as uh, paralysis and uh, give up treatments. Master uh, cabin discovered uh, the safe triangle area on the uh, lateral side of the span, opening a new door for minimally invasive endoscopic surgery for the treatment of lumbar disc cognition and uh, becoming a life saving straw for elderly lumbar degeneration degenerative disease. This is a full visual spinal endoscopic surgery tool and jointly developed by the Southern People's Hospital of Hunan Province, China, including a threaded wide channel and a visual ring saw. From a traditional TCS technology in 2010 to UDC technology in 2015, to, to data wide channel endoscopic uh, technology in 2018, the era of spinal endoscopic has used in rap rapid development. In 2019, we con we conducted a full visual endoscopic uh, and rear cervical fusion and uh, lumbar fusion. And in 2020, we Conducted UVE and uh, computer neg 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 navigation technology. 
for elderly patients, we can adopt a literal um, 270 bone decompression to complete to completely release the spinal canal. The only drawback is that most of the is lateral um, articular process needed to be removed. Spinal love technology was first proposed by Professor Yan Ming from the Third Clinical Medical College of Tangchun University of traditional Chinese medicine, and we are the first to carry out it, which means using spinal anesthesia for traditionally lumbar small uh, transfusion surgery to achieve the standard of completely compression of the dura matter and the nerve roots. The technology above endolab is endo ULBD. We often use local um, filtration and unnecessary com combined with the basic uh, necessary to expand and uh, decompression the narrow spinal canal from the back and uh, complete, completely release the nerve roots. Of course, we can also use the nostalgic of uh, uh, for, for, for endoscopic field surgery, such as endopilif or pilif, as shown in the diagram, uh, which is faced with screw in the articular process of the spinal lam lamina. The posterior lumbar um, laminectomy, uh, laminectomy was first the Proposed by Dr. Love in 1939 and then applied for, to the treatment of lumbar uh, disc in 2019. After 2015, we first applied the fusion few viral secular sore technology to uh, replicate L5 to S1 posterior laminectomy and local and necessary to treat lumbar disc condition. We found that in addition to the cause of intervertebral foramen and the vertebral instability, L5S1 uh, intervertebral disc condition in the axillary and the spread shoulder spine type and can be minimally invasive treated. Because the intervertebral window increased from small to large, from top to bottom, and the intervertebral from decreases from large to small, it is suitable to open the vertebral plate first for the case with very small vertebral plate windows especially in the L5S1 segment, which is the most common. The standard for open, opening a window in the posterior vertebral plate, in my opinion, is to open a window for decompression if either the widest or height is less, less or equal to eight uh, centimeter. Generally, type 1 and the type 2 interlumbar windows, uh, windows are large, and there is no need to expand the interlumbar window, except for severe uh, 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 L5 to S1 disc, disc per, uh, per lumpers and the sequestrator. Uh, Sequence there the lumbar disc condition. Both the type 3 and the type 4 need to expand the interlumbar window. Due to, due to the limited field of vision of the operation and the endoscopic, um, the working can cannula is positioned behind the inner lumbar window 
it is easy to find the lower edge of L5 lumbar uh, lamina under the endoscopy. We will expand the interlaminal window from the middle to the outside. From the head side of to the minimally invasive, and we need to know what nerve structures are under each saw. During the operation, we need to control the depths of the viral uh, circular saw to avoid damaging the dural sac or nerve root. This is a 38 years old case of L5S1 disc pro, uh, prolapse. According to the preoperative DR examination, uh, the interlaminal window belongs to a type 3, like uh, symbols to uh, the, the, like, like, like symbols omega and uh, nostrils. So we can easily remove the nucle uh, nu nucleus purpose by two uh, by two to three source with viral secular saw, which is very simple and uh, efficient. So, so the in the first stage of uh flu uh flu uh flu, in, in the first stage of fluoroscopy uh, position, and the working sleeve is inserted. Is inserted uh, vertically into the intervertebral space. And the second stage is the opera operation under the microscope. Firstly, it is necessary to clean the soft tissue on the vertebral page. Fully expose the ligamentary fibrin, ligamentary fibrin between the vertebral plates. The connection between the upper and the lower vertebral plates and the ligamentary fibrin and the junction from the upper and the lower articular processes. In the third stage, the re or reinstore is usually used to uh, secondary touch the is. Uh, you see literal uh, ligamentary flippum from the head to the tail. In the fourth stage, clean the inner uh, cantilateral uh, lower articular process and some upper articular process from the roots of the venous process to achieve complement uh, decompression. This is a, uh, a schematic uh, diagram of the operation uh, sequence for o for URBD uh, over the top. And generally, the first step uh, is to locate the ligament uh, ligamentary fibrin between the uh, vertebral plates. The next to the lower edge of the vertebral plate to the head side, and finally locate the upper edge of the lower vertebral plate to the tail that is of the ligamentary fibrin. However, the root of the intermediate uh, spinous processes is often left to the last step of processing. This is an idea result of after uh, uh, over the top with window compression, namely uh, uh, one of the topics uh, topics one shared is ULPD treatment uh, for severe lumbar spinosis in L5, L4525. This is the cases and this is the x ray. We can see the the people on um, the the chair, uh, very uh, degeneration is very uh, severe. And the MR, we can see L425 level. Uh, the stenosis is very uh, serious. And, and the, the CD scan. It also and the 
of the of this the operation. And then the after operation, post operation, we can see the decompression is very well. The C scan. Okay, the case two uh in the then PTD for severe um lumbar spinosis uh, so this is the basic information uh, is of the man with 30 years old and then his post uh post leg post leg sunnies uh, and the numbness this is the case of, this is the our x-ray scan this is again the SCT scan we can see the L4 to 5 is also severe stem stenosis. And the MRI is also. The case 3 and the PDF. And this is the process. And the implant cage. Okay, we can see the video after the universal PD. Yes, we can see the thoracic and uh, both, uh, both uh, uh, nerve roots. And the underpage is uh, okay. Okay, and the implantation of screws through the uh, spinous process. This is after the uh, surgery DR. The case is after, uh, the, after the post operation MR and the SCT scan post operation. Post operation. The case, the case four is endotelia for a uh, lumbar uh, unis 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 lumbar stemen spinal This is the case information, X-rays and the CT and the MR is also L two four to five and the position. Uh, place the guide wire. Is the after uh, post operation in DR? Yes, the C scan and the MRI. And you take the home. The take home message is that to body viral spinal uh, spinal endoscopy technology is. Uh, currently, the most uh, efficient, safe, either to master and widely use the spinal endoscopic technology. The main indications for endopedic or PDF are the degenerative lumbar spinal uh, uh lumbar instability, intervertebral space collapse, uh, gene uh, disc herniation, uh, prolapse. And the recurrent disc condition, it is a supplement and uh, upgrade to PLD and the uh, UVLPD, Min minimally invasive technologies. It's in my inform information. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. This is my, my team. Thank you, Dr. Simon. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sung, for uh, this nice presentation. Is there any questions? No, I'd just like to comment. Uh, it's, it's nice to see how they do things in other parts of the world. I'm not a neurosurgeon, but that was very enjoyable. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very yes. much. Thank you. And my leader, Dr. Yang, uh, is online. So next. Uh, Welcome, Dr. Yang, give us the lecture. Thank you.
انا اول شفت تو نيكست سبيكر دكتور يان هي ويل سبيك تو اس اباوت يو بي اي فو تي او ال اف Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Yang Hejun uh, from China. The Third People's Hospital of Henan Province. This is uh, my hospital. Uh, it's in Zhengzhou City. This is my team. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for the invitation and uh, congratulate uh, on the complete success of the conference. The current uh, minimal invasive techniques of spinal endoscopy include unipotal endoscopy and uh, bipod endoscopy. After more than 10 years of development, Unipod to endoscope has become major, uh, but it's still difficult to deal with some complex uh, problems. On the other hand, uh, bipod to span endoscope has a view port and a work port. Uh, it has a wide field of vision and a large operating space. It can achieve the goals and results of uh, open surgery and endoscopic view vision. Therefore, the UV techn technology is becoming more and more popular among spinal surgeons. Our UV technology began in 2020, but after three years of development, development we carry out more than 1,000 UB operations every year. On the basis of a large number of clinical applications, we have sub-raised the standardization process of UB technology and done some work on the promotion and the popularization of the UB technology. Starting from uh, 2021, we Excuse me. We just see your first slide. Can you move slides? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Starting from uh, 2021, we recruit uh, one star doctors from China and the international students from more than 10 countries for short term visits. We hold a monthly uh, live broadcast of UB Secure to far 34 issues had been held. We have every uh, average of more than 200,000 viewers for each issue. And uh, we hold a spine in couch UB, UB technology standardized public uh, welfare broadcast at uh, seven. Every night on Tuesday, including his introduction and uh, operation video explanation with more than 10,000 participants in each session. It has become a pro 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 followed by many spinal min minimally invasive and seizures. Team was invited to accomplish with good medical skills the largest orthopedic uh, professional training institution in China. At present, it has conducted 10 training sessions complete 
simulating usage at present more than 300 students have participated in the training. Uh, but what is the real uh, spend image? Immersive, uh, minimally invasive spend surgery. I think the most important thing is the minimally invasive nature of the soft tissues. The clear surgery view. Invasive is of the spinal nerves during the procedures. Also, casing of the leg, leg ment flow of stress, but for op operations, the spinal cord and the lead to Paralysis. The, tradi the traditional ovarian surgery is comprised by posterior laminectomy, which has the advantages of great trauma, hair risk, and the complications of spinal cord injury. On the other hand, UB technology is safer to deal with. T well, it can be operated through a clear and dark scope field of viewing, and the wolf can be seen layer by layer with a grading view, which can achieve no image of the spine cord during the operation, which ensures the safety of the operation. Therefore, UB, the UB technology is a safe and uh, reliable way to deal with QRF. And we can see this case, it's a P910 QRF. Before the operation, we can see the span coach is Significant compressed through MI and CT. Out the UB surgery, you can see that the decompression is very surfacing. Through CT, we can see that the resection of OF and uh, at could add an adequate the compression of the spine cord <clears throat> and uh, complete only through a very small point window. Please listen to the UB story. The UB technology for beginners, the more difficult is how to establish a good how to and uh, quickly find the first view of vision. We first to establish the operation channel, insert the step by step is patient tube, then establish the viewport and finally confirm it by CRM. Then we insert the endoscopic, endoscopic shoes along the guide road of the V portal and then insert the endoscope into the shell so that we can quickly discover the tooth entering through the work pouch and quickly establish the first view of V.
during the operation, we need to relocate the segment to, con to confirm the correct segment and confirm the location of the initial point. We use the grading tool to remove a small hole and place the grading tool in the small hole for, pos for positioning, which is a safe way of positioning. Based on the position of the endoscopic positioning and uh, the pre operation image, the form image grading tool can be used to measure the range of the initial bone removal window. The application of grading tool air body grading is safe to avoid downward pressure. We need to gradually it cause the Jackson of the normal laminar and the ligament glue to ensure adequate decompression. We also need to compression the detail end of the upper edge of the inferior lamina. If we want to do bilateral decompression, we need to fully remove the base part of the spinal process so that there will be sufficient space for our contralateral decompression. We must be very careful when grading out the surface of the work to avoid downward pressure and to avoid damage to the spine curve. I was gradually revealing the outline of OF. It's one thing layer by layer. After confirming the, that there is no addition, between the OF and the dual match, and the OF can be lifted away from the surface of the spinal cord with a probe hole and then safely remove to avoid the true compression of the spinal cord. <laughs> When we complete the full decompression, this is the case of the 10, 11 of with dual ossification. For this case, we complete send the rough and then float to achieve a good decompression. You can see that the patient was able to work on the ground for four days after the operation. And six months after the operation, the patient can return to normal. And you can see the MRI so that the dual major sheet also recovered well. 
to see the nut case. It's T1 to T4. It's a simile. You can see the decompose. You can see that there are three small window wooden uh things out to the average. And for up to the surgery for four months, the patient worked normally and the sleep quality will return to normal complete. PP technology is safe and the a effective way to deal with TOF. What we see is a, com a complaint named fatal obfuscation of fatal obfuscation. The floating method can also achieve the purpose of the accomplish the application skills of grading juice need to be practiced on the basis of a large number of lumbar spinal pieces. So finally, I'd like to thank you again for the evaluation and welcome you to China. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wang, for uh, this nice presentation. Is there any question from anyway? No, I, yeah, Sam, I'd just like to comment. Uh, thank you very much for having the courage uh, because I know when you don't speak the language really well, it's very nerve wracking, but we could, uh, I could understand everything you said and I appreciate the courage you have to come, uh, uh, come to us and expose that part of the world. Uh, to us. Thank you. Actually, uh, I have insisted to involve our dear friends from China because they are doing a great job. But unfortunately, there is a language barrier that we have to break it through. Thanks a lot for joining us today. And now we will shift to next speaker, uh, Dr. Ma. Please start sharing your screen. Hello, everyone. Oh, good have Can you hear okay, me? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, yes. Yes. Oh, good afternoon, Hi, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, Tan Jun from the Third People's Hospital of Henan Province in China. Uh, I sincerely think uh, uh, Dr. Sammy, uh, for the invitation to this next meeting. My lecture is to describe the, uh, our experience with fully visualized spine endoscop endoscopy treatment of cervical-related disease. Uh, uh, first, uh, let's look at the development history of uh, spinal endoscopy. Uh, from 1983, Cabin's Tranger, uh, a safe, a safe posterior lateral approach to the late uh, 20th century, uh, unilateral bipolar uh, endoscopy. Uh, the spanner uh, endoscopy had a great development. Uh, with the con consistent with the, with, the, with the constant evolution of spinal endoscopy, the tools uh, related to spinal endoscopy are, con are constantly uh, being updated. From uh, uh, 2010 uh, classic Tessis technology to 2020 endoscopic surgery. Uh, there are three commonly used 
uh, spanner underscore b checklist uh, is for uh, four underscore p, bipolar underscore p, and uh, uh, micro underscore p. There are many merits and demerits uh, for these three common commonly uh, techniques. Uh, the merits is uh, less tissue damage. Uh, the, the channel itself can be used as a retractor and uh, using more than one action tool at a time. Uh, intervertebral in, implant placement, uh, example, uh, intervertebral cage and uh, bone graft uh, can be performed at the same time. And uh, independent operating channels and uh, ex extended visibility. And the last uh, um, rate is the better operating uh, space in water environments. And there are also some demerits uh, for these techniques. Uh, the first one is limit the uh, simultaneous use of multiple tools, and uh, the channel size limits the size of plants within the limit. The larger channel size uh, typically leads to more tissue destruction, and uh, the absence of uh, actual media helps provide a better circular view. Uh, two cutouts are required for dual channels and uh, uh, implants are, limi are limited in size. And the last one is technically and, uh, challenging. And there are two commonly used uh, spanner endoscopic approaches. Uh, the first one is the interlaminar uh, approach. Uh, the second one is the uh, foraminar uh, for, for, for approach. The interlaminar approach Use a pyramidal uh, incision to enter the central kernel and uh, uh, natural crafts through the laminar space, uh, primarily to relieve nerve compression uh, in the central and uh, natural craft area. The foraminal approach used a distal natural incision into the uh, foraminal region through the carbon tree angle and uh, is primarily used for uh, foraminal steolosis, uh, natural craft error. Where natural craft uh, or center killer nerve compression uh, secondary to uh, ventral disc herniation. However, when nation are uh, dorsal, example, facet uh, articulator hyper and uh, ligament of uh, flammary hyper surgery, uh, their capacity to handle them is limited. Uh, the prin prin principle of uh, four uh, visual endoscopic technique uh, for laminar endoscopic uh, removes the pressure on the nerve root by completely removing the herniated or prolapsed uh, nuclear per purpose and uh, hyperplastic bone outside the safety triangle uh, of the intervertebral uh, foramen and uh, the annular fibers of the uh, intervertebral disc, uh, eliminating the pain caused by the compression of the nerve. The uh, surgical method is the minimally invasive spinal uh, surgery system composed of specially designed foramenal endoscopic and the corresponding supporting uh, spinal minimally invasive cervical instruments, imaging and uh, uh, imaging processing system. Uh, the uh, the ex uh, expansion of under endoscopic spinal therapy for disease uh, from uh, in our center, uh, uh, from spine, spine degeneration uh, to the post-operative -op revival. Um, there, are, there, are, there are so many diseases we can use the, uh, the endoscopic, uh, endoscopic uh, spanners to... Uh, the cervical con uh, concept of a cervical endoscopy. Uh, we can see the anterior approach uh, the 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 incision length uh, is a uh, half centimeter, and the, the posterior posterior approach uh, the 
incision length is one centimeter. Uh, the clinical extension of posterior cervix endoscopic. Uh, the first one is uh, cervic red uh, pure retinal percy, and uh, the second one is nerve root uh, cranial steatosis, and the third one is cervical spinal steatosis, and the fourth is uh, and multi segment cervical spinal steatosis. Uh, the concept and the characteristics of posterior cervic endoscopy and the uh, cervic ROV, uh, open cervical endoscopic, uh, laminar uh, fenestration okay. under four endoscopic uh, significantly increase the range of activity of the work of the working cannula. The, the decompression range is more accurate and uh, controllable. Can complete the full decompression of the dorsal and the ventral sides of the nerve root, and the probability of damage caused by uh, disturbance and the traction of the nerve root and uh, during ca uh, capture during the uh, surgery is more. Uh, less damage is facing joints and almost no effects on sm uh, spinal. Uh, Stability. The number of the intraoperative uh, fluoroscopy is more, which is in line with the cervical habits of traditional surgeons, as long as there is open surgery experience. The learning uh, curve is short. Uh, the second one is the endocervic URPD. And the URPD surgery stems from the development of uh, spinal endoscopic technology and the, the traditional open surgery, small window ROVE technique, and te technical concept of microscopic surgery for spinal steatosis. Uh, this operation method is to remove the upper and lower, and lower laminar bone of the uh, uh, of the abs absent natural uh, laminar space through, uh, through the heteronatural laminar approach, resect the bone of the spinosis root obliquely to the root of the uh, spinosis process and uh, stick to the opposite side uh, to resect the inner layer of the uh, contranatural laminar to complete the decompression of the central spinal Color and uh, bilateral nerve roots. The third one is the endo endocervic heminaminectomy. Uh, Compared with the uh, total heminaminectomy, uh, heminaminectomy proves the facet and uh, cause less damage to the back of the neck muscles, uh, which ensures the dynamic and uh, static stability of the cervical spine after surgery and uh, reduce the in incidence of cavernous uh, deformity. At the same time, hemineminectomy can permanently uh, enlarge the spine in spinal canal because it uh, only removes half of the spinal uh, plate uh, equivalent to a, qu a quarter of the circular a circular firm, firm, uh, diameters of the uh, spinal canal and uh, can also effectively reduce the formation of uh, post-operative scarring. Uh, now let's, let, let's see three cases. Uh, case one uh, is a uh, 50 year, year old male. Uh, the symptoms is uh, neck and the shoulder with the left upper limb uh, pain, and let's say it's for three months. Uh, the sign is uh, cervix 5 to 6 and the 6 to 11, uh, 6, 6 to 7, uh, left perivertebral uh, uh, uh positive of the left branchial uh, flexor support test, and the positive of the neck flexion test. Uh, our our diagnosis is cervical uh, spondylotic and radiolopathy. 
there is uh, here is the uh, preoperative uh, examination the uh, the X ray uh, CT and uh, uh, MRI In MRI we can see the uh, herniated uh, herniated disc uh, the intraoperative monitoring. Uh, first, we can see the intraoperative uh, uh, localization, and uh, the video is uh, interoperative recording. Uh, after the surgery, uh, uh, we can see the uh, post-operative examination, uh, the post post post-operative CT and uh, post-operative uh, MRI, uh, the the herniate, the second case is the eighty-one years old female. Uh, the symptoms is numbness of hands and weakness of lower limbs for one year, aggravated activity limitation for half a year. The sign is uh, our cervix five, uh, 4 to 5 and 5 to 6, left perivertebral uh, tenderness, um, positive of Hoffman uh, syndrome in both hands, and the uh, hyper -re reflection of the knee tendon, and the grade 4 of limbs mus uh, muscular strength. Uh, there are two uh, uh, diagnosis. The one is the cervical uh, spondylotic um, uh, malignancy, and the, the second one is the cervical span spinal stylosis. Here is the uh, preoperative examination. The preoperative x ray and the CT and the uh, MRI. The intraoperative localization. Uh, I'm sorry, there are some are some wrong with my video. The inter interoperative uh interoperative video. Uh, after surgery, the post uh, uh operative examination. Uh, the first one is post operative CT. Uh, the post operative MRI. The case three is a 51 years old female. Uh, symptom is weakness of the limbs was accom accompanied by numbness of the right lower limb for one month, which was aggravated for four days. Uh, the sign is uh, cervix five to six and uh, uh, six to uh, seven. Interspinous and uh, perivertebral uh, tenderness. A positive of a half month, of half month uh, syndrome in both hands. Uh, both lower limbs uh, knee reflex uh, hyperfunction. Both hands uh, holding strength never fall. Uh, lower limb mus muscle strength never fall. Diagnosis is the cervical uh, spondylotic uh, malopathy. Uh, the operative examination X ray. Uh, CT and uh, MRI. Uh, the intraoperative uh, localization and uh, the intraoperative video recording. Uh, the postoperative examination uh, CT and uh, uh, MRI. Uh, for the future and the outlook. Uh, outlook, uh, we think the uh, minimally invasive spine is a trend in surgery, and the uh, spinal endoscopic has the advantages of operational uh, visibility and uh, less damage to surrounding tissues. But more long-term follow-up uh, follow is required to prove the advantages compar uh, compared with the traditional uh, minimally invasive spinal techniques. Uh, on the technical side, navigating and uh, automation tools have made great stri uh, strides to help surgeons overcome the 
uh, and that chemical uh, position challenges inherit uh, in minimally invasive techniques. Uh, therefore, uh, spanner and uh, endoscopic technique has a very bro broad future in the future. Uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tan, for uh, this excellent presentation. Is there any question? Uh, yeah, I, uh, excellent lecture. I, uh, I really want you to get you speak. Uh, and I was trying to get your email. Where's your email there? Shen, because I think it would be an excellent lecture for a lot of groups I have. Uh, Shen, can you give yeah. me your email address? Put it in the chat, please. Or put it on the screen. Uh, okay, okay. okay, Shen, can you do that, please? Shen, can you put an email uh, in the chat? Uh, okay. okay. Our... Actually, this is uh, Dr. Tan. Dr. Tan. And... Uh, uh, the whole group, I will send you uh, the whole emails. Thank you, uh, dear Chinese uh, friends, for this excellent uh, presentations and for courage to break the language barrier between you and well. And we will make more collaboration either with Neurosurgical TV and the EWNC in the future. Thank you. And now we will shift to uh, another country and another friend from Greece. Dr. Nicholas, please start sharing your screen. Uh, hello, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I'm sharing my screen. Uh, did you show my, my presentation? Yes. Please, full uh, mood. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Nikolaus Sirmos from Thessaloniki, Greece, and I will present uh, the dorsal suboccipital approach to the cranioventricular junction. I'm a consultant neurosurgeon. And I'm working in the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, and uh, also I'm an active European Association Neurosurgical Societies member. Uh, I wish to thank uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Sameh Almorsi, for this. Uh, kind invitation. This is a mondial uh, a congress of uh, neurosurgery, I think, uh, with great uh, friends uh, all around the world. Uh, I don't know what happened now. It is not scrolling down. I don't know why. Uh, this is the second time that I I am presenting in this congress. I participate as as you, as you saw also in the second edition, and it is a great pleasure and a great uh, honor for me. Uh, if we have to start, uh, we have to tell and to say what is the craniovertebral junction. Uh, the craniovertebral junction or craniocervical junction in uh, another bibli bibliography reference uh, represents the complex transitional zone, anatomical and physiological zone of the human body between the cranium and the spine. Uh, in this area, there is a complex balance of different elements, anatomical and physiological elements, and sh should be considered in, uh, both clinically and radiological a distinct entity from both the cranium and particular the cervical spine. We have some uh, very important osseous structures and uh, some very important muscle sanctions and some important neural and uh, also vascular sanctions uh, that we have to, to mention and uh, uh, to, know, to know them before we can approach them uh, surgically. Uh, if we show the ossical uh, structures, we can see the atlas, C1. Uh, atlas take the name from the mythological Hellenic atlas. That was the person that held the earth in his, uh, in his hands. And uh, atlas is the C1, and uh, axis is the C2. 
ε, δι, δι, these two parts, these two ε, osseous parts has different anatomically structures ε, from the other ε, vertebra of the, of, the, of the cervical spine. Uh, it is very important to recognize, it is very important to study uh, uh, before, uh, to, before to, 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 to tend to, to approach surgical the cranial vertebral junction. This is a, a, an imagine of the very important uh, anatomical uh, uh, terms of these regions. We can see the uh, uh, atlanto-occipital membrane, uh, the alpical ligament, the band of the cruciate ligament, the tentorial membrane, the posterior atlanto-occipital membrane, the transverse ligament of the atlas, the inferior band of the cruciate ligament, the anterior longitudinal ligament and the posterior longitudinal ligament, all the young neurosurgeons and the young spine surgeons and the young orthopedic surgeons uh, must before uh, to attend to operate to know very well the anatomic uh, uh, elements of, of this area. In this image, you can also see uh, with another uh, color uh, differentiation uh, the, the anatomical structures that I mentioned before. The essential skills that we have to, to manage and we have to study and we have to evaluate in our surgical approaches, uh, the, the most important essential skills is uh, uh, the sequent things. The craniovertebral junction has unique anatomical structures that separate it from the subaxial cervical spine. Uh, in addition uh, to housing uh, the, the vital neural and vascular structures, it is very important uh, for the majority of the cranial flexion, extension, and axial ro rotation uh, is accomplished at the craniovertebral uh, junction. A complex combination of the osseous and ligament supports allow for the stability and, the, and the, uh, is the permission of the motion. In the motion of the cervical spine, it is a very important uh, pathfinder step in order to, uh, to evaluate and uh, to make all, all the achievements that the mankind uh, do it in the presence in the, in the earth uh, through all the years. The surgical goals are very important. Uh, one, one very important surgical goal is the stabilization. One other important is the sagittal, sagittal spinal realignment. And one, another important thing is the coronal spinal realignment. And one thing uh, very important is the decompression of the all neural structures. This is an uh, anatomical images of a workshop around the world uh, that it's a very important step in order to, to learn how to operate uh, the cervical spine and the whole spine. Uh, achieving the surgical uh, goals uh, has some uh, permissions. It is the segmental motion, the compensatory reaction, the anatomical variation around the craniovertebral junction. It was a very nice workshop that my mentor, Professor Di Rocco, uh, do it in Rome some years before, cruising around the foramen magnum and the craniovertebral junction, it was a very important step in order to, to learn uh, some new things, anatomical things. And uh, one other uh, surgical goal is the understanding the normal alignment. If we don't understand it, if we don't know the normal alignment, we cannot fix the pathological alignment. This is a very important thing. Uh, another very important issue in the European countries that uh, we have uh, many patients over 60 years old, over 65 years old, uh, because the European population is getting older through the years. It is the best patient selection. Uh, the patient selection is very important and the appropriate indications and the appropriate contraindications. Uh, we have to make a complete medical evaluation and the paraclinical exams, such cardiological exams, respiratory exams, uh, in order to not uh, meet contraindication. We have a blood workup. Imaging is very important with the MRI and uh, also intraoperative images such as intraoperative CT scan and intraoperative MRI, uh, new elements in the armamentarium of the spine surgeon, the neurosurgeon, and the orthopedic surgeon. Uh, the orthopedic surgeon. And one other important thing is the consent 
in order to, to perform uh, a surgical approach. Uh, the, dorsal, uh, the, uh, the dorsal approach is a sub suboccipital craniectomy and the C1 uh, atlas laminectomy. And the approach of the cranial vertebral junction is the occipital cervical fixation, the occipital plate, the occiput to the C1 screw fixation, the C1 C2 lateral max fixation, the dorsal C1 C2 transarticular screws, and the C2 intralaminal fixation. Very important is the learning curve. Uh, we are not guts, we are not neurosurgeons, and we have to, to, to make a learning curve. Every year we operate better than uh, the last year. Uh, we don't uh, have not to forget this. Uh, the dorsal suboccipital cran craniotomy, the monitoring with SSCP is useful. It is one other very important tool in the armamentarium in order to perform safe operations. Uh, the prone position, the arm stuck to the side, and the clean flexed against the neck. The incision midline, uh, the uh, vascular plane, in order to not to, to meet uh, important vascular uh, elements in, uh, in our incision. And from the incision to C2 spinous process. Uh, may need to do C1, C2 laminectomy for adequate decompression is also a good and a good step in order to perform a safe operations. The suboccipital uh, craniotomy, C1 plus foramen magnum is the deepest part of the exposure. We have to be very careful in this, uh, in this stage of the operation. The exposure is continued laterally on the ring of the C2, uh, C1. The size of craniotomy is also uh, an important issue in the literature. And the dura open uh, has to be epsilon shaped incision is the better uh, in my opinion, because uh, allows ligation to the occipital sinus and also in the posterior fossa midline. Uh, the suboccipital craniotomy, uh, what a right dura closure is critical. Uh, uh, the, the spine surgery has to remain with his patient also in the dura closure. Sometimes we are very tired. Uh, but also the dural closure is very important. And one good uh, dural closure prevents the CSF leak. That is one of the major complications. Uh, Post-operative CSF leak, hydrocephalus and pseudomenigomyelocil is the potential complications according to the literature, but according also to the surgical experience of the ma major uh, cervical centers across Europe, uh, across Japan, and uh, across also USA and across the literature in the whole world. Uh, surgical anatomy and anatomy knowledge remains essentially in order to perform optimal surgical plans and in order to help our patients. Uh, I want to invite all the young uh, colleagues in Ian's research course uh, 2024 that will be held in uh, 19 April 2024 in Hamburg, Germany. I am a part of the faculty and also of the organized committee. It will be a great uh, opportunity to learn uh, how to make research in this difficult uh, part of uh, the neurosurgery and uh, a very important step in order to learn uh, new things. Uh, thank you very much. And I wish to all my friends uh, all around the world good health and uh, my best uh, wishes. Uh, Sameh, many thanks and uh, also John many things and my compliments. Thank you, uh, Nicholas, for uh, this uh, nice presentation. Is there any question or comment? Well, I'd like to thank Nick for his continuing support. John, we are we are very far also, also with Samik, but, but our souls are near. It is very important to have our souls near and perhaps in the newer future, uh, we will meet uh, in the real life. But well, the, souls, the, the souls are near and, uh, and, and the, the mind also, we are, we are together and this is the important thing. Thank well, you very I, much for, for the friendship. Well, you know, I think the height of civilization is in Plaka, overlooking the Acropolis. 
I think that's the height of civilization. Yes, you told me perhaps with Sameh and you, we can meet uh, one time and uh, to have a great time together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Great, great Thank honor to be here. Okay. Thank you. And now we will shift to the uh, next speaker, uh, Professor uh, Sarat Chandra. Please, dear brother, start sharing your screen. So thank you. Let me sh share my screen. So are you able to see my screen and am I audible? Yes. yes. So thank you very much, John. Thank you very much, Dr. Sameh, again, once again, for organizing this exemplary conference. One day conference, very good to see amazing presentations. So I, I thought I would should speak about something different particularly about complications. And I categorize them as the sins of spine surgery. And this is based upon my own personal cases of more than 10,000 cases of spine surgeries and more than 1,000 cases of craniovertebral junction anomalies. Let me go to that. So that is the institution where I work, the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. So uh, if you look at the sins which have been described, the original eight sins were described by Evagrius Ponticus in the year 345 AD, and he reduced the actual number of sins from nine to eight. Uh, the fact is he was living in Constantinople and he was, uh, uh, he, he was attracted to a married woman and then he realized that the life offers too much of attractions which can lead you, lead you to go into a wrong manner. And then finally he becomes a saint. But the question is, could we categorize each of our complication into one of such sins. And that is what I've tried to do in my presentation. So let's go over to gala or gluttony, which is fundamentally overindulgence. So this was a 14 year old female with abnormal neck posturing and had a trivial fall. And this is what the x-ray showed. So fundamentally you can see that there is some kind of a fracture here. And the C2 and 3 is also fused, suggesting a congenital anomaly there. And when we do, and the CT, and this was done outside, not in our institute. And when a CT scan was done outside, obviously there is an Atlanta axial dislocation. And you could see cord changes on the MRI. And so this patient underwent this form of wiring where the C2 was fused through a hole in the occiput. So an occiput C2 fusion. The patient improved and then again came back to the same surgeon uh, about three or four months, about six months later. And now now you could see that there is now an increasing bacillar invagination because of the wiring. And following this, the surgeon does an MRI and he finds increased compression. And this time he decides to put a rod from occiput to C4 and 5 uh, and not disturbing the wire. And the patient seemed to have improved initially. And this was the initial CT scan which, uh, which was done, which showed a reduction of the bacillar invagination. But again, came back after one year with progressing quadriparesis. And then an MRI was done again by the same surgeon. And he found that there was a cord compression. And at this point, he again found that there was a bacillar invagination, which was propagating, which was again proceeding. And he decided to extend the occipital cervical. So he just a fusion in the lower part. So every time he is indulging into something new, and it is worsening the condition of the patient. And this was a post-op. Again, you could see that there is some reduction of the bacilli invagination. But again, this time, finally, he comes to our institution with quadriparesis for the past six months, completely bedridden, unable to walk. And that is how that is when we had to manage. And this was the x-rays which were shown. And when we do a CT scan, this is what the CT scan showed. So patient underwent the technique of DCER. This is a posterior suboccipital cervical approach which we have described and we have done more than 500 cases so fundamentally we put a spacer there and then we perform a long segment fusion and that is what we did this is the pre-op and you can see we have put a spacer this is after distraction after putting the spacers and this is the final reduction so you could see that now we were able to reduce the tens well below the clival line with the spacers in C2. And we did a shorter segment fixation and that is the presence of spacers. So like what Dr. Goyal says that whenever you deal with it, 
the most important pathology is that the dense is forever telescoping inside the cervical spine. So you have to put a spacer because when we do a surgery, success is a race between settling and fusion. So the CV junction always settles. So if you put a spacer, it delays the settling of CV junction. And the idea is that the bone fusion will happen before further settling can happen. So this is a technique of DCR, which we described. We put a spacer and then we provide an occipital cervical compression, which leads to uh, extension at the, OC1, OC, uh, at the OC1 and C2 joint. And these are some of the papers which we published. Uh, it's a very well demonstrated technique, but of course this was a very difficult technique and these are all the papers. On, and we also created a, a CV junction uh, reducer, universal reducer which we can use and also use to reduce severe anomalies like that by using this kind of a CV junction reducer. Again, another very severe case, you can see BI with AD. So that is a pre-op and this is the post-op after reducing it completely. Another extreme case, you can see practically the cord is absent. In this case, again, we use the technique of DCR and using the universal reducer, we have been able to reduce the deformity completely. Now the next, uh, uh, the next sin would be lust. People think that it's excess of sexual, uh, wanting excess of sexual gratification. But if you look at definition, it is fundamentally a hunger which cannot be satiated. So this was a female, 23-year-old female who sustained an injury four years ago, presented with myelopathy. And the patient goes to a surgeon outside and this is what the surgeon does. He just puts some kind of wiring from behind. Obviously, it's not. And they were actually contemplating whether to do a transoral and posterior fixation, which I think is a logical way to do it. But then we described a newer technique for such lesions. So what we do is we drill off the C1 lateral mass completely. And we replace it with a spacer. And once we replace the spacer between the occiput and the C2, and then, then we produce compressive forces between the occiput and the cervical spine in order to lead to complete reduction of the anomaly. So this is what we did here. That is a pre-op. And using this technique, we drill off the C1 lateral mass completely, put a spacer, and we did a short segment fixation. So you can see a satisfactory reduction of this very severe anomaly. So a few other examples of how uh, it went. And we published uh, this in Neurospine showing, and this is the first technique described globally where we have described drilling the C1 lateral mass completely and replacing it with a spacer. So you now you have an articulation of spacer between the occiput and the C2. Grade is next sin. Basically, it means wanting more than what is necessary or fair. Now, this was a 23-year-old male who presented with neck swelling, quadriparesis, and patient just underwent some kind of biopsy outside uh, for the sake of why, I don't know, even though it showed a highly vascular tumor and patient bled like anything. And they just packed with gauze and then sent to our emergency. So here in the emergency, we, of course, we found that MRI was showing encasement of the vertebral artery and there was a large vascular tumor. And when we do an uh, vertebral angiogram, we find that it was showing a large, huge amount of blush. So the question is, what can we do? So over here, the neuroradiologist said that they cannot embolize because the vessels were too fine. But we find that it was very well supported with the vertebral from the opposite side. And this is the side which has been compressed. So we did an anterior approach entrapment. We put a clip above and below the tumor. We entrapped the vertebral artery and removed the tumor along with the vertebral artery. So you can see the clips above and below. And of course, we do an anterior fixation. There was a little bit of tumor left for which we gave radiotherapy because the biopsy was an endothelioma. It's an uncommon tumor and the patient improved completely. So it's a rare tumor, highly vascular tumor. Embolization, even though this is a technique of choice, but rarely you could do embolization. In this case, you cannot do it because the vessels are too fine and it's highly radiosensitive. So you don't have to do total excision. The next sin would be pride. Mm. I mean, basically it means that it is disproportionate assessment of whatever you have. So this is a patient who, who again had a severe bacillar invagination with atlantaxial dislocation. And uh, he had this 
the bull going right over the joint. So in this case, when I exposed, I found the C1 root and as soon as I cut the C1 root, I nicked the vertebral artery. So fundamentally, I think this was an element of pride, pride on my part because after doing more than 1000 cases, I thought, you know, we could tackle everything. And this fundamentally, so we, we were showing how we are dissecting the C1, C2 ganglia, cutting it completely and then exposing the vertebral artery, putting a clip both distal and proximal and there's a good backflow. And then it finally suture the vertebral artery. And once the vertebral artery is sutured, we remove the clips, it's pulsating very well and we continue drilling the joint and proceed with the rest of the surgery. And so that is a post-operative showing a very good reduction. And again, spacers in C2, we do the DCR technique. That's a pre-op. So that's the patient. So now we always do a CT angiogram in order to assess the blood vessels over the joint. So whenever we find, we always ensure that we go very carefully. And that was a case where again, there was a artery right over the joint and we have done mobilization of the vertebral artery and we preserve it. So we are very careful. We always examine such cases doing a CT angiography, which has become mandatory. And if the vertebral artery is on the joint, we dissect very carefully and mobilize the vertebral artery. So that's the pre and that's the post-op. This is of course for another case where we have mobilized the vertebral artery. The next sin is wrath or era. It's fundamentally, it means it's a desire to punish someone for no reason. So this was a 27-year-old female who was a primary gravida who was six months pregnant, presented with progressive paraparesis. And by the time she came to us, she was paraplegic. And... The MRI showed this lesion in the vertebral body with a soft body, soft tissue compression. So fundamentally, this was a vertebral body hemangioma. And you could see that this was causing severe compression of the uh, spinal cord. So now CT scan was not done as the patient was pregnant. Now oh, this patient went from physician to physician and nobody wanted to do anything because patient was six months pregnant and uh, she was paraplegic doubly incontinent and uh, so patient must have consulted at least 10 physicians. Finally, she came in a great desperation to our center. So what did we do? So we did a laminectomy and we did an absolute alcohol embolization. And then we did a short segment fixation. And I'll tell you what exactly is that. So that is the pre-op post-op where we have done fixation above and below. And now you can see following absolute alcohol embolization, there has been reduction of the vertebral body hemangioma. So we injected 2 ml of absolute alcohol directly into the vertebral body. The blood loss was less than 500 ml and we just took 2 hours to do it. So that's how we do. So we put Jamshidi needle and through this we inject 1 ml and 1 ml of bilateral absolute alcohol for vertebral body hemangiomas and then we do a short segment fixation. Now she was discharged 2 weeks later. She continued to improve and she delivered a healthy baby. And then she came walking to me. And this was after eight months follow up. She was perfectly fine. Her paraplegia improved completely. So she was actually the wife of a reporter. And they, the reporter was quite fascinated that we treated a spine tumor with an alcohol and it was published in the paper. And this is the lady over here who after delivering a healthy baby was completely fine. So we use absolute alcohol for treating vertebral body hemangiomas and we have been doing it for the past 15 years and we described this technique for the first time. It is the most powerful embolizing agent and it's the most inexpensive agent. It costs less than one US dollars. The only risk is it may have a rapid systemic runoff and toxicity, but we do that under control and we inject the alcohol very, very slowly. So we got the idea that we perform spinal decompression and to avoid systemic side effects, we injected very slowly at half cc increments and we also washed the area very, uh, very thoroughly. And in order to prevent a pathological fracture, we do a short segment fixation. So these are the three things we do. Embolizations in small aliquots of absolute alcohol with plenty of saline irrigation, single level fixation and spine decompression. So we have treated more than uh, 33 patients and most of our patients have improved. 
And these are the important papers which we published. So all of you who want to look more into this technique. And now this has become a standard technique, not only in our institute, but in many centers across the country, treating vertebral hemangiomas with absolute alcohol and a single segment fixation. And we found it to be very safe and curative. There is no tumor recurrence. It fundamentally kills the tumor also. The next sin is sloth or acedia. So fundamentally, it means that you, you do, fundamentally it means that you don't think as per the individual case. You want to fit one size to everybody. Now, this is a patient who came, who was an 80-year-old boy, came with this progressive deformity with occasional fever. He had hyper hyperreflexia, and this is the MRI. You can see that there is an extreme kyphosis and a large abscess over here. Now, this patient unfortunately undergoes a laminectomy outside and drainage of abscess. So, because people think that tuberculosis is spine, so you just do laminectomy and drainage of abscess without thinking that it could actually cause deterioration. And patient worsened and came. And this is what we did. This is intraoperative exposure. This is the gibbous. So, we put screws above and below. We do an posterolateral approach. We resect the body completely as well as the posterior elements completely and we put a cage in the front and reconstruct the spine. And that's the post-op. And this is on follow-up. You could see that we have corrected the entire kyphosis and that has led to an excellent fusion. And this is on the 16th post-op the child was able to walk. Now, paradoxically, when I take the photo of the child with the father, the father was wearing this t-shirt which says, I've survived the hall of horrors. So we have now, for such cases, we do routinely a 360 degrees fusion. And I have done more than 53 circumferential fusions using a posterolateral approach. And we have published it. And it is done in a single stage. Finally, we come to sorrow or tristia. This was not there in the original sin. It was ultimately, it was reduced to seven original sins because people thought sorrow is unavoidable. But as per the original thinking, it is very much thought that sorrow could be completely avoidable and humans could actually live in a sorrow-free state. Now, this was a perplexing case of spastic paraplegia, 58-year-old male with progressive spastic paraparesis. And uh, he had 0 by 5 power when he came to us. He also had a sensory level. And number of MRIs done were negative. Now, when a radiologist do an MRI, they suspected a spinal atriovenous malformation, dural levy fistula. So they do an angiogram, but that was totally negative. So following this, they thought that he should be treated again in the neurology. So patient underwent a second DSA spine down. So the first DSA was done in the mid thoracic. The second DSA was done in the lower dorsal and the upper lumbar. Both of them were negative. And so at this point, we had to refer the patient to the neurologist. This patient further deteriorated when he was given steroids and they thought of all the usual non-compressive myelopathy differential diagnosis and they discussed all this, did an extensive investigation and everything was ruled out. So the question is, what should we do? Patient was paraplegic for the past six months and uh, uh, MRIs didn't show anything. There was no dural AV fistula and entire negative was ne entire workup was negative. So when we discussed this, in the CT scan, we found vascular markings in the cervical spine. And we requested the radiologist to do a DSA again in the cervical spine, which they refused initially. They said, we've already screened, we won't find anything there. But we persisted with them. And finally, when they did a DSA, we found a dural levy fistula in the cervical spine. So we have a dural levy fistula sitting in the cervical spine, causing no weakness of the upper limbs. But because of the venous congestion has led to paraplegia of both the lower limbs. And that is where the fistula was seen. And also in this case, you have to remember, whenever you have a diagnosis of dural levy fistula, never give steroids. Because if you give, they could deteriorate. And this is the operative video. And we are opening the dura here. And this is a vessel. This is a vessel which is coming from one side. So we do an ICG and that clearly shows and demarcates the vessel. So we put a clip and then finally we cauterize it and cut it. That's it. It's a very simple surgery. It took hardly one hour to finish it. 
And following this, the patient improved completely. He started walking, he improved completely. His power improved completely. So history taking is very important. And remember that if the DSA is negative, do not rule out a dural AV fistula. You have to screen the entire spinal cord. Finally, I come to NV or NVIDIA or to look against. So when I have operated more than 1,000 cases, you know, you do become a bit uh, confident. And I think that comes because other people also start looking at you with some degree of jealousy. So this was a patient who came with severe neck pain. And it looked like a straightforward CV junction. And there was an osteoarthritis. You can oversee over here. So you can see that the C1 lateral mass pars was destroyed on one side. So I decided to do a C1, C2. And that was a wrong decision because when the C1 pars was collapsed, it is difficult to put. So when I did that, I destroyed the C1 pars. And finally, I had to do a short segment fixation. Now, that unnecessarily took a longer time. I could have done this from beginning itself. So for the sake of following rules, do not go on doing the same thing. One should try to know it. And osteoarthritis, surprisingly, is a common condition. It usually presents with an OA syndrome. Professor Goel has also described a number of cases and published them. But most of them can be treated medically because they come with neck pain. They have occipital neuralgia, occipital trigger points. And they can be just treated with some local injections and uh, uh, NSAIDs. But sometimes in extreme cases, you may have to do surgery, which only forms about 5% of the cases. So my own experience has been 48 cases of craniovertebral junction anomalies of, uh, with osteoarthritis. So with this, I will now uh, stop my presentation here. My idea was to show a series of complications on how one can actually get into problems if one is not clear based on my own experience of more than 10,000 cases. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Shanda, for uh, this excellent presentation and uh, wisdom that you have added in, my, in our mind as regarding these patients. Thank you. Is there any questions or comments? Very nice way of presentation, Sarat. And uh, yes, sir. You, have, you have become a philosopher other than a scientist. And my best wishes to you. There are several beautiful points that you have raised and you have tried to answer. And these are very critical points and very important points. Because, you know, essentially what we are doing in not only in spine surgery, but in our whole, whole career, that if we do it correct, we give new life. And if we do it with some kind of uh, special thing in our mind or some kind of flaw in our mind or some kind of misunderstanding in our mind, we can actually create disasters. And that disasters will be too much for the patient, for the family. So it is very important that we love and respect technique and technology. But most important is philosophy and concepts. We should have clear concepts, we should have clear philosophy, we should have clear understanding and in that respect we have to work hard, we have to understand, we have to just go on doing and understanding. I think there are some beautiful points in your presentation, Sarat, and some beautiful philosophical information and I enjoyed it. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, dear friend, for this excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Zami. Um, now we will go for uh, the king, as John said, uh, Dr. Atul Gwil, uh, our dear friend and our dear mentor. Please start sharing your screen.
Can you see the slides, Sama? Yes, it's okay. So you have heard this before and you you will hear it now and you will go on hearing what I have to say that because this is so important in my view, what I am going to show is based on my understanding over a long period of time and I have given several presentation even on this doc, Dr. Samesh show I have talked about this issue that when we talk about spine we talk about decompression and that is the treatment of course not about tumors and other things but in general for degenerative spine and other things so decompression is the issue in spine surgery. What I'm saying is that decompression is a non-issue in spine surgery. Before I go further, I wish to invite Samay, you please look at this slide carefully and you have to come for this. And John, are you there, my dear John? You see this slide and you have to note down the dates and you have to come and join me in this program, okay? And I will show you many, there is, if you see this, there is a live surgical program in this and where I will show what I am talking about. I'm again introducing this concept to you. I know it is different. I know it is difficult to understand. I know it is controversial. I know but believe me or not, it is the concept and it is the future of spine surgery. My view is in spine surgery, compression is never primary issue and decompression is never the treatment. Quite a radical concept, quite a huge concept, but this is the concept. Compression is never primary Compression is always secondary to local spinal instability. It indicates instability. Compression is always naturally protective or adaptive. And compression suggests the need for fixation. And compression is always potentially or manifestly reversible. So this is my concept which I'm going to talk about. And I am enjoying this presentation more than I am doing, enjoying operating on these patients because I know what I'm doing. So I've shown this slide and I've shown this presentation on various occasions, but please see it again and please try to understand what I'm saying. Human body is different, we stand. All our muscles are focused on the facets. When the muscles become weak, there is instability at the facet. And this instability is the cause of problems of various kinds of problems in spine, including degenerative spine. Disc is divine. Disc is never an issue. Disc herniation, disc protrusion, disc bulging, osteophytes related to the disc are never an issue in spine surgery. Facets are the issue. Facets are the point of problem. They are fulcrum of all movements. You see, I'm giving information in sentences, but each of these sentences, there is an article behind it. And I wish that you please read those articles to get more details of what exactly I want to say. When there is weakness of the muscles of the back of the spine, which focus at the facets, there is a listhesis at the facet. This listhesis results in telescoping of the spine. There is listhesis, and this listhesis cannot be recognized on conventional imaging. And if it is not recognized, we do not understand. And if we do not understand, we do an alternative form of treatment, which may just not be correct. When there is muscle weakness, there can be listhesis, like spondylolysthesis. And this listhesis is due to muscle weakness, which ultimately leads to listhesis. So first time we said that basilar invagination is not a fixed anomaly, it is due to listhesis, it is due to instability. And instability is the issue 
and stabilization is the treatment. That is what we proposed in 1999. And we wrote several articles on this subject at that point of time. <clears throat> we wrote that this kind of basal imagination, listesis is the problem. There is no need to treat chiari, syrinx, or decompression from front or from behind. Treat the instability, and that is the solution. This was in 1999. As we grew further, we identified various kinds of listesis, various kinds of instability of the facets at the craniovertebral junction. Because the movements at the facets are circumferential, they are all over. So because the movements are all over, the instability can be all over. And instability can be acute and instability can be chronic. So in chronic situation, we introduced probably an absolutely revolutionary concept. No question in my mind, this is the future. Chronic atlantoaxial instability leads to a number of issues like basilar invagination is due to unstable spine. Chiari formation, syringomalia, and a huge number of anomalies which we consider as pathological. And where we say that decompression is the treatment, I am saying unstable is the spine and stabilization is the treatment. So this is a subject which I am not going to discuss too much today, but I have talked on several occasions on this issue. Just to show you a few slides, which, I, which are what I mean, when there is instability at the spine, there can be C1 over C2 listhesis, as you are seeing in this case. There can be atlantodental interval disturbance. There can be cord compression, listhesis. This kind of listhesis is the issue and stabilization is the treatment. Any kind of decompression from front or from behind is, in my opinion, an absolutely wrong form of treatment. Compression is seen. Compression indicates an unstable spine. But decompression is not the treatment. Realignment, a term which we introduce, is an issue which should be done and which is the best. But more than realignment, it is stabilization which is the treatment. Type 2 instability is when the facet of C1 goes behind the facet of C2. There is no atlantodental interval disturbance. There can be severe basal invagination, as you are seeing in this case. When you see such severe basal invagination, the first thing that comes in our mind is decompression. And actually, that decompression should be last thing in your mind. Because decompression in this kind of unstable spine is a negative form of treatment. C1, C2 fixation in this situation is quite a difficult operation, but this is the operation for such unstable spine. When there is, even when there is no facetal malalignment, presence of Chiari, presence of Syrinx, presence of Platybasia, presence of assimilation of Atlas, are all, which are all secondary, which are all protective or adaptive, which are all reversible, following atlantoaxial instability, stabilization is the treatment, magic is the clinical result, and absolutely new life for the patient. Question is, do we understand what we are doing? Is my absolute feeling is, in this case, if you do decompression, even when there is no problem here, no problem here, believe me or not, we have done an absolutely negative operation. So instability is the issue. It can be acute when the symptoms are of different kind. It can be chronic of 15 year, 20 year duration when the symptoms are of different kind. In chronic instability, there are huge number of musculoskeletal alteration, neural alterations. Those are alterations. They are protective, natural protective alterations. They are reversible. And we have to understand the games of nature in the chronic situation. So chronic atlantoaxial instability can be associated with a huge, these are only few mentioned here, like Chiari, syringomalia, C23 fusion, assimilation of atlas, clipal file, platybasia, biofit, C1, os odontoidium, and a number of other issues. Basilar invagination is a big umbrella term which encompasses several issues. 
So these are all secondary, these are all naturally protective, and these are all potentially or manifestly reversible. They can be present in discreetly, like Chiari is present, only Chiari, and only sitting omalia, only basilar invagination, only short neck, only bifid, or in cohort like Chiari with sittings, Chiari with basilar, Chiari with C23 fusion, Chiari with assimilation of atlas. They are all children of one big, huge father, and that father is atlantoaxial instability. And this instability is due to muscle weakness, which is the bottom line of the entire story. So we talked about basilar invagination, that it should not be treated by decompression. And now, you see, when we talked about in 1998, I talked about it for the first time, there was severe criticism. Many people just didn't want to listen to what I'm saying. The whole world was doing transoral decompression. I introduced this term craniovertebral realignment, but I was thoroughly and quite, you know, I was a young boy at that time and severely ridiculed, no way decompression was not the treatment, no way only fixation was the treatment at that time. And this was my publication <clears throat> that you can reduce. There is nothing like fixed atlantoaxial dislocation. You can reduce the dislocation. You can reduce or realign the issue. There is no need for decompression. So this is firm, this is fixed, and several people are in the world are following this concept, but still there are many who want to do decompression, but that is on them to understand or not to understand. So this is, there are several hundred cases now of this kind of basilar invagination where we have not done any kind of decompression. So basilar invagination is one of the children of chronic atlantoaxial instability. Instability is the cause of the whole story. We have treated both group A and group B basilar invagination with only fixation, no question, no argument, difficult operation in group B, sometimes quite difficult and dangerous, but that is the operation. Chiari and syrinx, look at the facets. Facetal instability is the issue. Do not look at any kind of compression. Do not look anywhere, even when the facets are in alignment, instability is the cause. Look at the spinous process, move it and you will find it dangling. You will actually find it thoroughly dangling. You fix it and you see the magic. During operation, you can have MEP changes more than 50%. Sitting omalia will reduce 100% of cases if you do a scan after six months and in sometimes two weeks, the sitting omalia can reduce. So basilar invagination, Sitting omalia, carry malformation, clipal file abnormality are all children of one father that is atlantoaxial instability. Central instability is the more important issue. Stabilization is the treatment. And we have published several articles on this subject. So it is secondary. Chiari is secondary. Basal invagination is secondary. In acute situation, there can be acute instability following trauma. There can be spasm of the neck. But in chronic situation, there is shortening of the neck. So this chronic shortening, torticollis is secondary to chronic unstable spine. These are not the problem. The problem is instability. These are secondary, protective and reversible. Like Chiari is a formation, not a malformation. Syringomyelia is good for the patient. It is divine for the patient. It is natural protection. Similarly, we talked about various other things. I'm not going to go in much details of those things, but kyphoscoliosis can be due to central instability and stabilization is the treatment and magic is the clinical result. We think that this, this kind of deformity is the cause of problem in breathing. We think this kind of deformity is the cause of problem of motor weakness and spasticity. It is not. It is the central instability. Whether there is KRE or not, whether there is syrinx or not, these are all secondary manifestations and central instability is here to stay. When there is syringomyelia without any compression, when there is bifid without any compression, these are all indicators of unstable spine and stabilization is the treatment. Foramen magnum decompression is certainly in my view, a negative or a historical operation. Now I will come and try to explain my concepts about degenerative spine. 
anterior surgery, anterior decompression, posterior decompression, endoscopic decompression. We have already heard so many times. But is there any other thought on the subject? Is there any new thing going on the horizon in, on this subject? We have talked about anterior decompression, anterior implants, anterior fixation, corpectomy, decompression, using osteotomes, using rongers, all kinds of anterior surgery have been proposed and done not only by the world, but by me. I introduced by these three, these kind of tricortical screws and various other small little modifications I have talked about 30 years ago in 1993, I talked about this paper. Degenerative arthritis of craniovertebral junction is a complex issue. Not many people understand it. So when there is degenerative craniovertebral junction, we should think about why, why it is degenerative. What is the issue? We talked about instability in degenerative spine long time ago. And instability and degenerative spine was introduced. These terms were together introduced for the first time in the literature. Reduction in the joint space, buckling of the ligament, osteophyte formation are not primary events. They are secondary to unstable spine. They are secondary to facetal instability. They are secondary to vertical instability. Osteophyte formation in the apical ligament, osteophyte in front, osteophyte in behind the body of C2 are not primary even. Decompression is negative form of treatment. They are secondary. They indicate unstable C1, C2 joint and they indicate the need for stabilization. You stabilize. Whether you realign or not, that is not the issue. Issue is stabilization and absolute magic is the clinical result. Retroodontoid pseudotumor. This is not due to any kind of primary problem or gout or any, maybe in sometimes those kind of situations. This is not a pseudotumor. This is like an osteophyte. And this osteophyte is suggestive of an unstable C1, C2 joint. This is first time we reported this, that instability is the issue and stabilization is the treatment. There is no need to touch this osteophyte. And this was published 20 years ago in Japanese journal. Then we have got subsequently several articles on this subject. Retroodontoid cyst can be on frequently due to unstable atlantoaxial joint and stabilization is the treatment. This kind of cyst resection and puncturing is very easy, but it is not necessary. Instability is the issue, stabilization is the treatment. So we should not look at what we see. We should look at what we may not be seeing and what we do not understand. This kind of retroodontoid and retroodontoids, there is a buffer, there is a dynamic process, flexion, extension, it moves, and this needs stabilization. So this is my beautiful article, which I wish you can read. And I hope you can read because this has got some fantastic points to show retroodontoid panis, the whole world was treating by decompression, but this panis is due to vertical facetal instability at the facet. And this buckling of ligament is the issue. You distract, fix, and fuse, and this can be immediate post-operative. So this was a complete revolution in the understanding of rheumatoid arthritis-related unstable spine that it is does not need decompression, it needs stabilization. And then we introduced this intra-articular spacers, which have become very popular now. And uh, the indications and all those things have to be really and very meticulously understood. So 21 years ago, we described C1, C2 spacers, but then we went ahead and described subaxial spacers for the subaxial spine. So C1, C2 is facetal instability. There is no question is the issue. Central instability is more often present, but subaxial facetal instability due to muscle weakness, reduction in the facetal space, osteophyte formation around the facet, reduction in the facetal space with sometimes increase in the facetal space. There are so many listed at the facet, so many issues which indicate an instability which have never been recognized in the literature. Believe me or not, this is the future of understanding of spine. Reduction of the inter-body space, bulging of these discs, bulging of these disc spaces, osteophyte formation are not primary events. They are not 
bad, they are good, they are protective, they are reversible, they indicate unstable spine, they indicate the need for stabilization. You stabilize, they disappear. You stabilize, you create a magic. And this vertical instability is an absolutely novel form of instability. In my view, without any doubt or question, it is the point of genesis of spinal spondylotic disease. It is the future of spinal spondylotic disease understanding. So about 20 years ago, we introduced this intra-articular spacers like distract the facets. As soon as you distract, the whole anatomy of the area changes. The lig ligamentum flavum gets debuckled. This posterior longitudinal ligament gets debuckled. Osteophytes potentially and pro manifestly disappear over the period of time. There is increased intervertebral space, increased neural foraminal space. And this concept completely changed my understanding about spine and the rational, and we introduce a new hypothesis for spinal degeneration based on fast instability. This instability will not be recognized on dynamic imaging. Bulging of the ligament of flavum, bulging of the posterior longitudinal ligament are all due to vertical unstable spine. Introduction of these facetal spaces can completely reform and completely change the spine. So from decompression, which was commonly done, frequently done, and probably the only operation for degenerative spine. Those who do fixation, they do because your decompression can cause hydrogenic instability. That was the concept. Why you do fixation in, de in degenerative spine? You do de uh, fixation because you think that your decompression from front corpectomy or laminectomy can cause unstable spine. That is why you do fixation. But I am saying Fixation is the issue. Fixation is the treatment. Decompression is negative in an unstable spine. And arthrodesis or fusion of the affected segments is the treatment. So we have treated several patients during those periods of time. And you see this is the compression and this is how the whole story has reversed and changed. So this article was published in 2011 as a cover page of Journal of Neurosurgery. There were a lot of criticism, a lot of discussion. All those who are doing anterior surgery started jumping on me from this side and right side and left side and on vertically also. But what was important is this is a concept. This is an idea. Try to think about it. And there is, this is the complete change in the spinal understanding. So this introduced a new hypothesis of spinal degeneration. We introduced these intra-articular spaces which are patented on my name. <clears throat> so multi-segmental compression is not, compression is not the issue. It indicates that this segment is unstable. There are clinical symptoms which indicate this segment is unstable. Myelopathy, even C1, C2 is unstable. So you have to identify which segments are unstable. That is the most critical issue and then you have to treat by stabilization. Same concept we introduced for lumbar canal stenosis at that time, 20, 20 years ago. That these kind of bulges are due to vertical instability. You put distractors and these are stabilizers and distractors. And this is what is required in lumbar canal stenosis. Distraction of facet as the treatment for lumbar canal stenosis, a complete revolution. So you don't do any kind of decompression. The whole world was doing decompression and is doing decompression. And the whole world is criticizing my concept today. But this is the future that I want you to see and hear and take home and think about it. And probably if you get time, read these articles. So decompression of the compressed and deformed segment is the treatment for several decades. In 2013, we said, for the first time, that not even distraction is necessary. Instability is the issue and only fixation is the treatment for degenerative spine. And more recently, about four years ago, we wrote this article where we summarized our story and read the title, Muscle Weakness Related Spinal Instability is the Cause of Spinal Degeneration and Spinal Stabilization is the Treatment. There is no mention about decompression from front or from behind. So these kind of multi-segmental degenerative issues 
are these are not primary issues they are indicators of unstable spine they are secondary they are protective they are reversible and you see this reversibility in about 16 or 17 months complete reversibility more than any kind many people ask me you stabilize but compression is there how can patient improve in the symptom you see the magic you see this concept and you will see that this patient you have created a completely different person after this stabilization not after two days or ten days or one month immediately after he gets awake from anesthesia this kind of multi-segmental issues this kind of multi-segmental ligament the ligament of phlegm buckling decompression laminoplasty corpectomy are completely in my view negative operation this is an unstable spine instability cannot be recognized on dynamic imaging you stabilize you see the whole story reverses patient recovers after recovering from anesthesia in a way that you have, we have never seen with degenerative spine so we should look at degenerative spine with a different vision our symptoms are not due to compression not due to at spinal atrophy is not due to core compression they are due to unstable spine instability instability is the issue instability is the cause of symptoms and stabilization is the treatment and this concept that don't think about neural decom neural deformation i like to do this camels type of fixation which is a fascicle transarticular fixation solid fixation so the most important issue in spine surgery is which you have to identify which segments are unstable. What are the indicators of unstable spine? Here there are two segments of compression, but this is I've done four or five level of fixation. Why so many when, when there is nothing here? So this is what is the critical and the most critical issue is to identify which segments are unstable on the basis of clinical parameters, radiological parameters, and direct intraoperative assessment. So the question of adjacent segment that we talk about is because we have not recognized the unstable segment, we have not understood the unrecognized and not treated that segment. That is the reason of adjacent segment issue. So multi-segmental issue, you see the beauty of the spine. Then is there any question? Is there any doubt? The only question that you will probably ask me is, you do fixation, compression is still there. How can the patient improve? Patient will improve magically in as soon as the patient is reversed from anesthesia. Only issue is you stabilize not just these segments. You identify and stabilize even in this patient. There is no question in my mind that C1, C2 is also unstable. You have to do with an alternative C1, C2 fixation technique. C2, 3 facet has to be included in the fixation construct and absolute this is another patient now i have got several hundred patients actually now where this kind of compressive issues are treated by not by comp not by decompression but only fixation so atlantoaxial instability is very nobody has ever talked about atlantoaxial instability in multi-segmental spinal degeneration you see, there is no compression at C1, C2, multi-segment. The patient comes on a wheelchair, see this unstable. Whether it is seen or not seen, you have to, during operation, you can identify unstable C1, C2, include C1, C2 in your fixation construct. I don't do this fixation now. I use an alternative technique of fixation, which I probably will show you. So when the patient has severe myelopathy, C1, C2 has to be included in the fixation construct, not in the decompression construct. You see this kind of cord compression. This is completely finished after a few months of surgery. So this is the alternative technique, which I <clears throat> will not be able to talk about too much, but I wish you can read. I'm avoiding C1 fixation in, in, in such cases, and I do C2, 3 fixation for such situations. So this is multi-segmental, no problem at C1, C2, but I have included C2, 3 in the fixation construct. And this is after a few months of surgery. This is another case. You see there is huge ligamentum flavor. This issue, that issue, only fixation and only magic is the treatment. So now I wish to talk about lumbar canal stenosis. Lumbar canal stenosis, you see this paper published in Neurosurgical Focus, analyzing the role of stabilization 
and futility of decompression. See, what a statement to make. What a, an article to be published in Neurosurgical Focus. No decompression. So this kind of multiple segment, the most critical issue is to identify which segments are unstable, which segments need stabilization. Transarticular Camille's technique of fixation is what I do. I introduce sometimes two screws like you are seeing at each level. Not sometimes, always introduce two screws. And sometimes I introduce three screws at each level. Stabilization, facetal fixation is the strongest. Facets are the strongest part of the spinal segment, pedic more than pedicle, more than body, more than transverse process, more than spinous process, facets is the strength of the body. You see here, two segment fixation, transarticular, no attempt for decompression. And these concepts which I'm seeing are very heavily published in the literature. I wish that you please read this concept because this is the future. This is the future of lumbar canal stenosis. And when the lumbar canal, you have done decompression, if it has failed, you come and do more decompression, you will do more harm for this patient. This patient needs only fixation. In young children, you see when in an elderly, there are multiple segments which can become unstable. Muscle weakness is not at one segment, but in trauma, there is one segment issue. So lumbar canal stenosis in young is different, in old is different, and young person comes with just one or two level, older person comes with more level of instability, multiple segments need stabilization. So in general, we should not worry about osteophytes. Osteophytes need not be removed. Osteophytes are protective, they are secondary, they will reverse after stabilization, after the job is done. If you remove them, it is probably harmful. Most of the world is doing fixation with osteophyte resection because they think that you remove osteophyte, you can create long-term instability. It is not correct. So lumbar canal stenosis, spinal canal stenosis are misnomer. We used to do only decompression for several years. Then some people started including fixation in some cases. But now my feeling is only stabilization is the new next era for treatment of degenerative stenosis. Spinal deformities. Ah, there is no need for any kind of decompression for this. You please read this article because I know I'm taking too much time. This does not need any kind of decompression. Identify which segments are unstable and stabilize those segments. That is the treatment. Adult de novo lumbar canal stenosis. I have treated various high profile people with this problem. You see this decompression has been the only treatment in the world. You read the literature, nobody talks about stabilization. They think it is, potent, it is inherently unstable, but it is not. It is inherently unstable and stabilization is the treatment. Similarly, disc, I don't want to talk too much, but disc is due to unstable spine. You lift weight, you create instability. Disc herniation is secondary to local instability or inst disc herniation causes instability or instability causes disc herniation. There is relationship between the two. It is instability which is the problem and it is stabilization which is the treatment. This kind of disc herniation, you do not need to remove the disc. So this is a very huge statement. Many people will jump and start criticizing and say, oh, I don't believe, I don't believe. Oh, don't believe, but think about it. You do this fixation and this disc disappears in three or four months. You give a cervical collar, firm cervical collar, the symptoms disappear because in movement is the issue and stabilization is the treatment. So this was an article published in World Neurosurgery. You please read this article. Same is the concept in lumbar disc herniation. This disc herniation, the whole world will do this. We are all used to it, whether with endoscope, whether with whatever scope we do, minimal invasive and all those things. But this does not need removal. You stabilize, it will disappear on its own and it will disappear within, in its own time. Then we have got several patients. You think about it, you try it. And if it, it doesn't, then it doesn't. But if it has never happened to me, and if you have some doubt, this conference which I'm organizing, I will be showcasing several cases during that time in August 2nd to 7th of August. You please note down this time 
and those who are having problem in registration, I will pay the registration from, from my side. If you have problem in getting accommodation, you let me know. I will make accommodation from me from you. But keep this in your mind that you have to, if you have confusion, come and spend time with me. Ossification of posterior longitudinal ligament, the whole world is treating by decompression. I describe oblique corpectomy for the first time in the literature. This kind of corpectomy was described by me. But now I am seeing OPLL is secondary to multiple spinal segmental instability and only stabilization is the treatment. Now I've got many followers in the world, you must know this. And this is the treatment for this kind of OPLL. Do not worry about this compression. Do not keep this compression in your mind all the time and decompression in your mind all the time. <clears throat> Plantoaxial instability is very frequently present in OPLL. I, as I mentioned, I do an alternative technique of C1-C2 fixation in these kind of cases. So atlantoaxial and subaxial spinal fixation can revolutionize the treatment of myelopathy due to opioid. No question in my mind, this is the future. I use this kind of double insurance or triple insurance. You see, there are three screws. This is a solid fixation. So in short, can decompressive laminectomy disappear from the face of spine books? Can anterior surgery in general disappear from spine books? This is this is a thought. This is the concept. And I am quite convinced about it. I have published it on several occasions. And I hope you can go through it. So this is the final slide from only decompression to only fixation, a century-long journey of spinal treatment of spinal degeneration. Thank you very much, my dear Samay and my dear friends. Thank you, uh, dear friend, Professor Goil, for uh, this excellent presentation and concept that you always insist to work out all our minds by. Thank you. Is there any questions? Well, if there is any question, uh, Samay, they, I will like them to come and join me in August. And you have to come specially, okay, Samay? Don't say I'm, I'm busy, I'm this, I'm that. Write down in your books, 2nd to 7th August is in Mumbai, okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I will. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we will shift to uh, next speaker, Dr. Sushil Bakkal. Please start sharing your screen. Thank you. Good morning. Good evening to all of you. Good morning. Can you see my screen? Can you see my yes. screen? Yes, yes, sir. Yes. So my friend Atul is always he's he's a kind of philosopher, you know, and I'm very happy to see him. And I also saw that my other friend, Dr. Sarat Chandra, is also there. See, India has been the center of, you know, moving around the CV junction, front, behind, and various kinds of things. I'm going to talk about a simple concept of Atlanta actual dislocation and the anterior solution to it. There is no question that Atul began the revolution by doing posterior lab fixation. So you have to understand what is Atlanta actual dislocation? It is the inability of the atlas to maintain normal relationship of the atlas and axis resulting in cervical medial recuperation and sometimes it can result in catastrophic death. So this atlantoaxial dislocation is a concept and we must all find out, try to find out what exactly is the cause of the dislocation and whether uh, what kind of surgical treatment we can offer to it. See, the dislocation is most of the time either because of the disruption of the cruciate, horizontal part of the cruciate ligament or because of disruption of the vertical portion with fracture of the odontoid. So there are two reasons why you can get atlantoaxial dislocation. One is because this ligament this is a very strong ligament which holds C1 and C2, and they are it's a pivotal joint, you know, where it moves around the odontoid. So if this ligament is disrupted, you are going to get a dislocation without any fracture. 
And in odontoid fractures, you will find that this, people blame the cruciate ligament, but in odontoid fracture, you must remember it is the lower end of the vertical component which is disrupted and not the cruciate ligament because the odontoid fracture always remains in close approximity to the atlas. So I, I say it is like this. When this is disrupted, you get a mobile atlantoaxial dislocation, which can reduce on extension. When you get a fracture, you get this kind of atlantoaxial dislocation. And when it is long-standing, in that abnormal position, there is a fusion, and it does not reduce, and it becomes an irreducible atlantoaxial dislocation. So you have to ask yourself whether it is mobile, whether it can be reduced by surgery, or whether it is going to be irreducible, whatever you do, you have to go and excise this, and only then it is going to reduce. What is the treatment goal is to realign to re and to, re to reduce and to fix the atlantoaxial joints. You have to, you have to realign the, the atlas and axis. That means reduce and fix the atlantoaxial joints and then eventually get fusion because otherwise it is going to re-dislocate. So you will see that you know this surgery is not simple. Very recently, somebody has mentioned very high-risk surgery and should be performed by extremely skilled spine surgeons only when stringent indications are there. So the story begins with the Megal, you know, who started in 1986, described first the technique of posterior transarticular screws. And this technique had 100% success rate with fusion. It is one of the, it, it biomechanically, it stopped the predominant movement at the at, atlas and axis, which is rotation. See, now people say that there is a capsule to the atlantoaxial joint. I have never seen a capsule. Atlantoaxial joint, according to me, is a very, very mobile open joint. There is no capsule. It is only protected by muscles and, and in the front and behind and by the, the ligaments which hold the odontoid to the atlas. But Megal's technique is not possible in almost 30% of the cases because of the vertebral artery. And high riding vertebral artery prevents you to pass the screw. So it is technically a challenging operation. Then there are other techniques described in history by like, you know, Galleys and Alexanders and Hartshill and Clamp. But remember, these are all orthopedic surgeons. Galley, um, uh, Magal, these are all, you know, Alexanders. These are orthopedic surgeons, very good orthopedic surgeons. But they exposed the spine from behind and they did not use the microscope. So this surgery went on from behind, you know, so, and therefore it became popular and everybody started doing the same surgery from behind because most people, you know, they will follow what is happening and uh, they will not change. And then it was my friend Atul who described in 1994 the technique of, you know, C1-C2 fixation and then harms in 2001, but lot, it took a lot of time to convert it to uh, Goyle harms technique rather than harms technique. And then, of course, uh, I, I improved on this technique because I felt that you know, this kind of fixation where the plate is hanging has got its own problems. So this was the new technique which was described by me, a new entry point which went in front just under the facet. So now all the discussion of the vertebral artery was stopped. This is known as the sub facetal entry point and many people now have written about it, especially from China. They are now writing and most people talk of passing the screw here under the facet. And then I devised this you know, plate screw construct whereby you could manipulate the C1, C2 in the, in the uh, plate and make use of that to reduce the atlantoaxial dislocation like this. You see, you can make you, you can, when you use the, in a polyaxial screw rod system, you cannot do this because when you loosen the polyaxial screw head, you lose the control on the vertebra because of the mobile head. So this was the technique which was, you know, described by me and it is got published. And of course, now you can make use of the technique. Other people are using it to, to, to reduce fractures and fracture dislocation. But then when you look back at the atlantoaxial joint, you realize that the four, where is the force nucleus? From the, from the condyle to the atlas to the axis, the bone of weight, line of weight transmission is like this. So fixation also has to be along this line. And the technique should be simple. You see the entire literature of atlantoaxial fixation is focused around the vertebral artery and the dangers of bleeding from the venous flexors and the division of the C2 root. However, if you study the weight transmission in the front, predominant weight transmission in the front, so obviously the fixation technique also should be in the front. 
and you will now realize that there is such a lot of Chinese literature that they have stopped doing surgery from behind and everybody accepts that Atlanta actual joint must be fixed from the front. And eventually it will. The secret, the Rosetta Stone, you know, like the pyramids, there was the Rosetta Stone which showed how to enter the pyramid. The secret of treatment of Atlanta actual dislocation is to manipulate the atlas and axis facets. He who has learned to manipulate the facets has learned how to treat this. And the best way to manipulate it is from the front, which I will show you. All you need to do is pass an instrument, and the moment you lift up, the atlas will go behind, come in position, and then you can fix it. So there are certain factors which you know are responsible for avoid uh, for avoiding and getting reduction. And fortunately, a lot of literature is there from the Indian side, you know, Dr. Sarunke, then my friend Sarat Chandra, who has published on how they do this from behind and what are the factors which decide the irreducibility. In fact, in Western literature, everybody was doing either transoral release or resection of the odontoid and then reducing and then fixing. So it was a very big morbid procedure. And still they do it, you know, they do the transoral odontoid excision. Then people started doing, you know, treating them in the, with a single stage operation and uh, manipulation from the front. So if you'll notice that what keeps the person in the dislocated position is sometimes the bony spicule, sometimes the, the odontoid has gone behind, sometimes gone laterally, and what holds it in that position is the muscle. The muscles in the front, the muscles behind, they will fix that that abnormal position. So you, you have to learn to focus on the muscles and manipulate the muscles and the facets to get the correct position. The most important step is that if you can get an extension where the angle of the mandible is above the C23 disc, which is 95% of the time, then you can do the surgery from the front. Now you see when, when you see uh, say facet dislocation in the subaxial spine, they're all treated from the front. And similarly, the C1, C2 must be treated from the front. It was the reluctance of orthopedic surgeons who are not using the microscope to go here. The Atlanta actual joints are only one centimeter to one and a half centimeter above the C2, 3 disc. All you need is you need to put right angle retractor and you have to use the microscope and you will have the correct site of vision. So there are various ways you can catch hold of the odontoid and bring it back into position. Then I've devised these plates, which are available from the Geon company, where you know this was the construct which I devised to treat odontoid fractures, where you can you know reduce the fracture, put the plate, and pass bilateral anterior transarticular screws. And the advantage of the anterior surgery is that you can manipulate the odontoid into position by impaling the, this. In 2013, I first published the anterior extrapharyngeal approach and how to do this operation from Japanese spine surgeon. That is the time I described retropharyngeally, first time in literature, a unilateral approach to expose both joints and fix both the joints with the plates. Then, of course, at various other fora, this technique was published. And then you will see in literature, there has been a resurgence in interest from 2000, 2010, and 2017, you see everybody is talking about anterior transarticular screw fixation. And that it is in fact superior to doing the operation from behind. Now you will see this, you know, 2010, 2017, 2020, original article, 2022 from Indian Neurosurgery, they published this right-sided anterior. This was the same thing which I was talking way back. And in fact, uh, you see this uh, um, biomechanical uh, article which was published long ago, where they found that it is superior to Magal's anterior transarticular screws are safer and superior to Magal's technique. There is no vertebral artery. There is no discussion about bleeding. There is no discussion. And operation is done in supine position in extension. So the moment you release the anterior longus coli muscle, you are going to get reduction and you can fix any uh, Atlanta actual dislocation without any fear. Operation has to be simple. If the operation is not simple, then either the surgeon has not evolved or the operation has not evolved. So you will see that again in literature, 2020, anterior transarticular screw is valuable in treatment of odontoid fractures. And then in general spine surgery 2022, there was an editorial where they wrote about my work and how I had contributed to it. And that it is a good option compared to the gold standard of posterior. So this was the paper which I published in 2017 of direct compression reduction fixation. So you reduce, fix the fracture, and fix the joints. Again, it came for the neurosurgery and other places. 
And recently, somebody else has also published his paper and work where he mentioned my work of this new technique and that they have found it useful. So I'll show you an example. This is a dislocated and fixed at odontoid fracture which has got impacted. And uh, in, with traction, it is not reducing. So this is how we position the patient. And the approach is submandibular, just like an anterior cervical fusion, but just using the microscope and taking the incision just under the mandible. And when you separate the, the uh, go through between the muscle planes without detaching any muscles, yours, I'm now separating the, the longer scula and the midline. And when I do that, you see, I will get, I got this cautery, which is sheathed so that it doesn't burn any other tissue and the fracture is exposed. And see, the fracture is being reduced by making use of a right angle retract. The fracture is reduced and brought into position. You can see the fracture site. I've even impaled the fracture with a with a with a kind of you know, guided pin. Then put, put the plate, and this is a VSP compression plate where one screw is going in the distal fragment, one screw in the proximal fragment. This is the atlanto axial joint, which is exposed, and I'm passing it. This is a very very simple operation. And then you put bone chips into the joint, and uh, you see on table itself because the patient is supine. On table, you can check the position. See, the atlas and axis is rigidly fixed. The fracture is also rigidly fixed. So these are some examples you can see. And the end point is what? At the end of four to six months, you must get a reformed odontoid with the fused odontoid. So this was the construct described by me. So this is another fracture, which is you know brought into position with the plate and the transarticular screws are passed. And you'll notice that there is no vertebral artery. There's no way you can damage the vertebral artery. It's a simple operation, very simple operation. So this was the construct. So now you see the anterior inclined fracture or displaced fracture, you'll have to do posterior surgery. This is the VSP concept. So when you pass the screw close and tighten, it will compress the fracture. This is the basic principle of treatment of any fracture. So anteriorly inclined fracture, you cannot do an odontoid screw. So use the VSP plate and you can fix it and when you tighten it, it is going to fix the fracture in compression mode. And that is the treatment of an anterior inclined fracture, which is stable. For a displaced fracture, you can either push it backwards or pull it in the front by passing a tap and bringing it back into position, then putting the screw, then passing anterior transarticular screws. I've shown this so many times. Somehow there is a fear and reluctance to go above the seat to the disc, which I think needs to be destroyed from the mind of people. And they will start understanding the simplicity of this procedure. So this is a kind of fracture who has come late. So you can refashion this, reduce it, and fix it. And you can see after six months, the fracture site has healed. Another patient where the odonto has gone fallen behind, you go transulary, realign it, and pass anterior transarticular screws, and bring it into alignment. Another patient, and another patient, so you, the end point has to be that the fracture has healed and the joint has started fusing. So the joint fusion is very important in uh, uh, displaced fractures, which are unstable. You cannot rely on the implant. The implant work is only till end of three months. By that time, you must get fracture healing and you must get joint fusion. That should be the operation. Not the, the implant is, a, is like when you're building a building, you're putting a scaffolding around it. The role of the scaffolding is only till the cement heals. Once the bone is fused, the implant is useless. You don't get too much interest in the implant. You should get impressed with the technique of fusion. Now, this is a laterally displaced fracture. You see it is impacted. This kind of fracture, you put in traction, it is not reducing. So you expose the patient and reduce it, and you can start getting fusion. And this is how it is done. You cut the longus coli muscle and you impale the odontoid and bring it back into position and pass bilateral transarticular screws. You can see here I have passed the drill and brought it into position and pass bilateral transarticular screws and you can see the healing. Another patient, you know, where you get a vertical fracture of the odontoid along with a um, hangman's fracture, this is, does not reduce. You know, you put in traction for 10 days also, it doesn't reduce. So you can approach this anteriorly pass the transarticular screws here because there was a fracture of the facet. I put a plate and I got a plate at the C2, 3 disc. So you treat all the injuries with a simple, instead of doing occiput C1, C2, C3, C4, and maybe sacrum fixation, all through a small incision under the mandible. 
And you will see that when you do this operation, the posterior muscle complex will attack. So neck movements are relatively completely free, and like when you do occipital cervical fixation. You see this is completely free neck movements. So this is the end point of the treatment. So the operation is very simple. You have to identify the ledge under the facet of the C2 and pass the screw in the direction towards the upper outer end of the atlas. And under the microscope, this is very, very simple. And in lateral, it should be going to the posterior upper end of the atlas. So this you can see in under the C arm. But sometimes you can see the local anatomy is very important. It may not be conducive to pass trans articular screws. And then you can get complications like this. The screw has gone off. Because you see, it is not possible to use navigation in anterior cervical spine. When you do this anterior cervical spine at C1, C2, you, they still have not even, Metronic is still trying to make something for me, but they have not yet succeeded. So you have to go by the three, the neuroimaging in your brain and what you have studied the scan on the previous night properly. And this is how the screws can sometimes, you know, betray you or you can make a mistake. And sometimes, you know, these kind of situations can occur where the screw is, the, you struggle many times, the screw becomes loose. And then I went down and studied many scans and I found that the average distance was, you know, about 2.5 to 3 centimeters. And there's a big mass of bone to pass the screw directly without trying to struggle to pass the screw from here. So this evolved on to making a plate, special plate, where you got to play at a 45 degrees angle, you got to play off about 5 degrees up and down. And there's a central screw which goes into the just above the C23 disc, and it's a bicortical screw with a locking mechanism where you can lock it. And uh, this implant is, you know, completely rigid and holds because all three are connected to the same plate. It is superior to two separate implants, so it's just one implant which connects both the atlases to the axis. So of course, where this was the commonest one which I had used over a period of time. I've tried out many implants with. Uh, the company and now we have come down to making this kind of thing where you can pass the screw right up to the upper end. Now, even if you change the trajectory a little bit, you can pass the screw into the condyle and you can have an occiput C1, C2 fix. So the technique is, you know, you can even go into the condyle. It is not necessary that you have to do another operation. So this is the new plate made by Jeon for me. This is a C endorsed plate and it is available from Jeon company with a locking mechanism. And you can see some examples. This is a fracture odontoid reduced with the plate. And over a period of time, you can see that it is fixed and the fracture site is healing. This is post-operative 12 months, you can see. But remember that the C2 screw has to be bicortical. So you have to study the CT scan previous day and then plan accordingly. This is another example where the fracture is you know, displaced and impacted, not reducing. So you reduce it on table and fix it with the new implant and you'll find that you'll get the correct position, the screw will be going into the lateral mass, and you can see the fracture has started healing and reforming. So you got a very large volume of bone which can be fixed. The joint can be drilled, and uh, plus the fracture can be fixed. So this is the best part of the operation. When you do from the front, you can drill the entire joint. You can go right up to the posterior edge and prepare the end plates. When you're doing the operation from behind, everybody is not Dr. Goyal or Dr. Sarat Chandra. There are some very simple people like me, you know, who are not, who need to have more safety. So then this operation becomes easier for people like me. So this is how the plate is brought. We, I mark the entry points with the micro drill. And uh, where I want, I've got an area of, you know, 15, 20 plates on the table. And once I've marked with a marker pen or micro drill, this is how it is marked. And once it is marked, you can easily plate, put the plate, pass mid pins and check under the CR whether the plate is correctly in the center and that you're happy and then pass the screw. So you can see this is during surgery. After having packed the bone grafts into the joint, I'm making, sorry, this little off center, yeah. So I made an entry at just the anterior inferior edge of the atlas, then just a few turns with the tap. I don't tap over tap on the other side also, the same thing. And uh, the advantage is that the plate is very, very low profile, but very strong. So you can see this low profile plate going inside and see at the lateral edge, the plate has been tilted to bring the atlases into correct position. And this is just like an anterior cervical plate, nothing complex about it, nothing complex. Very simple operation can be done by anybody.
So this work has been published in Journal of Neurosurgery Case Lessons, Unstable Odontoid Fractures, Technical Appraisal, so you can, those who are interested can go through it. Now, this is another type of this case. This is a basal invagination, you can see. And you can see the overhang of the lateral mass on the left side. And then this was treated by the same technique. And you can find that the joint is open and distracted and bone grafts are put. This is the essence of the operation, getting a fusion. And the joints are refashioned. So you get the correction and of the, this and the odontoid will descend from here to this position. And this was again published, basal invagination, surgical treatment with a new novel implant in uh, orthopedic surgery. So I feel that a single implant is superior to two separate implants. There's not going to be any lateral movement. If you see the recent work, you know, this is surgical treatment of basal invasion. This work was originally by Yin, where they are, they have, they have firmly, they have done more than 2,500 cases, TARP. It is, it is superior, they feel, doing the anterior fixation and reducing from front is simpler than struggling from behind. And biomechanically, they have found that the results are superior to any other operation. So they studied the biomechanical tech for all various kinds of implants, anterior and posterior. Of course, they have not mentioned my implant, but they have mentioned harm split, which has never been tried out in live patient, but on cadavers. And they came to the conclusion that no question about uh, their transarticular screw fixing the atlantoaxial joint, but that the tar plate is very good and you can, but they are doing the operation trans orally. I'm a little worried that, you know, there's always a chance of infection. When you do it submandibularly, where you can do it more than 95% of the time, you can get a good reduction. So those who are interested, they can see the videos in general neurosurgery. The task is not so much as to see what no one has seen yet, but to think what nobody has thought of about which everybody has seen. That is the uh, idea. Thank you very much, my dear friends. Thank you, my dear friend, uh, Dr. Sushil Badka, for this excellent presentation. Is there any question? Thank you for joining us today and for nice lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, my dear Sammy. Thank you very much. And now we will shift to next speaker, uh, Dr. Bangash. Please start sharing your screen. Thank you. Uh... I believe he can now see my screen. Yes. Thank you. Um, first, allow me to express my gratitude for uh, that polite invitation. Um, I have been um, looking forward to this. It is truly an honor uh, being amongst uh, the select presenters. So um, I shall be presenting our study around uh, the automated machine learning and its um, application for uh, spinal cord injury. Uh, so as you know, the most widely recognized um, scale for spinal cord injury is the Asia Improvement uh, Scale. And since uh, machine learning, uh, due to its superior um, predictive capabilities, was being adopted across a plethora of um, uh, surgical specialities. Uh, we took an attempt to um, develop predictive models that would uh, let us know the improvement in the Asia score uh, after um, surgical intervention um, for a spinal cord injury. Um, that such a the rationale was that uh, using such predictive models, we would um, um, play our part uh, in informing the clinicians in equipping the clinicians with such tools that would assess, uh, allow them to significantly improve the morbidity and mortality, the associated morbidity and mortality uh, by uh, risk stratification and triaging. So um, what we did was that we uh, adopted the um, impressive um, transforming research and clinical knowledge in spinal cord injury uh, cohort. Uh, the, now this is the one, uh, 59 patients uh, um, data set, and it includes variables uh, that uh, catalogs various injury characteristics, such as the level of injury, presence of uh, polytrauma, the type of injury itself, whether it's a penetrating hemorrhagic 
uh, involves the central cord, um, the location of the spinal cord may it be cervical and so on and so forth, or whether it involves the vertebral artery or not. Uh, moreover, it um, um, looks into whether uh, the patient has previously suffered from spinal cord injury or traumatic brain injury, um, whether if uh, vasopressors or anesthetic agents were used, uh, the duration specifically of the patient, which the patient was within and outside the uh, main arterial pressure goals uh, in the ICU and the MRI basic curve. So we adopted the current state of the art for automated machine learning, and that is uh, MLGR. And um, what it does is that it collects um, around nine algorithmic models. It then ensembles them and then stocks that ensembles onto each other. What it does is that it it gives us uh, the best predictive capabilities. Um, since it was a um, uh, classification problem, so we used a mean macro weighted average area under the receiver operating curve uh, as our uh, um uh, as our um as the um, um the variant through which we would be assessing the uh, outcomes of the model <clears throat> um after running the analysis uh, we got to know that a random forest algorithmic model it predicted um improvement in the um, ais curve with a perfect uh, macro weighted average area under the receiver operating curve whereas um um, opening up the black box, what it uh, got us to know was that uh, along with the AIS curve at admission, that time duration in minutes during which the patient uh, remained within the uh, set mean arterial pressure goal uh, during the intensive care um, unit monitoring that was uh, that came up to be uh, as the most influential predictor in um, improving the AIS score improvement. Um, this novel approach, which was very first of its nature uh, of exploring automated machine learning uh, to predict post-spinal cord injury AIS score improvement, when it gets incorporated into the respective prognosticative and rehabilitative protocols, uh, it shall, where risk stratification and complication triaging um, shall Move go a long way in reducing the morbidity and mortality. And once a uh, spinal cord injury, uh, once a clinician uh, gets um, equipped with such a suite of AI-powered tools, uh, they would uh, be at a better position than currently uh, in managing patients with uh, who suffer from this debilitating condition of spinal cord injury. Um, I thank you all for again for inviting me over, and I look forward to uh, your questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ali, for uh, sharing with us uh, your uh, experience, Ali, and your nice work. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Ali, you can shift to the next uh, next lecture dr ali please start sharing the next lecture dr navas are you here what's the name sam Navas. Can you see the name in the panel? I don't see it. Yes. Do you see it? Okay. Invited him in. Okay, Dr. Bangash, please start the second uh, lecture. Monir Ben Ismail, but I, what is that correct? Okay. Give me one minute.
Sam, what's the name again, please? Dr. Navas. N-A-V-A? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I saw, he's in, right? He's in the panel? Yes, he is already in the panel. Oh, okay. Dr. Navas, can you hear us? He may have stepped away. Hello. Hello, Dr. Navas, are you there? Yes, yeah, I'm here. I'm here, sir. Okay, okay. go ahead, Sam. Okay. Okay, Dr. Navas, please start sharing your screen. Am I, is my screen seen? No. <clears throat> yes, okay. Um, I'm very uh, humbled to be on this list of panelists. Hope I'm audible and my screen is seen. You have to fix your presentation, please. Okay. Yes. You put it on full screen presentation mode. At the very bottom, there's an option. There you go. One of those. Yeah. There you go. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Uh, greetings from um, Kerala, southern part of India. And uh, my topic is a uh, full endoscopic uh, posterior cervical foramenotomy. I'll be dealing the technical aspects of this. And uh, we have had uh, discussions by panelists on endoscopy. So um, the indications for full endoscopic uh, PCF remains the same as for a minimally invasive uh, PCF using a tubular tractor that is an 18 mm tubular tractor. We always know that. And uh, the way you choose between anterior approach or the posterior approach or the uh, minimal approach. And why full endoscopy? Of course, uh, less collateral damage. The collateral tissues are very important. The musculature is very important. So as with, as with any philosophy for minimal university spine surgery, less collateral damage. And of course, in full endoscopy, we work with the uh, gravity-assisted fluid or a pressure pump fluid, which tamponates the epidural virus plexus ooze, which we know, which we all know that uh, hampers our surgery um, in posterior cervical foramenotomies. And the most important part being the angled optics, which gives excellent, uh, excellent unmatched vision, 360 degree vision around the root and the thickal sac and the structures. And the endoscope with this angle optics gives greater ability to undercut the facet, such thus preventing a, a chance of an instability. You can, uh, can de-roof the foramen without sparing, uh, without undercutting or without destroying much of the facet. So here you can see the uh, various views from the that's a tubular attractor there and then you have an MED and you can on the lower down you can see the endoscopic view uh, you can see the difference in the views so for any new procedure you need gadgets we use a 25 degree uh, Richard Wolf scope which has a 4 mm uh, working channel uh, which is with a, so we need a sheet of 8 mm approximately 8 mm and the instruments used are 2 to 4 mm instruments and we have diamond burrs, cutting burrs, guarded uh, on all sides and guarded uh, and an RF probe, radio frequency probe, which is an essential for all endoscopic, uh, full endoscopic spine surgeries. And the OTN positioning is as similar as for a MIPCF, that is the patient is in prone GA on a main field clamp or a horseshoe, depending on your choice. And we give a slight flexion to the uh, neck musculature. And the shoulders are strapped in case you need a uh, positioning in the distal. Uh, you, are, you, are, you are handling a C67 or a C7 D1 disc. And reverse turn lumbar position. And we put in a Foley's catheter too. So where do you put the stab? Where do you put the knife? So here you can appreciate the spino uh, laminos facet junction or the medial particular line. You mark that on the AP. And then what you do is you 
go to the lateral get the angle correct and where these two lines join you make the stab there okay that's how we mark so i will go to this technical video this is you can appreciate the uh, disc this is a two three four five six disc you can see the lateral aspect this compressing the root you can see uh, that's a lateral view you can you will see this soft disc so once you put in the sheath the scope what you see is this mus musculature and soft tissue so using the rf pro you start by uh, cauterizing the musculature as well as feeling for the bone once you feel the bone you feel very relieved that you are on the right track and you will feel the time to feel for the lamina or the facet so you're cauterizing the bleeding points and as well as feeling feeling for the bone and you can appreciate the bone there okay so once you have felt the bone what we do is a since the this is this is a slight bit of banding with the bevel edge the the sheath has a bevel edge the spine doesn't have a cavity at all so to feel get the feel of a cavity the edges of the sheath are beveled so that we can work feel like working in a cavity so that is the interlaminar you are appreciating and the our aim is to reach the v point that's the v point that is the superior lamina inferior lamina and the facet so what we feel is the uh, superior lamina should be a bit more exp needs a bit more exposure so we are comprising the musculature on that and that's a v point you can appreciate the superior lamina the inferior lamina and the facet so that's the v point that should be our first landmark so then we can start our foraminotomy by the under edge of the superior lamina in this case the c5 lamina so you can either start with the drill or you can use a uh, one among curisons, endoscopic curisons. You can appreciate the flavor. You have removed the upper edge of the C7 lam C5 lamina. Now we can bring in your drills. So in this case, we we just we just have just cut off the uh, we have just detached the flavor from the remaining end. So we are planning if you in the in case you have not removed the flavor, you can use an unguarded cut, but we are using a using a guarded uh, bar in this. You can appreciate we can drilling the inferior articular facet so that is that is a superior articular facet in view we are removing it pulling a bit of that to expose the foramen so once you feel that it is adequate uh, so we feel that in this case we are we should remove a little more of the c7 lamina sorry Uh, that is drilling the facet and that is uh, removing the bit of the c7 lamina so we already detached the flavor of the uh, lower uh, lamina so that means the flavor automatically gets retracted off and we are widening the uh, so we are now we are searching for the root the root will always be covered by soft tissue membranes which contains the venous plexus so we have not found the root till now in this case so you can see the retracted flavor you can appreciate the thecal sac and we are, since you are searching for the lamina we removed the we are searching for the root we are removing a bit of the flavor more exposing the thecal sac usually the root will be light root will lie in the center of this exposure covered by uh, membranes like this with various boxes but here I, the dispel is huge and you can appreciate the thecal sac also being compressed by the root but we are not seeing the root as such so we just we cauterize the whatever tissue is left the venous plexus you can see there is less very less amount of bleeding unlike in an uh, mipcf uh, mainly due to the irrigation pressure so we are not at seeing that we can appreciate the dispel but we have to appreciate the root also so now you can appreciate the root at the superior end of this. This is the cranial end. It has been the root has been pushed upwards by the this bulge. So we are removing the issues over the root after cauterizing to expose the root. We need to get above the root to give a, get a full picture. Now we can appreciate the root a bit more, but still we need a bit more removal. Okay, and we are removing. So epidural venous plexus may cause oozing. 
the most important part is remove uh, that that is a bleeding when a bleeding happens can get your scope go close the bleeding and it will it will terminate the bleeding and you can appreciate the bleeding point well and you can use your rf to cauterize it so you can you get good visions unlike uh, unlike with the microscope and you cauterize the bleeding point so we are slowly getting above the root you can appreciate the superior part of the root a bit more removal so whenever bleeding happens mostly again some epidural loose is coming you can appreciate that so you get your scope down go near the bleeding point and it will terminate the bleeding and uh, make the bleeding point visible so that you can cauterize it easily with an rf Rarely we, we will need to use some spongostone and abdel. Small bits can be kept inside to control the bleeding. So we are almost above the root, but there is some bleeding which is hampering your vision, which we need to cauterize that also. You can appreciate we can also apply bone waxes if the bone uh, bleeding is from the bone. So we can okay. Now we are above the root. You are using a right angle curette can appreciate the front of the root. The root has been pushed upwards in this case, okay. So once you access the root, your job is to remove the decompression using a right angle curette. You're exposing the, you're getting the extruded fragment out. You do not have much liberty like in the Lombardus to retract the thecal sac. So this fine instruments will help you to remove the disc. And then, once you get got the disc out, you can remove it with the your keresans, endoscopic keresans. So we can appreciate that. So we have been removed with 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 pieces of this tissue, but that's a chunk removed. So we have removed some amount of this, but still the root and the thickal sac seems not fully decompressed you can appreciate still there is some combustion it is not fully free so so we are we, we feel that we are missing some fragment here we go in again and uh, so say such magnified views with uh, 360 degree on the road can can we can get with that that's a large fragment and that are stuck inside the sheath. Sometimes you will have to remove the sheath altogether with this fragment if it doesn't come out. Very unlikely that cervical this you get such huge fragments. And once you remove the fragment, there will be there will be some bleeding from the uh, a side where you have to remove the disc. You can appreciate that. Okay, and then again the same purpose to get the scope down, go near the bleeding points, cauterize the endpoints. And now we can appreciate the root and the thickal sac. They seem fully decompressed. And you cauterize them, cauterize the area, and uh, stop the irrigation and look for any other active venous ooze. Uh, and if you are satisfied, you can come out. So this is again, uh, this is a two level discectomy. Uh, two level posterior cervical foraminotomy we have done. So, for any any endoscopic surgery, that is endoscopy benefits on compared with the traditional spine surgery, and we should be uh, following that. We should be tapping the benefits of the endoscopic uh, spine surgery. Uh, simply for this excellent optics and the less collateral damage it keeps. So for any new invention, there is a, something called a Garton hype cycle, where there is a technology trigger followed by a peak of inflated expectations. Then there is a draw of disillusionment. And then there is a slope of enlightenment. And then everybody starts using it. Then that's the product of productivity, which uh, benefits the patients. So I feel that we are in the slope of enlightenment regarding this full endoscopic spine surgery for PCFs. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Navas, for uh, this excellent presentation. Is there any question uh, from panelists? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
اوكي انا ويل شيفت ونكست سبيكر دكتور محمد عبد الباو الو دكتور محمد عبد البر بليز ستارت شيرنج يور سكرين هلا دكتور محمد دكتور محمد دو يو هير اس يو ار ميوتد كان يو سي ماي سكرين نو يس بليز جاست ميك ات فول مود اوكي سوري ابوت ذا تكنيكال ايشوز هير نو اوكي نو اتس اوكي بيرفكت ثانك يو سو ماتش فور ذا انفيتيشن Amazing lecture so far, and uh, uh, thank you so much for the oppor opportunity. So today I'll, I'll be discussing uh, pushing the limits of uh, minimally invasive spine surgery. Here are my consult uh, disclosures. So we'll start off with a case, an 87-year-old with mechanical and back pain. He has the uh, normal American uh, past medical history. Um, and you can see here that uh, He has a you know degenerative uh, scoliosis. You can see on his dynamic films, he has a uh, mobile spondylolisthesis at L4, L5. And he also has um, uh, central stenosis at L2, 3 and L3, 4. And he's 87 years old, right? And so I think it begs the question, you know, should this patient even get surgery? Uh, as one of my former partners says, you know, the only elective spine surgery is the first one. Um, and they come to you and they give you these uh, uh, cat eyes and they say, please, please, please help me. This guy's 87. He rides a motorcycle and uh, he wants to live his life. And he's been told by other spine surgeons uh, that he simply can't get surgery. Um, so I was recently asked to give a talk on enhanced recovery after surgery. Um, I think what's really important is not after, it's actually with surgery. And so there really are four main phases of care that we really have to look at. We look, have to look at preoperative care optimization, intraoperative adjuncts, acute postoperative care, and chronic chronic postoperative care. So in terms of risk gratification, uh, my chief, Dr. Shaffrey, has a whole talk on when to say no to patients. Uh, we really looked at preoperative optimization. Uh, we looked at eight main factors that are modifiable the blood sugar, the blood pressure, smoking, renal function, nutrition, BMI, psychosocial, and bone density. If you've optimized these eight uh, uh, objects, then you have a better chance of having this patient uh, recover from surgery and do well. So after you, you know, optimize the patient and you decide that the patient is appropriate for surgery, you really have to have a good collaboration with anesthesia. I think as the neurosurgeons, uh, we probably don't do as much of that as our uh, orthopedic folks. Um, and this really comes to this uh, whole thing of uh, regional anesthesia. So our orthopedic colleagues, you know, are really good at regional anesthesia and doing certain blocks. And we've really done, uh, tried to champion that. So almost all my patients will get some type of block 
um, before surgery, whether it's a T-lip block, an erector spinae block, and for my 360 fusions, uh, they're now getting a QL block, and that will give you both anterior and posterior coverage. Um, you can see here, we have a analgesic workflow. We have preemptive analgesia. We have the ESP, we have spinal anesthesia, and then we have post-operative management. So currently, uh, you know, lots of people are talking about spinal pelvic parameters and so on. I think that's important, uh, but as we all know, spine is much more complicated than that. We have bones, we have nerves and so on. So what we've done is taken uh, uh, pre-op planning to the next level. We've started to look at the bony structures, and this is usually actually using brain lab, looking at the nerves and so on. Um, and so what we've done is we've broken down uh, fusion surgery to three main parts, placing pedicle screws, intrabody, and plus or minus decompression. So we've tried to minimize the trauma to the tissue at each stage of the operation. So for placing pedicle screws, uh, instead of uh, O-arm or CT navigation, we actually use this uh, uh, floral-based navigation. The fiducials actually go on the actual C-arm, uh, and then you're able to track as many instruments as you want, uh, and it's floral-based. So if the patient moves or somebody knocks the reference array, there's no reference array actually, uh, then it's not a problem because you just can just take an X-ray. So this is kind of how it looks. I'll skip ahead to here. Uh, you can see here we're actually able to place two pedicle screws at the same time. Because it's floral based and not instrument centered, uh, you can actually, um, by changing the uh, uh, sig signature on the infrared uh, marker, you can actually um, monitor more than one instrument, even up to three or four instruments at a time. So this uh, makes surgery much, much faster. Um, and if we look at pedicle screw placement, we showed that uh, and this is a, uh, a randomized trial that we did one side using normal fluoroscopy and the other side using this instrument tracking. We were able to decrease the uh, amount of x-rays by 73% and we we're able to decrease the time by 63%. Now we can even half that because we're doing two screws at one time. Uh, we also showed that the variation is much, much less. Uh, and if you look at accuracy, we compared the two robotic place screws and they're about the same at about 97%. So what about intrabody fusion? Uh, there's different ways to do intrabody fusions, posterior, lateral, anterolateral, anterior. Uh, if we look at uh, just posterior, uh, we really have three main ones. We have the MIS T-lift, we have the transfacet T-lift, and we have the percutaneous cambens T-lift. Uh, and instead of uh, making it based on the, the surgeon's own uh, comfort level and so on, what we've done now is actually for every patient, uh, we're actually uh, looking at these different ways to do this, uh, uh, what we call patient-specific T-lift. So we mark out all these different pathways uh, and we try to figure out which is the safest pathway for each patient at each level. Uh, and then what about awake surgery? We've talked a little bit about that previously. Uh, so as we all know, you know, general anesthesia is not benign. We have all these different uh, complications that can come from uh, awake surgery. So this was the uh, match cohort study that we did for one or two level uh, T lifts. We matched them in terms of their age and the BMI and the surgery. Uh, and we found that the length of stay was decreased uh, by 90%. 90% of the patients were able to go home within 24 hours. This is for one or two level uh, fusions. We also found uh, that 50% of these patients took zero opioids after surgery. That was uh, quite uh, remarkable that you can do a fusion, uh, at least in America, I know in other countries, you know, patients don't get uh, opioids anyways, but in America, they're very used to getting opioids. Uh, and part of the reason is that in spinal anesthesia, uh, you're awake and then you the, the spinal anesthesia wears off slowly, and then you can get more and more uh, uh, pain medicine uh, appropriately. Uh, also, the time to ambulation was also decreased. So this was uh, apples to apples. It's not a randomized control study, but it's a, a match cohort study. However, spinal anesthesia also allows you to operate uh, on oranges or other patients that are more difficult to operate on. So this is another case series. We had 10 patients with horrible comorbidities, and we were able to do these surgeries uh, safely. This was a 91-year-old uh, who uh, had a uh, kyphoplasty done at another place, uh, they had intubated her for the kyphoplasty and had taken them five days to extubate her. And then unfortunately, the cement had came into the canal. 
And so the surgeon there said, you know, I can't take you back to surgery. She came to our place. We did this uh, uh, one level laminectomy under spinal and we sent her home uh, within 24 hours. Uh, so going back to our patient that's 87 years old with three levels of disease, uh, you know, I was really stuck because the spinal anesthesia uh, only lasts for three hours. Uh, and so I told them, you know, maybe I'll just do one level and then we'll bring you back. Uh, we'll do the fusion one level and then we'll bring you back for a decompression for the other two levels. Uh, actually, my uh, fellow at that time, uh, Andrew Chen, who's now uh, attending uh, at Columbia, he came up with the idea, well, why don't we uh, operate in parallel? Instead of doing things in series, why don't we do things in parallel? So what we did actually is bring in two microscopes uh, and here we are putting in the screws and then here we are uh, working in parallel. We brought in two microscopes. Here's me doing the fusion. And on the other side is Dr. Chen doing the two level decompression. So you can see here, I think this is one of the uh, coolest videos. This is at the same time. This is one microscope, me doing the fusion and on this side doing a over the top decompression. And postoperatively, you can see here, we uh, fixed his um, uh, spondylolisthesis. This was done pretty much percutaneously. You can see here just two uh, paramedian incisions. We got the surgery done in uh, less than three hours, uh, 50, uh, 50, degree, uh, 50 cc blood loss. Uh, we were able to send this 87 year old after a three level surgery uh, home uh, within post update one. Uh, and that's really remarkable. I don't think that we could have done this uh, four or five years ago. Uh, we published this in parallel technique and I've started to use this on my multi-level uh, degenerative uh, cases uh, to make sure that we are in within the time of the spinal anesthesia. Uh, best thing is that four months later, he sent me this uh, 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 picture of him riding his motorcycle. Uh, so this really is, I think, uh, uh, a boon to our, our abilities to do these types of surgeries. Uh, so just to conclude, I think minimally invasive spine surgery is really exciting for both the patients and the physicians. Uh, we really need to look at patient-specific and pathology-specific planning. Um, and I think you need to have close collaborations with all the team members, anesthesia, nursing, and physical therapy. And thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mohammed, uh, for uh, this uh, nice presentation. Is there any questions? Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. We are just waiting for Dr. Biv to join us. May take... Uh... Some more minutes.
هلو دكتور أحمد هو يو بليز أهلا أنميوت بيك أهلا بيك يا دكتور أمورنا بخير الحمد لله الحمد لله كل عام وحضرتك سامعني بخير وأنت كل بخير عام رمضان كريم على الجميع كل عام وحضرتك بخير Thank you for joining us today أهلا وسهلا أبدا أهلا وسهلا أنا أول شيك تو نيكست سبيكر بروفيسور ماي دير براذر دكتور أحمد الخاني فروم سعودي أريبيا One of uh, eminent uh, neurosurgeon there, he will talk to us uh, today about uh, Minjuma. Please start sharing your screen. Okay. Oh, hello. Good uh, afternoon. It's three o'clock in the afternoon in Riyadh. Uh, can you see my presentation? Yes, sir. Okay. So the sound is okay, the screen is okay. So let me um, start by saying thank you very much, Dr. Um, Samih, for your uh, kind invitation. It's my pleasure to be with you in this Zoom meeting. I'm going to talk about Fermin Magnum in Ijeoma, and the principle is how to avoid complications for this delicate surgery. Um, I have nothing to declare. Um, before we start, I need to stress on the importance of the anatomy and understanding the anatomy of the foramen magnum, understanding the anatomy in terms of osteology, of the bone of the foramen magnum, and how it's composed of, and the stability issue of foramen magnum and the craniocervical junction. In addition to that, it's very important to review the bony, the ligamentous um, structure of this important part of the uh, human body. In addition to that, we need to go into the neural elements where we can identify the cervicomedullary junction, the important vascular and neural component at that level. This is very important when we talk about avoiding complications of the uh, tumor that exists in this part of the body. In general, we classify uh, tumor as axial axis extra axial but intradural nervous system or extra dural. And in this presentation, I'm going to focus on the uh, foramen magnum meningioma, but I will show some cases of um, intraaxial pathology also. So this is a case of 46-year-old female who presented with a foramen meningioma that presented with a left-sided weakness mainly in the arm, and she has a minimal lower cranial nerves involvement. Indeed, this meningioma is more into the left side. It, it, it exfoliates intradurally, and it has a small component that exfoliates extradurally. This is very important, important when we are dissecting this tumor and taking it out, that we keep in mind that there may be a small uh, part of the meningioma that goes to the other side of the meninges, and this needs to be traced and removed completely. I'm going to show you, you a cranial cervical or a foramen magnum meningioma resection, how we deal with this uh, tumor in that sense. And I hope the video will work. It's working. So I want you to notice a few things. I do leave the C2 intact. I remove the arch of C1, but between here and here, you know, uh, it should not be more than like a two centimeter, so we don't uh, contribute to uh, uh, instability of the craniocervical junction. And I increase the size of the foramen magnum by craniectomy. Here we can see the tumor, and you can see the cranial nerve. It's always good to understand that foramen magnum should not be removed at a single piece. And this is extremely possible. Usually for meningioma that locate anteriorly or anterior lateral, the best thing is to locate a surface we can go through to uh, coagulate the surface, minimal amount of coagulation so we don't have the cranial nerve stuck to the tumor itself. And then from inside, start to remove the content of this meningioma and remove it piece by piece, piece by piece, Tell we feel that it's nicely decompressed, as you can see on this video. And in here, the capsule has been removed, and the rest of the meningioma can be resected completely. In addition to that, the 
dural attachment can be coagulated reaching to Simpson uh, grade uh, uh, two. So with this, we have like a low chance of recurrence and it, we are preserving the lower cranial nerves completely and the spinal cord is not, is not compromised at all by any mean. Uh, when we go to the next case, this is, uh, for example, post opturing complete resection of the tumor, and the histopathology is nothing but a garden variety of, um, of meningioma grade one that does not require any radiation, which I totally agree with the school that minimize or give no radiation whenever possible to meningiomas because that will be the best for the patient. Nice total resection. Uh, uh, with the dura grade one Simpson, if not at least coagulation of the dura to make it into grade two. Uh, this is an, a pure anterior pyramid magnum meningioma. There are many schools how we approach these cases. We have to do lateral approach where we can go through the lateral part of C1 and into the condyles, and this may destabilize the craniocervical junction and the patient may require craniocervical fusion. I belong to the school that to go microscopically and avoiding fusion as possible. I'm going to show you how we dealt with this case by nice exposure. As you can see here, enlarge the foramen magnum by occipital craniectomy, uh, remove the C1 and the upper part of C2, allowing us to identify the dentate ligament, sacrifice the dentate ligament completely, and allowing us to approach into the meningioma, which is a pure anterior here, once from the right side, once from the left side, till we have complete resection of the tumor on the ventral side of the spinal cord and the cervical medullary junction. And the result is usually very favorable. I put this slide to identify what I meant by the dentate ligament and to make 100% sure that has been sacrificed. So this will allow the movement of the spinal cord safely from one side to the other and allowing us to approach the area anterior to the spinal cord without compromising neither the blood supply nor applying any pressure on the spinal cord. Uh, this is why I do believe that going an extra uh, level below to reach the dentate ligament uh, release worth the effort 100% instead of going posterior lateral, for example, and um, putting the patient under risk of destabilization and the need for instrumentation and fusion. And here you can see post-operatively nice total resection of this foramen magnum pure anterior foramen magnum meningioma between the two vertebral artery without sacrificing the stability of the craniocervical junction. This is another bad case of uh, uh, foramen magnum meningioma. You can see the flow void, how difficult it is. But again, uh, we go it one by one and we go with the same principle of debulking from within and dissecting it around. And sometimes we can reach a good uh, reasonable resection of this foramen magnum meningioma, decompression of the spinal cord, decompression of the brain stem, and then you can follow this patient and if it exhibits any sort of recurrence or regrowth of the residual, we can always at that time apply radio uh, therapy as an adjuvant to our surgical intervention. One thing I want to mention that uh, not every foramen magnum meningioma needs to be operated on. This is a lady who had a small foramen magnum meningioma as one of multiple spinal meningiomas that she had, and it's adjacent to the vertebral artery on the right side. And indeed, we elected to observe only this tumor since it has no uh, uh, symptomatology coming from it and the patient has been uh, followed for good uh, eight years or nine years with no uh, symptoms of uh, uh, recurrence and radiologically there is no difference between the two images after a few years. So not all foramen magnum meningioma needs to come out. We have uh, presented our series of uh, foramen magnum meningioma in the WFNS meeting in uh, China a few years ago, and we have accumulated maybe as much as what we have presented at that time with excellent results. 
no need for fusion, uh, no need for post-operative radiotherapy. And the key was more into uh, applying our anatomy and our approach without compromising neither the blood supplies nor applying pressure on the neural element. Just a few cases, like not all from pathology is a meningioma. For example, this is a child with a intramedial tumor uh, that exhibit more on the dorsum of the medulla that underwent near total resection, as you can see here, and the pathology came back as ganglioglioma. The, the child enjoyed post-operative uh, course with no neurological deficit, and uh, he was followed for a few years with excellent results. Another case of a cervical medullary lesion in a young uh, female, 17-year-old, with a lesion intramedullary that occupy the whole medulla. We were able to interfere posteriorly, midline, dorsum, uh, resecting that tumor uh, completely and resulting here in a total resection of the tumor, no, no significant residual. And this flexion extension X-rays, I, 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 I presented it to confirm that uh, there is no uh, compromise of the stability at that level. One more case of a cervical medullary junction pathology with a highly intense enhancing lesion uh, within the spinal cord itself and has been resected. And the result, as you can see here, with nice total resection turned to be hemangioblastoma. So meningioma is the most common at that location, 100% for intradural pathology. However, other pathology can be seen, especially in the intramedullary component. So how can we make this surgery safe and reach these results in terms of outcome? Number one, it starts with the anesthesia. So Whenever you deal with cervical medullary junction, you should always remember that there is pressure on the neural element. And you don't want to start the surgery by squeezing it by uh, uh, ordinary uh, uh, laryngoscopic uh, intubation. So this is why I insist that all the patients should go through a fibro-optic intubation. Now with the glidoscope, it gave a good way to to, to intubate this patient with minimal amount of movement at that area because there is a pressure. Post-op, there should be no problem because there is no problem with the stability, but pre-op, there is compression on the, uh, on the neural limit and you don't want to have some sort of uh, compromise by flexion. Uh, airways pressure, you should always remember that I usually operate with this patient in a prone position, as many surgeons around the world do it that way. Some people would do it on lateral position, but I do it with uh, wrong position. It's very important to understand the airways pressure and the pathophysiology of that and make sure that to reduce the airways pressure as much as possible by using muscle relaxant, by good positioning of the patient on the operating table to minimize the airways pressure. Otherwise, you're going to have a significant uh, venous ooze that will... Uh, contribute badly to your surgical intervention. And a good anesthesia is a cardinal to keep the MEEP on the upper side and to allow us to flip the patient from supine to prone and backward after the surgery uh, without a problem. Extubation is very important because the worst thing is that the need for the intubation in the OR. This is why we take extubation slowly, even if we need after a long surgery to do the extubation next day, I have no problem with that, but allow the patient to wake up slowly without a problem. We, I usually put all the patient on pins, uh, uh, turning the patient with the pins on the OR table. Uh, always apply for an X-ray to ensure that the pins of vital junction looks okay. Uh, many times I do put external orthotics like a hard collar when I flip the patient to a prone position and before I flip him back to supine and removing of the Mayfield clamp. Again, in terms of surgery, it's a classical everywhere. We do the occipital craniotomy. We enlarge the foramen magnum uh, to allow us to dissect more into the uh, dentate ligament, sacrificing them and allow to move the spinal cord one way or the other, if it is lateral or if it's even ventral, as I've described earlier in my presentation. 
I do remove the C1 completely, and I usually I drill it in, uh, as opposite to remove it with the cloud. And sometimes we need to reach down to C2, and sometimes we do not need. Uh, it depends on how much we need to expose the dentate ligament to release that uh, spinal cord before we attack the tumor itself. Uh, worth to mention about neurophysiology monitoring uh, indications is to preserve what's going on with the patient himself. I remind you, if the patient came late with a motor power of three over five and less, there is no point of uh, uh, neurophysiology monitoring except for lower cranial nerves. So we do uh, motor evoke potential, somatosensory evoke potential, auditory evoke potential. These are very important interoperatively. And the lower cranial nerves are impossible. We do uh, monitor 12, 11, and 10, um, uh, this is very important for us to be able to achieve total resection in a safe uh, manner and to ensure that we're able to resect the tumor completely. Uh, if we have part of the tumor capsule stuck very much to a blood vessels or to one of the lower cranial nerve, we always elect to leave a membrane of the tumor on the neural element or on a vascular element without compromising it or putting it under, under uh, danger. I think the risk of uh, uh, regrowth will be still very low and it's definitely uh, worth to preserve the neural element. Uh, what about post-operative care? In terms of steroid, we give steroid like 8 or 10 milligram of dexamethasone, uh, antibiotics covered as usual. And as I mentioned, post-operatively, we do not put the patient on a hard collar. We sometimes we put a soft collar for the patient for pain control and to remind the patient that he had surgery in his uh, cervical spine, so just to be careful. But for flipping the patient from supine to prone uh, before the surgery and just after the surgery for extubation, sometimes we use this uh, trick of hard collar to ensure that the neck does not go through any abrupt, sudden, uh, unwanted uh, maneuver of the cervical spine. Uh, in terms of uh, post-operative care, it's very important to avoid CSF leak, and I keep saying that uh, observing CSF leak, observing CSF leak, observing CSF leak. You are very, very religious about this thing and to make 100% sure that if it happened, it has to be tackled and has to be uh, treated uh, very aggressively. And I'm come to that in a second. Lower cranial nerves, palsy, it can happen. And the importance of this, sometimes it's only trivial postoperatively because of maneuvering the lower cranial nerve. The importance here is that the patient may aspirate and that may require reintubation and ICU for a few days. So very important to make sure to protecting the airways and uh, if the patient has any problem with uh, secretion, we treat it very aggressively in the ICU uh, before taking the patient to the floor. And then one day, two days later, a combination of secretion in the lung. And then because of the aspiration, and then we uh, put the patient to danger, that's totally avoidable if we uh, are sure that we are observing for possible lower cranial nerves, uh, pulsy post opportunity that, that can happen even for a trivial period. Wound infection can happen, it's a bit rare, and happens when there's a CSF leak, there's always a chance for a wound infection. But in general, we don't experience any bad encounters with the wound infection in the cranial cervical junction. So uh, I'm very religious about CSF leak, and it's like uh, either it's an all or none low. If you have a single drop, it's equivalent to fluid gushing from the wound. There is nothing called minimal amount of CSF leak. is either there or not there. And we avoid that by good closure of the dura. In general, I like interrupted suture, except in a spinal, uh, in a spinal dural closure, I always like running um, uh, for a uh, neurolon to close the dura and followed with whatever artificial the material we have to prevent CSF leak. I'm not going to advertise for any. I don't use a glue at all. I, I'm, I'm not a fan of a glue, regardless of the brands. And whenever there is a chance of CSF leak, I always put a lumbar drain. So lumbar drain threshold is extremely low. If there's any doubt that there is any leak, the answer is a lumbar drain for five to seven days. 
uh, this is what I want to talk about in terms of lower criminal males, in terms of wound infection. As I said, we did not encounter a significant wound infection issues with uh, foramen magnum meningioma, but whenever there is a CSF leak, there's always a chance for wound infection. So in summary, uh, to avoid problem with the foramen magnum meningioma and approach good results, we need to understand the anatomy, anatomy, anatomy. This is the most important part if anyone wants to go uh, to remove this tumor, and it doesn't matter if it is dorsal, lateral, or ventral, understanding the anatomy, negotiating the anatomy in a, a pleasant way that they don't get uh, annoyed or uh, uh, disrupted, uh, pushed extra, and uh, preserving them uh, is extremely important. And again, uh, learning curve is very important. Initially, in, in my practice, the result was not as good. Uh, pathology is very important if you are dealing with meningioma versus other pathology. Closure, and again, it's the deep fascia that need to be closed in an excellent way. Uh, before that, we only approximate the paravertebral muscles. And I, again, I don't do any fusion uh, unless needed later on. That doesn't happen usually as frequent as worth mentioning. Uh, stability is not a problem if we limit ourselves to like a two centimeters of resection of a meningioma, it should not be an issue. And we follow up this patient with an MRI to ensure total resection and later on once yearly for a maximum of five years to make sure that there is no, on a yearly base MRI with gadolinium to ensure that there is no uh, residual slash recurrence of the tumor. I just want to say thank you very much uh, for giving me the chance to talk. I would like to invite you all for the Pan-Arab Neurosurgical Society meeting that's going to happen in the ever-growing and developing countries of Riyadh. Uh, you all hearing that Riyadh has a lot of new things going on at the same time. A beautiful city, dynamic city, young city. We hope to see you all in Riyadh in the 1 to 4 November. If you have any problem, please don't hesitate to take that uh, uh, website address, uh, PANS 2024, and I would love to see you all in Riyadh. You're all cardinally invited, and don't hesitate to reach me personally if you need anything. Once again, thank you very much for all your uh, kind invitation and uh, listening to the presentation. Thank you, uh, dear brother, for uh, this excellent presentation. Sorry for uh, making you rush, uh, because at once we have... Uh, many emergencies for all uh, the speakers to follow. Um, thanks again for uh, this uh, excellent presentation. And uh, there is a question here in chat box asking about your indication to fix craniocervical after surgery. Okay, well, that's, 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 that's very important. I do my best to avoid fusion. I do my best to avoid fusion. I, uh, I re retain myself from going to serolateral, not to compromise the craniocervical junction. Even if there is any doubt, I do not fuse up front. So I do the surgery, resect the tumor completely, see how the patient is doing post-operatively. And if there is a need in the future for fusion, we will talk about that later on. None of our meningioma required uh, fusion in terms of uh, post-operatively. So I do my best to contain within a corridor of maximum 20 millimeters to resect the tumor regardless if it's anterior, posterior, or lateral. And uh, I don't fuse. I just don't fuse. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, again for this uh, excellent presentation. Is there any question from the panelist? Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And now we will shift to next speaker, uh, Dr. Nikolai Bib. Please start sharing your screen. Thank you so much. And um, an honor to be with you today and uh, to be possible to present my angle on transforaminal endoscopic discectomy. Um, Apologies also for a slight delay. I was in the hospital and I was uh, slightly trapped there, but everything is okay now. So uh, what I'm going to talk to you today about is transforaminal uh, endoscopic discectomy. Um, how, to, how to start that if you haven't started your practice. Uh, this is not a talk to, to teach you how to do advanced 
uh, procedures. This is talked for, uh, if you haven't started yet, this will be a good idea for you to, uh, to, to different steps to implement and to, uh, to start that procedure because it's becoming more and more popular and it's, uh, it's useful for, uh, for your patients. So, uh, my name is uh, Nikolai Peev, and I work at the minute in uh, in Belfast. Belfast is part of the United Kingdom, the four provinces, and the four provinces Northern Ireland, and Belfast is the capital of Northern Ireland. Um, so this is uh, the hospital I work and the university. Uh, we have a good anatomical facility. We organize courses. So endoscopic discectomy, how to start? Well, the best thing is to go and do a fellowship uh, program. However, uh, many of us already uh, well into practice and to to leave your life and to go for a fellowship for months or, or more would be uh, difficult. So if you're a junior, obviously that's the best thing to do. But if you are well into your practice and <clears throat> you want to still establish endoscopic uh, surgery, there is other ways to do that. And I'm going to talk about this. So um, uh, uh, if you don't have time for uh, for a fellowship, then cadaver courses, online, course, online courses, online resources, short term observership uh, would be something that you would consider invited uh, faculty is always uh, available from the major companies which are providing with the instrument that's also something that you can consider you can go on courses with them and that will be beneficial but probably that's gonna it's not gonna be enough so it's a hard problem and usually in order to crack a hard problem the best uh, strategy to do that is to to crack it to a few simple problems so that's what i did uh, five years ago, and then I performed this uh, procedure now for the last five years. So um, let's start with the anatomy. This is the anatomy that um, that you are uh, familiar with. This is still the mainstream of education. This is uh, what everybody uh, will learn during their residency years. And that's what we are all uh, used to do and implement. So this is the area that you would normally address when you have a disc herniation in, uh, in the different regions. And you will get the, the disc herniation with the microscope if you're a neurosurgeon uh, without any uh, problem. But if you would like to go with the endoscope, it's a completely different game because that takes you on the other side. And the anatomy is completely different. And if you're not used to that, um, it's going to be difficult for you to get oriented and to do the job that, that is expected uh, you to do. So uh, to understand the anatomy is very important. And to understand not only the anatomy, but to understand the perspective is very important. Uh, So-called Cambin's triangle. This is where you are going in order to uh, do... Uh, the endoscopic transforaminal discectomy. This is this is your working corridor, but it's really uh, not the whole Cambin's triangle, but just a part of it. And that part initially is smaller, but as you get uh, more experience, then that that circle becomes bigger, and you're possible to access all of these disc herniations which are here. But that's not the point of that talk now. So let's continue with with the basics. Um, so, uh, before anything else, and before I continue, uh, if you get one uh, thing from that presentation is that the lower end plate is your, your, your best friend. You have to center all of your instruments aligned properly and aligned well with the, uh, with the lower end plate. Because if you do that, even if you cannot get the disc herniation, if you cannot uh, perform your task that's required, at least you would not damage the exiting nerve root. So the exiting nerve root is the one that is in the greatest risk when you're performing transforaminal lumbar uh, discectomies. And this is because of that. If you are closer to the lower end plate, you're facing that kind of situation here. You're facing that kind of situation. You're medial, you're medial to the exiting nerve root. But if you're too much cranial, you're facing that kind of situation. You are, you can dock your instrument right on the nerve root 
and you can damage the nerve root badly and then the patient will have problem and then you will have problems. The other thing that I would like to stress today is that unlike the, um, the microscopic uh, discectomies, for example, where you have landmarks, you see the landmarks. Here, you don't have landmarks that you see. You have radiographic anatomy. So you have to be very familiar with the radiographic anatomy. You have to be possible to discriminate different objects on your x-ray. And uh, that is of paramount importance for, for your success. Also, you have to have a very good uh, radiographer and you have to be very demanding what pictures they give you because the quality of the x-rays here are very important so they will not mislead you. So if you can see here, the difference between this uh, vertebra and this vertebra is significant. And what's important is the end plate that you are uh, addressing, the disc that you're addressing. So if you see elliptical end plate, uh, that is not a good picture. So you have to ask your uh, radiographer, for example, if you are addressing that disc, uh, you have to ask your radiographer to, do, to, to change the uh, X-ray direction to a bit more lordotic or to a bit more kyphotic until you get the uh, end plate of interest as a, as a single line. Remember the lower end plate of the disc that you are addressing. This is where you're aiming and that should be a straight line on AP picture. So that's very important. Same thing applies for the laterals. Uh, if you are not seeing a horizontal straight line uh, or vertical straight line, this is very important for you to achieve before you proceed further. Otherwise, your x-rays are not reliable and you may think that your instrument is safe, but actually might not. So be aware of that and be very, very uh, particular about that. So you have to uh, request a true AP and you have to request a true lateral x-rays. And also uh, be careful that your, your midline structures are in the middle. Be careful that your spinous process is in the middle because that also can give you problems and also can mislead you if not if you are not um, if you're not uh, meticulous about it the other thing that uh, that i want to comment is the starting point if you start reading about different endoscopic procedures in the beginning uh, you will see that there is different techniques and the entry point is one of the most important uh, things that you have to establish once you establish the entry point properly then the surgery goes. But if you start your entry point in a wrong, uh, at, at a wrong uh, position uh, or angle, then the surgery most likely will go wrong or, and, and the, the, the best that you can achieve is not damage anything. But the worst is obviously not only not achieving your, your surgical goal, but damaging different important structures which obviously is not desirable. So I am um, discriminating three zones on lateral X-ray in order to determine uh, your entry point. So this is the red zone. This is so so-called no-go zone. And this is a uh, green zone that is the, the targeted zone for you. And this is something that will probably not give you also um, uh, good good angle for you to work. That probably is not going to damage so many uh, or will, will, will give you damage to different important structures. Uh, well, everything can, uh, can, can be expected. But mostly, uh, this is where you will have the significant danger. Uh, and this is where you should aim your instrument to be located on, on the lateral X-ray. So, for example, if you're addressing transforaminal L4-L5 disc. So you have to try to dock your instrument somewhere in that green zone. And that green zone is between the suprafacetal line here. You can see suprafacetal and the supraspinous line. So this is the green zone. So if you are addressing disc at L4-L5, so your starting point on lateral should be somewhere here, somewhere in uh, some in between these two lines, and obviously aligned with the disc that you're that you're uh, addressing. This is depicted here on on that body. You can see that this will be your blue zone. If you're too medial, you'll get into the blue zone. 
If you are too lateral, you will get to the red zone. So you have to be somewhere here and up and down uh, in that uh, green zone will determine how much medial you want to be or how much lateral you want to be in the foramen. Or uh, So obviously, if you would like to address a disc that will be more central, you have to be more lateral. If you would like to go uh, more uh, lateral than uh, uh, in the foramen, then you have to be more medial on the skin. And like that, with, uh, with this technique, you can, you can avoid remembering numbers because these are the numbers that most of the books will tell you to start with. But I cannot imagine how uh, one and the same number will work to on the body of somebody that is 50 kilograms and on the body of somebody that will be 150 kilograms. Obviously, that's not, imp that's not possible and that will be misleading. So the other thing that I would like to stress and that would be important for you is to develop a sense of 3D uh, biplanar awareness. This is how you are advancing your needle. And then on AP and lateral, just make sure that you have true AP and true lateral images. Again, I will not uh, get tired to stress how important is that. This is the endpoints of your instruments on true AP and true lateral. If you have that, this is a good starting point for you to continue sliding instruments and to continue chasing your surgical goals. However, um, that is not always uh, easy to do, so you have to train. And I will comment on that, how you can train yourself to do that. So as uh, we all know, the first step, if you are starting, if you have started to read uh, on endoscopic discectomy, transforaminal, you will, you will see that the first step is always passing your needle and then passing your key wire. So this is where your needle has to be docked uh, in the beginning, in case you would like to have a good start and good success later on. So the needle should be not medial to the medial pedicular line. And then on the lateral should be not above uh, to the posterior vertebral line or, or not surpassing it. So this is the ideal position on the posterior vertebral line or slightly short of that. Uh, or on the latch on the AP, uh, you could be just on the medial pedicular line or slightly short of that. And this is, this is a diagram that is showing you exactly where your, uh, your, your, the tip of your instrument will be. So medial to the exiting nerve root inside the Cambins triangle, and then at the disc space here. So again, just remember what I told you in the beginning, your instrument has to be uh, aligned with the inferior end plate or close to the inferior end plate. That's also very important. And the reason again is that if you are more cranial, you may damage the exiting nerve root. So obviously this is something that, uh, that is a wrong that is a wrong docking, that is a wrong picture on AP and lateral. Uh, you can see that on AP, you're surpassing the, the line, uh, but more importantly, you can see that on lateral, you're surpassing the, uh, the posterior line as well here. So obviously in that case, you will be inside the disc. Um, in some techniques that can be acceptable, for example, if you're doing inside out technique, but that's now becoming uh, less and less used because um, uh, basically what you do is you just empty the disc and that's not always best for your patient. So this is something that could be even more dangerous. You can see on lateral, you are short, slightly short of your uh, posterior vertebral line, but on AP, you are well behind your medial uh, pedicular line. So that will tell you that you're likely intradural and then if you continue sliding instruments, you will damage the dura, you will have dural tear, you will have a, a nerve root tear, and then you're gonna have problems. This is another dangerous situation on AP. You can see that you are uh, just short of the uh, medial uh, pedicular line. However, here you're too deep. So you're in that occasion, you probably are inside the abdomen so you can damage uh, important vessel, you can, you can damage bowel, you can damage abdominal organs, you can damage uh, retroperitoneal organs and like that, uh, that, can, that can be a disaster. 
So uh, once you dock your needle uh, appropriately, according to these two lines, then the next step is you have to slide your, your dilator. Same principle applies for your dilator. You can see the dilator is uh, just short of the medial pedicular line. Uh, and, uh, and on AP, on AP and then on lateral, it will be just docked on the posterior vertebral line. And then after uh, you get your instrument, uh, your dilator, then the next thing is you're sliding your, uh, your working cannula. And then after you um, slide your working cannula, you have to start working. But before I continue, uh, the significance of the rotation of the, can the cannula. The cannula is normally uh, with a bevel tip. You can see this is your dilator. This is your, um, your working cannula. So what you have to do is you have to, when you're trading your cannula, the bevel should be always medially. So the bevel will be slight will be sliding on the facet and then uh, the flat surface will be pushing the uh, the nerve root away so but if you if you stick your bevel in that position that uh, sharp end of the bevel can damage your nerve root so that's not desirable obviously so that's why always the bevel should be inserted with the bevel inside and then you can re re uh, rotate 180 degrees like that in order to achieve uh, working space later on. Same thing demonstrated here. After you put your working cannula, you start uh, working, you put your endoscope, and this is the picture that you have to uh, see. And then you have to explore that picture. You have to recognize then your structures and you have to start uh, your discectomy. So a few, a few factors that will help you to go there and to start there to, to perfect your, um, uh, your approach. Uh, I put here injections. If you haven't started your endoscopic discectomy and you're planning to start that, and if you have no experience, as I have stressed, the first step will be to dock your needle appropriately. Uh, this will be uh, one of the most important first steps. And if you dock your needle appropriately, then everything goes better. So if you have some experience with injections beforehand, that will help you to recognize your anatomy properly. That will help you to, uh, to correct your x-ray properly. And so if you are not doing injections, maybe a good idea to start doing spinal injections if you're planning to start uh, endoscopic uh, practice anytime soon. Endoscopic experience is always uh, good to have. I myself did not have uh, spinal endoscopy uh, experience. However, before I had cranial endoscopy experience, so that was helpful. Also, I was doing uh, on a regular basis, minimal invasive surgery, transforaminal lumbar interbody fusion. So I was already uh, familiar with the anatomy uh, in that perspective. So that's also, that was also something that uh, helped me. Scrub team anesthetist, very important uh, because especially in the first cases when you're stressed and when you have to be uh, focused what you're doing, you don't need to divide your focus to tell your scrub team or your anesthetist what they are doing. So that's also very important when you're starting. Radiographer, I mentioned to you that the radiographer and the radiography is very important. So having reliable radiographies is a prerequisite for good surgery and the other way around. So uh, have somebody that is with you regularly. So you don't need to explain to them every day what you're doing. Uh, faculty surgeon also is a good idea for your first cases, and that will be uh, provided by the companies that are providing you with the with the endoscopes. Mentioned about the injections, what I have started doing, this is the traditional way that you would do the injection. This is the midline. And usually when you're doing injections, let's say transforaminal uh, nerve root injection, uh, your offset will be four or five centimeters. What I have started to do in the beginning, when I was before, before I was, uh, when I was planning to start endoscopy, is I started using longer needle. I started using longer needle instead of the standard nine centimeter needle. I started using 15 centimeter needle with longer offset. So like that, I was basically in the same 
trajectory as I would uh, start my endoscopic surgeries. So this was uh, beneficial for everybody. This was beneficial for the patient because especially with a very narrow uh, foramen, uh, it, that uh, direct that trajectory is um, putting you in an orthograde direction towards the foramen and it's uh, with that trajectory I can uh, go in the foramen and do transforaminal uh, easy with any uh, any patient even if it's very stenotic like but with that this is not always possible so that was beneficial for the, my patients when I started doing that and it was beneficial for me as well because I was training the approach the first steps of the endoscopic transforaminal Another thing that I have to tell you is, uh, especially with your first ca cases, uh, first patients will be very important for your success. Uh, if I am starting now and if I haven't done so many cases, usually I would choose a young patient, fit patient, slim patient. L4L5 is the best level in the beginning. Uh, L4L5 extruded paramedian disc is the, 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 the first discs that you have to address. Uh, you have to have young patient because no degeneration and large foramen. And also you have to be careful with the anatomy variations. Iliac crest could be a problem with male. So sometimes even at L4L5, iliac crest could be a problem with, uh, with, uh, with men. So be careful. Have an X-ray, a lateral X-ray. And like that, you see if your iliac crest, you're on your way or not. Um, X-ray, proper X-ray will show you how big is the foramen as well. If the foramen is very stenotic, that's not your first case. Later on, when you're more experienced, uh, that could be possible to be done. Uh, but this is definitely not a first case uh, if you are not very experienced. And finally, I will give a few slides on the radiation protection. You'll be X-raying a lot uh, with your first cases. So be careful uh, how you protect yourself from radiation because radiation is expensive, is, uh, is important to understand because it's dangerous. You have to know how to protect yourself because you'll be doing many operations and the radiation uh, will damage you in case you're not careful with that. So a few uh, things to remember. Uh, distance is very important for radiation, even more important than uh, protective uh, gear. Uh, and also the way you are uh, positioning yourself and positioning your X-ray is also very important. A few words about that. Choose your site wisely. See here the surgeon uh, that is uh, staying on the site of the X-ray tube is getting way more radiation comparing to the surgeon that would be staying away from the, on the contralateral side of the X-ray tube. So if you're choosing your position, your site wisely, uh, you're getting times less scattered radiation. Same thing is showing here. You can see that if you are possible to step only uh, 30, 30 to 60 centimeters away from your field, your radiation drops significantly. On that side of the slide, you have to avoid the tube being on top of the patient on AP imaging. Uh, the, the tube will be always under and the detector is always above. Like that, you're saving yourself a lot of scatter, as you can see here. So choose your site wisely. Um, this is very important research that I want to stress to you. This is done by Korean uh, people. So what they have done is they put a, a detector that is wrapped uh, in a glove, next uh, lead protected glove next to the patient. And B is 30 centimeter away detector that is not wrapped in a glove. So interestingly, this one is getting way more radiation despite it is wrapped in a lead protected glove comparing to that. So 30 centimeters is of paramount importance. Every time when you screen, when you ask your radiographer to screen for you, try to step one step back and that will give you a significant drop of radiation. And that was it from me. Uh, I hope it was, uh, it was helpful. Thank you so much for, for, your, uh, for your attention. Thank you, uh, Dr. Obid, uh, for this uh, excellent presentation. Is Thank there any questions? Any problems? If any questions?
Hi Ben, how you been, Nick? Hello, hi, hi, good, good, good. How are you? Long time. I, I haven't seen you since Nepal. Since Nepal, that's correct. Yes, yeah. we were with John in Nepal in 2017. That's right. That's right. That was uh, good memories. Yes, yes. <clears throat> okay, Sam. Thanks again, uh, Doctor Beef. It seems it uh, it was uh, uh, too clear for all of us. Uh, no questions. That's good. Thank that's you. good. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. you so much for having me today. Thank you. Thank you. And now, bye bye. And now we'll shift uh, to uh, Professor George Salazar. Please start sharing your screen. Hello to everyone. I would like to thank Professor Sami El Morsi for his kind invitation. And let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes. perfect, perfect. Okay, uh, once again, I would like to thank uh, the organizer for his invitation. I give my appreciation, Professor Sami, and I would like to present my experience about how to avoid complications in ACDF procedures. When performing an ACDB approach, preserving vital structures is the essence of success. A full understanding of the surgical anatomy is crucial to perform a safe surgical procedures. Mechanisms of injury are compression, laceration, excessive destruction, ischemia, bleeding. So we require a delicate tissue dissection to avoid lesions of the esophagus, carotid vertebral arteries, pulmonary pleura, dura mater, cervical roots, and the spinal cord. On these papers, we see that ACDF is mainly used for cervical degenerative disease and also for trauma, tumors, and vascular lesions. Rating scales such as NURIC, RANAWAT, European, and modified Japanese allow a functional assessment to determine prognosis. It draws our attention that 21% of patients <clears throat> do not have the classic signs of myelopathy. 75% show a progressive neurological deterioration. 5% with a rapid onset. Complications may occur at the perioperative stage or later. Dysphagia is the most frequent complication presented in 8% of cases. Recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy at 3%. Less frequent are fistula, or C, sorry, the spinal fluid, esophageal perforation, carotid and vertebral arteries injury, and worsening of neurological symptoms. We must be sure that neurophysiological and radiological examination corresponds to the signs and symptoms of each patient. We need to analyze the levels of cord and root compression, spinal stenosis, resthesis, disc herniation, calcification of the ligament flavum, signs of instability, myelopathy, and sagittal balance alterations to plan the most appropriate surgical procedure and promote the best results in prognosis. A detailed analysis of the cervical sagittal balance is essential. The objective is to maintain an horizontal look for the patient and preserve low doses. The cervical spine with alteration of the sagittal balance has compensatory mechanisms to maintain the precision of the head. These are some of the most reliable parameters to evaluate sagittal balance. For example, the C27 lower doses angle is around 12 degrees, and it correlates with the T1 slope angle, which is about 20 degrees. Common procedures in the anterior approach are the ACDV, with fusion, with cage, or plate, or we can use a standalone cage. We must calculate on a head of time with a 3D scan how long we'll measure the anterior corpectomy 
and the sanding rim or bowl graft that should fit snugly and secured with plates and screws. We should know each technique and have the right instruments available at hand. We should plan how many levels to decompress and fuse, which nerve roots are affected, how many degrees of kyphosis or lordosis correction we need to obtain for a better outcome. This is a checklist about the main complications that we should keep in mind to be prepared to prevent and to treat. Bad position of screws, plates, and grafts is avoided with correct use of intraoperative X-rays, CT, or navigation. Kyphotic deformity or hyperlordosis is avoided by applying corrections from our sagittal balance study. Dysphagia results from esophageal injury during medial retraction. It's commonly observed in early postoperative periods and improves within six months. We should check that the blades of the lateral retractors are the, long, the longest colline muscle, and from time to time, we need to relax this retraction. The same apply to the lateral retractors to avoid injury to the carotid artery. Lesions to vertebral artery are rare. They are produced when we are drilling or curating or taking the disc far lateral from the unciform process. So use of microscopy is a must. We can anticipate more complications than usual in high risk patients. We must consider and correct if possible premorbidity conditions such as osteoporosis, anemia, coagulation disorders, thromboembolism, hypoalbuminemia, cirrhosis, pulmonary and arterial hypertension, among others. This is a 40-year-old high-risk patient with polytrauma and a C67 cervical injury. We should first stabilize this patient hemodynamically at the intensive care unit and then we perform the cervical approach to decompress the spinal cord with a C6 carpectomy and a C5-6 discoidectomy and stabilize with a titanium cage. This is the tail of a C6-7 carpectomy with basket type arthrodesis. At the beginning of surgery, we should avoid pressure injuries carry out a delicate intubation, sometimes through endoscopy, use of antibiotic compression stockings, early antibiotic therapy, maintain adequate arterial blood and venous lines. Blood should be available at the operating room. Keep the airway permeable. We must do frequent controls of the inflation bag during surgery. We perform a clean, atraumatic dissection of tissues. We should avoid over-distraction and over near nervous or vascular structures and protect the important vessels like the carotid and vertebral artery. At the end, we employ an automatic extubation. Communication between surgeon, anesthesiologist, and quantified personnel in the operating room is essential. In our medical center, a safety post is always done before we start surgery. We review our surgical plan. We comment that experienced staff is present and the appropriate instruments are already available. We verify that radiological studies are available in view and we share information and check that all precautions have been taken to treat high risk patients. These steps of the anterior surgical approach are well established. Mastery of regional anatomy is vital a clean and delicate dissection to avoid tissue damage on each patient is essential. The ergonomic position with slight neck extension is obtained by placing a small sandbag behind the shoulders. By section of the head with tapes and a slight attraction of both arm keeps this position and that permits that lateral X-rays to view the region of C6-7. The skin incision can be placed on the horizontal neck lanyard lines. A multiple exposure is required, and oblique incision can be following 
the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Some surgeons prefer approach from the left side, where the recurrent laryngeal nerve has a more constant trajectory. Observe the ergonomic position of the patient. Surgeon is on the right side, in this case, and is the chest behind the head of the patient. The skin incision is marked according to X-rays and known anatomical references. Mandible is about the C12, higher bone C3, thyroid cartilage C45, the chest is neck tubercle, and cricoid cartilage C6. Steady drapes are applied in the usual way. The pressure of the intubation back is frequently controlled to avoid tracheal damage. Use of these anatomical landmarks to localize the appropriate level of the disc space. Identify the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle and the omoyoid muscle inferiorly. You can retract this muscle to expose the lower cervical level. Palpate the carotid pulse laterally. The section laterally behind the sternocleidomastoid muscle may damage the jugular vein and vagus nerve. Make a digital dissection of medial fascia to identify by palpation the bone of the prevertebral plane. Identify the longus coli muscle and dissect under it longitudinally to replace retractors under the muscle. Delicate lateral retraction with a Casper blade, separating the carotid artery laterally, and medial retraction protects the esophagus and trachea. Avoid excessive or prolonged traction. Try to preserve thyroid arteries. Monitor recurrent laryngeal nerve, especially on the right side, where it is more inconsistent. Don't dissect, cut, or coagulate in the perpendicular direction to the longus coli muscle because it will damage the sympathetic chain and produce the Hordes syndrome. Be aware not to damage the thoracic duct at the left lower cervical area. After a skin and platysmal muscle incision, we do an undermining to obtain more space. We open the fascia medial to the sternocleidomastoid muscle and with digital dissection, we retract visceral esophagus and tracheal medially. And we palpate the internal carotid artery laterally. We continue the section and with palpation, we find the vertebral plane. We put a needle to check with x-rays the correct cervical level. This is a 56-year-old patient with cervical myelopathy and radiculopathy who required discodectomy and arthrodesis at two levels, C45 and C56. These steps are illustrated from the skin to the closure and the use of post-operative training. Precautions should be taken on each plane to avoid complication. Delicate medial retraction avoids damage to the esophagus and trachea. Delicate lateral retraction avoids lesions to the carotid artery. Two cages were implanted and secured with plate and screws. Postoperative drainage is maintained 36 hours. This patient with cervical kyphosis or inversion of cervical lordosis with a three level herniated disc and bone spurs with spinal cord compression. I prefer to use a left horizontal skin incision to avoid damage to the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Appropriate subdermal so undermining is used to obtain more dissection space and the post-operative drainage is left 48 hours sometimes. About other complications, this is a 60-year male with myeloradiculopathy at C34. It's by step by step is presented the left side of the skin incision is marked after X-ray control. The ergonomic position is adequate. And we expose the disc space with autostatic retractors. After discodectomy, a cage arthrodesis with plate and screws was used. Intraoperative X-ray control shows adequate plane and diffusion materials, post-operative drainage, and we use early extubation and prompt rehabilitation. Hormone syndrome due to injury of the sympathetic chain is not very frequent. It happens when retracting or dissecting perpendicular to the longus coli muscle. 
with a far lateral dissection, onward used monopolar with high power setting. <clears throat> Transient dysphagia occurs in prolonged and multi-level surgeries. We recommend avoiding excessive medial retraction with autostatic separators. It is also useful to reduce the inflation pressure of the endotracheal cannula back during anesthesia, and we use all intraoperative corticosteroids. Injury to the vertebral artery is a rare complication observed in rest, less than 2% of cases. May occur during lateral drilling next to the uncinated process. In an extreme lateral dissectomy or corpectomy, when exposing most lateral to disc space, or due to a lateral angulation of screws when we are fixing a plate. This is a very serious lesion that needs the assistance of endovascular procedures, direct vascular repair or ligature with neurological consequences. Recurrent laryngeal nerve paralysis causes dysphonia. <clears throat> with paresis of the vocal cords, it is associated with revision surgeries with adhesions, and also with cervical exposure on the right side of the neck, where this nerve has a re less regular path. Therefore, I prefer a left cervical approach. This phonia recovers in 80% of cases. On this arthrodesis with a fibular graft, there was a fatigue of the plate and the screw extrusion occurred. It was changed to a basket graft and a new plate was placed achieving adequate lordosis. On this 60-year-old patient with C456 mild rotaicobility and three-lever disconnectomy and atrodesis with three cages was employed. Pain persisted, pain persisted on the first post operative week. X-ray controls show kyphosis. The plate was small and did not cover the three levels. The cages were not high enough to restore lordosis. A new surgery using the higher cages and a larger plate corrected low doses and pain. This 56-year-old male with neck pain, paresis, and paresthesias on both upper limbs had herniated discs and osteophytes at two levels, C4, 5, and 5, 6. Intraoperative x-rays show that the cages 4 or 5 were asymptomatic and lateralized the position of the cages was corrected immediately. Post-operative hematomas with an incidence of less than 1% are associated with poor hemostasis, brain intubation, reoperations, excessive retraction, multi-level surgery, failure of the drainage system, and it's sometimes an, an emergency. This 50-year-old patient with cervical and spinal cord compression due to tuberculous infection in the 5-6, was operated with decompression at two levels, with case fusion. Intraoperative x-rays showed moderate extrusion of the upper screws. The lower screw was in the disc space. The place was too large, so a new shorter blade was implanted, and the screw for the duration was corrected, with a favorable outcome. Pharmacological treatment of or tuberculosis was continued for two years. Pseudo process is present in 2% of operator cases. It shows with persistent pain, radiculopathy, especially in cases with multi level surgery, osteoporosis, smokers, and with treated trauma. Adjacent segment disease is present in 8% of cases, especially in short insufficient fusions when multiple levels are affected, generally requires reoperation after a period of two or three years. Postoperative infections occur in 1%, and we can trigger sepsis in patients with risk factors such as immunodepression, diabetes, hypovolemia. Patients require repeated surgical cleaning procedures with intravenous antibiotics administered for prolonged periods of time. Esophageal perforation is a rare and serious complication with important morbidity and mortality due to the mediastinitis and sepsis. Precautions should be taken during placement of medial prevertebral separators. Avoid damage by plating screws, but drilling 
we should use medial retractors always to protect it. Excessive lateral retraction should be avoided. Avoid the use of monopolar carbulation. Extrusion of screws and plates and the preartival plane should also be corrected. Many factors may be taken into account during surgery, such as maintaining adequate hemostasis and exposure, avoiding excessive carotid and esophageal retraction, recognizing the cerebrospinal fluid fistula and its median closure. Early use of antibiotics and microscope are important. Interoperative radiological verification of instrumentation is vital. Electrophysiological monitoring, if available, should be done. Make the corrections as soon as possible in the operating room. As a final message, to avoid complications in anterior cervical approach, you should consider the importance of preoperative strategic assessment and planning. Set your goals clearly on time. When will you decompress, stabilize, and correct sagittal balance? and mostly preserve the neurological function. Do frequent laboratory training of anatomy and surgical techniques. Identify early possible problems and solve them in time. Work with your experienced and reliable surgical team. Use the base available technology and instrumentation and always follow up your patient carefully. For my conclusions, I will recommend the importance to use the protocols appropriate technology and teamwork. That is what we all expect. The patient is better. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, dear uh, professor, for this very informative lecture that we wish all our minds about complications of surgery that all new surgeons used to make it mostly every day. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Zain. Is there any question? Thank you. Viva Ecuador. Thank you all. Thank you. Nice work. Now we will shift to the next speaker, uh, Professor uh, Rakesh Kumar. Please start sharing your screen. Thank you, Samar. Uh, Thank you for your invitation. Just a minute. Yeah. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Hi, good evening, everyone. And thank you, Samir, for your invitation. I'm going to share uh, our experience with uh, uh, one of the uh, most recently uh, incorporated enabling technology in the spine. And uh, basically, it is for the both for minimal invasive and the complex spine. So uh, I'm going to share uh, my experience without any financial disclosure. And uh, for us, uh, especially with the uh, well-established practice, uh, uh, if you want to incorporate any of the enabling technology, new technology, so what is the most important thing we consider? We consider, of course, uh, basically, we are not going to compromise with patient safety and uh, uh, any of the concern related to the patient, but we don't want to interrupt our workflow. It is very important. So I'm going to share all this uh, like workflow and learning experience with the uh, our our new technology with MIS and complex spine with the uh, some uh, cases uh, pictures uh, which I'm going to share now. So when I was looking at the timeline for the uh, this development of augmented reality, so I was surprised to know that it's not the new. It's like fifty six years of history. And when I was trying to summarize in a few points, so few important years, so I was able to find out like, okay, 2018 was when Microsoft was introduced and uh, with the HoloLens and FD approval AR glasses were there. But uh, it is very recent in 2021 when Augmentics was approved for US FDA with X-Vision spine system, which we are using right now. So uh, as I, I, I discuss why uh, we are going to bet on AR. So especially with the complex surgery, which all, uh, our center is one of the uh, mm, uh, well-recognized center for adult deformity complex surgery. So yes, incorporating a simple and reproducible task was the uh, uh, one point with 
uh, surgical uh, efficiency enhancement was the second. And of course, uh, we are always concerned about two things. Uh, uh, basically, about the first is the like uh, how to reduce radiation exposure, especially in MIS cases. And uh, 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 second thing is like uh, we don't want to uh, interrupt our well-established workflow, which which is going to uh, somehow uh, um, uh, giving a little bit of more burden economically also. So with in uh, increased time for the duration. So of course, increased accuracy without a difficult learning curve was one of the important point. And the most uh, uh, important thing with the AI, uh, um, augmented reality was to enhance 3D visualization of the spine uh, apply, and which is applied on our ongoing 2D uh, 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 thing which is we are getting with the stealth and navigation system. And the, one of the uh, uh, most important point was like uh, uh, this system is uh, very, very friendly with uh, any of the implant system. Like it is not antagonist, it is agonist. So it was also a good thing and there is no massive capital expenses. So uh, when we uh, look after the uh, current utilization with the literature, so most commonly is the particular screw placement. There are a few cases or case reports or case series about the injections also. There was one uh, case uh, uh, study for the end block spondylectomy, and there is a few vertebral plastic, but here is our experience with the app. Of course, uh, we started with the particular screw percutaneous and open. And then we moved to TLIP. And then, uh, yes, uh, lateral one also. Uh, we did uh, uh, MIS spinal proliferation. Uh, this is very helpful in uh, our uh, uh, revision cases, especially with the spinal proliferation open also. Uh, although open is open was like learning curve was a little bit difficult than the MIS cases. And of course, the, when the complex anatomy is there, is the difficult pedicle anatomy, this was very helpful. And recently, we, we used this very successfully in the MIS thoracic disc surgery with the retropolaris lateral approaches for the MIS thoracic carpectomy also. <clears throat> So here are the few slides about the whole learning curve. So this is the usual practice uh, when we uh, uh, did this uh, uh, a week before for the thoracic disc. We planned everything. We uh, we replicate everything in our OR, and this is we don't want to uh, interrupt our workflow of timing efficacy. efficacy. So uh, we did all these rehearsal, especially with the OAM, and and when we are going to use this, and and what what are the steps, and and which at which step it is going to be most helpful. So this is all the practice just for uh, incorporating this new technology. And we we chase every minute, every second, uh, uh, what we uh, have added and how to improve it. Here are the few, few of the case example. We, as I said, that uh, uh, PERC, uh, particular screw fixation was the first thing. So this is the case with ALIF and PERC fixation. So you can appreciate here, uh, Mm, that uh, these two headsets are there and we are uh, with the headset the looking of the patient with the 3d visualization we are we are like doing all the um, planning uh reference marking and everything and and the marking of the incision and also and this is the usual thing so uh this is the headset you uh, both of the surgeon are wearing and and this is a small glass here in front of your eyes and what you are going to get is this picture so what is the added benefit of the like i i talk uh, earlier that uh, this technology has the most important benefit is all these two things is the two, two, two things we are getting with the navigation and stealth. This is going to add this 3D real-time visualization of your everything. So as a uh, trained deformity surgeon in the traditional way, I will say uh, I would like to use this technology, enabling technology for increased efficiency, ergonomics and everything. But I don't want to lose my uh, tactile and visual uh, natural feeling, so which I'm getting at the here. So you look at the patient, you you are you are getting the same tactile thing, same visualization with add-on 2D style thing. So this is uh, the one of the example for the screw placement, and then <clears throat> after this screw placement, this was uh, intraoperative uh, X-ray. So uh, next, uh, I would like to share our experience with the MIS TLIF. Uh, we do uh, this TLIF. So this is the first. Uh, uh, so all uh, after this uh, uh, reference frame, we are planning our, our stab incision and, and, and then screw placement. So planning is the initial bar, how it goes. So you are just uh, adding 2D with the 3D uh, real-time picture. And then you are the same thing. 
then after this screw placement uh, this is uh, the main benefit for the tele what we able to uh, find out like uh, uh, one of the surgery wearing this and and, and going for the uh, planning for the tele trajectory with looking of the 3d model and second surgery in the vision camera is clinically also observing and 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 uh, uh, it is also helpful for like training and like mentee and mentor or I mean or mentor and mentee to to exchange and then to to train uh, uh, the uh, one of the fellow or the resident in the best possible way that he is looking after this and one of the fellow uh, in this picture I I am doing this uh, uh, tele trajectory with the this model here and my uh, mentor is looking after uh, with the vision on the tubular uh, system so. Uh, this is the picture so you can appreciate here i'm planning the exact trajectory for the tulip case for the drilling and then uh, after this uh, uh, contract uh, decortication also i'm planning and i'm doing this decortication very well so uh, mm, what we summarize is the advantage for ar in the tulip is like less radiation of course there is like almost no radiation for us and uh, highest accuracy best ergonomics which is very very important for uh, like mrs or any of these fine surgeons Real-time U.S. assistance is one of the best things that uh, we find out. Uh, saving time without compromising the safety was the thing. So this is the next example for one of our, our partner did the like single position only uh, with planning and registration. So in this case, I will say it was the uh, benefit for uh, uh, getting a... Uh, mm, uh, to uh, plan for the screw placement uh, in the same position. So uh, so uh, there was a little bit of uh, less time consumed, uh, uh, which is approximately 15 to 20, 20 minutes or 30 minutes for the flip of the patient. So uh, this is another one case. So main, uh, <clears throat> this case is a revision case, which is uh, uh, this technology is very helpful in these kind of revision cases when uh, you you are you are getting a difficult pedicle uh, not me due to previous surgery or, or some other pathology so now uh, here uh, in this l4 to pelvis uh, with the revision of l5 and s1 screw trajectory this is the s2 <laughs> lr iliac uh, um, uh, planning for the screw planning and the burr and then uh, <clears throat> this is universal drill guide uh, uh, for the same uh, screw and this is the uh, like tap and wire and then uh, we place this uh, S2AI screw in, the, uh, in this uh, open uh, one. Then uh, uh, regarding the S1 revision, so it, it was difficult because there was a uh, trajectory and uh, the, the amount of bone uh, left was very uh, less, but it, it was really nice that we are able to plan and we are able to execute. Uh, the good strength of uh, and the, the uh, same length of uh, uh, and the bigger diameter of the screw. So uh, next is <clears throat> our uh, uh, very interesting case uh, uh, with the L4 to pelvis MIS quadrot spinal pelvic fixation. Uh, uh, this case, uh, 63 year male presented basically with a diagnosis of extramedullary plasma cytoma uh, after the five cycles of radiotherapy, but unable to walk and stand and sit. So after the multidisciplinary team, uh, it was uh, uh, like discussed about the plan and the planning was uh, for the palliative AR assisted minimal invasive L4 to ILM instrumentation with quadrate spinal pelvic fixation for this uh, extra uh, medullary plasma cytoma. What we did, uh, first of all, you can appreciate here there are three centimeter uh, only both side uh, lateral incision. Uh, through which we did uh, a spinal pelvic fixation in this patient. And this was helpful in the patient because uh, he, he was already with the five cycles of chemo, so uh, less muscle damage, uh, less chance of infection, and everything was at its benefit. So we plan our trajectory with this, this uh, uh, um, small uh, incision where it was just you were looking of the uh, uh, patient you get all the three different uh, images and it's it's like mimicking the open with the mis uh, incision so instrumentation as intropin was the challenging point we did very well so it it was yeah and the, this is the benefit for like uh, getting a, a dicom image with uh, ai assisted like 3d model so this was another benefit and this was a great uh, uh, benefit we find out like uh, uh, 
this is a, a rod for these kind of patients. The rod plan planning is very difficult, and you can plan actually with the three D uh, real time three D model uh, it very well. So, and then uh, this final shots after uh, uh, two eyelid bolt. One is going to the L4 to down and L5 to down, and and this patient was. <clears throat> It's a post-op picture, and uh, this case report is the inaugural case report and literature, and, and under the review of for the, after the submission from our side. So this is the uh, um very recent case uh, we plan for minimal invasive retroperitoneal thoracotomy approach for thoracic discotectomy. It's like a uh, is a very big calcified disc you can appreciate here. Uh, at uh, with uh, three uh, T9 to T12 posterior spinal fusion. So it's for pin reference and registration mark setup the lateral position and you can appreciate here the x um, the uh, x vision visualization here um, uh, one of the surgeon is uh, uh, bearing this uh, um, uh, um, ar uh, augmented reality thing and and uh, one of the even this uh, um, surgeon is directly working and and and, and uh, with the guide from the x vision and the ar so you can appreciate here the intraoperative ar visualization so uh, this, <clears throat> so in this picture, because we are trying to find out like uh, when we are able to completely decompress without taking any uh, um, interrupting the workflow of the thing. So uh, you can appreciate in this picture, uh, we are able to appreciate that we are on the uh, upper side of the calcified disc. And now after the decomp complete decompression, you, are able, uh, you can appreciate this is the complete uh, like detachment of the calcified a disc so it's a complete decompression of this part and then after this uh we went for the uh setup for the um, screw placement especially in the corpac partial corpac me vertebrae it was challenging but it was very easy with this studio visualization and you can appreciate the all these screws was, went very well so uh with this case is what is still it we are not satisfied is this uh, like uh, current available ar thing so what is the future perspective what is the like uh, 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 future thing to go so yes the anatomical overlay is one thing uh, we want everything to be there like not only the bone we want to see the soft tissue structure blood uh, like blood vessels structure and everything in Integration of the machine learning is one thing. Second thing is robotic platform uh, integration is maybe a future. And uh, of course, uh, potential process for the bone removal as to why ergonomic standards are still pending. But as uh, a complex spine thing, as uh, I will say, uh, planning and execution of corrective osteotomy is one of the things we are looking after. Especially, we want uh, this technology to be helpful for perfect me and spinal tumor resection. So to conclude my presentation, I will say this is not the only fancy to our equipment. It will be advanced opportunity to allow to make big changes in providing excellent patient care in a cost-effective manner. Thank you very much. Thank you, my dear friend, uh, Dr. Akish, for this excellent presentation. Is there any question? Thank you. Thank you. And now we will shift. Yeah, to yeah I have a question. I have a question, Sam. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, real quick. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kumar. Now, I guess you didn't have to convince the, the hospital administration to use this technology, right? Uh, it, yeah. Or did it take some time to convince them to try it? Yeah. So that's that's why I, I emphasized in my first slide that whenever you are going to use this, especially the enabling technology with uh, AR and all. So you have to convince hospital about the like economic perspective. So if this technology, if any technology who is going to incorporate your, in your present workflow of the system without increasing significant duration of your surgery with this, and, and also it is adding some safety efficacy with uh, uh, not too much of like, monitor burden i don't think okay. no one is going to uh like this is the way to incorporate this technology i would say so you had to do a lot of homework and get it together yeah. to yeah. present facts yeah 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 okay thank you thank you sir thanks again dr Akish. and now we'll shift to the next speaker uh, dr Koina. please start sharing your screen
Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Wonderful. Great. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Sammy. It's great to uh, be there virtually um, from California. Um, so I'm a professor of neurosurgery at Stanford um, and part of the WFNS Spine Committee. And so I'm very honored to be able to share with you today um, some tips and tricks for navigation technologies and thoracolumbar instrumentation. Um, and I actually really enjoyed um, the prior talk. Um, so this, I think, will be um, a very nice segue from that talk. Um, so just a few disclosures here in terms of my relationships with a few companies. I'm going to be talking about both 7D and stealth uh, traditional CT guided navigation. Um, I will not be talking about robotics uh, today. So I know we have a very international group here. Um, and so I do really want to preface what I'm saying today um, by um, by saying that I you know, I believe that what I'm um, that navigation and image guidance um, is very, very important, uh, particularly in the United States. Um, you know, it really is of utmost importance for us to be putting in screws um, with the highest accuracy and the highest precision. Um, and especially in our climate in the United States and our medical legal climate, um, the impact of misplaced pedicle screws um, is actually uh, huge. Um, so this is, you know, this case here in Dublin um, is actually uh, very low for rewarding of medical legal claims in the United States. They can sometimes be 10x as bad as this. Um, and they're also extremely common. And so we oftentimes think about, you know, the thoracic pedicle screws as being some of the hardest ones to place and the one that can lead to the worst outcome. But in the United States, it was actually found that the most commonly um, the most common medical legal cases were actually related to misplaced lumbar pedicle screws, which I'm sure many of us think are very, you know, quite easy to place um, using freehand anatomy given the larger size of the lumbar pedicles. Um, and every one of these cases resulted in an average payout of over one million U.S. dollars. Um, so we have a lot of. Um, data from meta-analyses that show that as we go from conventional, so freehand screw placement, to using 2D fluoroscopy in the operating room, and then to 3D navigation, across all screw types, um, we see a significant improvement um, in our um, in our accuracy, okay? Um, and this is not just for cervical and thoracic screws, but this also applies for lumbar screws. Um, in one of our own meta-analyses of over 50,000 screws, we found that CT-guided navigation had the highest accuracy as compared to freehand and fluoroscopy. Um, so, you know, none of us would go back to using compasses or paper maps as we're getting around. You know, everywhere we travel all over the world, we're always using our GPS-enabled phones. Um, and so I liken CT-guided guided navigation essentially to the GPS on, on the smartphones that all of us use across the world at this point. Um, so I'll start a little bit about talking about a case of stealth navigated minimally invasive fusion. Um, so uh, this is a 77 year old who presented um, with some cardiac disease, a history of prostate cancer and a, a recent prostatectomy now with a rising PSA. He came into an outside hospital emergency department with five days of lower back pain, progressive lower extremity weakness, um, and he was now unable to walk for the last 36 hours full strength in his upper extremities, and he had some pretty significant weakness in his legs, three out of five in his iliopsoas, four in his quad hams and plantar flexion, and just two in his dorsiflexion EHL. He was also similarly very weak in his left lower extremity, uh, two proximally, and four minus out of five in his quad ham and plantar flexion. Um, so you can see his MRI post contrast that's shown here on the left side of the screen. Um, and so in addition to having um, significant involvement of multiple vertebral bodies now with metastatic tumor, he also has this component of dorsal epidural disease that's causing severe spinal cord compression. Um, so given his acute uh, neurological decline, his inability to walk, and his significant new onset of weakness, I felt that he was a good candidate for emergent surgery. Um, and in this particular case, given his known history of tumor um, and the fact that he was most likely going to be getting additional radiation, chemotherapy, and other treatments after this, I felt that he was a really good candidate for a minimally invasive fusion. Um, so in this case, we did a minimally invasive T4 to 12 fusion um, with 
So with a midline incision and then with mini open laminectomies for metastatic cancer and for decompression of this dorsal component. Um, and so I'll just kind of go through the steps one by one in terms of using the stealth navigation system. Um, so stealth, as you all know, is from Medtronic. I'm not a consultant for Medtronic. Uh, just This just happens to be one of the CT navigation systems that was the first on the market. So has become very common, especially in the United States. Um, and what stealth navigation does is it relies on an intraoperative um, CT scan. So in this case, it's an O-arm scanner, which you can see here on the top right of the, of the, of the screen. Um, so you'll position your patient on your radiolucid Jackson or whatever other table you have um, for them to be in the prone position. Um, when I'm doing especially these um, hybrid approaches, so these mini open approaches, I will actually do a midline skin incision, uh, but not go down to the fascia. Um, use the C-arm, so intraoperative fluoroscopy, to approximate the level that we're operating on. Um, and then for the um, for stealth navigation, you want to do a small open midline incision to expose your spinous process superior or inferior to the levels of interest. So in the case of this larger T4 to T12 fusion, you'll be putting in a spinous process clamp both at the superior aspect of your incision as well as the inferior aspect of your incision because those levels are a little bit too much to span with just one specific clamp. Um, and really important when you're positioning your clamps, you want to make sure that they are as close as possible to the area of the spine that you're going to be navigating. But at the same time, you want them out of the way of any of the instruments that you're going to be bringing in. Um, and we'll talk about this as well, particularly in contrast to the other navigation platform that I'm going to share with you. But you want to make sure that you're thinking about your line of sight. So your camera that you've either placed at the head or the foot of the bed you want to be looking, considering the line of sight from that to your spinous process clamp and the reference array uh, with the balls that need to be seen uh, by that camera, as well as to the instrument that you're going to be holding up in the spine. And so essentially you want an order of camera um, and um, to spinous process clamp to instrument that's being shown right here. Um, so you're going to bring in after you've uh, positioned your patient, you've done your incision, you've placed your spinous process clamps or your reference arrays. These can also be PSIS pins um, if you're working lower down in the spine. Um, you bring in your O-arm, you perform an intraoperative O-arm spin. Um, and then at this point, I use the navigated probe to actually plan the stab fascial incisions on the sides. Um, so that's why it's a midline skin incision with fascial incisions on the side. You use the bovi to get down to the bone at each of these levels. Um, I bring in a navigated power drill. So I'm now looking up on my screen. I use this to drill the screw trajectory. Um, so we have several different platforms um, that actually now from from several different companies that um, favor a K wireless approach for these MIS screws. I actually always use a K wire um, after I've done my um, drilling. And the reason for that is that I like the tactile feedback that I get. Um, and I will tell you that I use this kind of as a check uh, because you know, with every type of navigation platform, you know, depending on what's going on with your patient and their particular spine, you can sometimes be off, okay? And there can be many, many reasons for inaccuracies of navigation technologies, um, not necessarily just because, you know, there's a problem with the technology itself, but because of something that's been happening intraoperatively or something unique to your specific patient, their size, etc. So I have actually found when I'm doing um, MIS screws occasionally. If I feel with the K wire and something is off and it's soft, that actually tells me, wait, there's a problem here. I need to go back. I need to re-spin. I need to re-register. Um, so that's why I do it. I then use a navigated cannulated tap over the K wire. Um, and then I place my navigated cannulated screw over this K wire. So the entire time that I'm putting it in, I'm constantly feeling, I know that I have walls on all sides of the K wire as well as a depth. Um, and this is definitely optional, um, but it's something that I do, especially because I work in a teaching hospital. So I oftentimes have, you know, I'll, I'll be doing my screws on one side, a resident um, with varying levels of experience will be on the opposite side of me. Um, and since I can't feel everything that they're doing at all times, it gives me great peace of mind um, to perform a quick intraoperative O-arm spin after all the screws have placed. I know that everything is good and there's no issues. Um, so in this particular case, back to our patient with the 
tumor. Um, so we can then do an after placing these screws through stab fascial incisions on the side, we can then perform a mini open decompression. Um, and then place the rods with the MIS rod inserters. Very important is checking um, on an AP uh, view in particular um, um, with the fluoroscopy in order to make sure that the rods are long enough, especially when you're doing particularly long rods. And I will say that in the last talk, I was very impressed with the MIS rods that were placed um, for that quad uh, pelvic case. Um, that definitely looks like they were, that, that that could be certainly very challenging to do MIS. So congratulations on that. Um, and then I use the navigated Midas burr to decorticate the facet joints and place some demineralized bone matrix to affect the fusion um, after the instrumentation. Um, so I find that these stealth minimally invasive cases can be fantastic um, for trauma cases. So you can see here on the left, uh, this is an example of a three column fracture in a trauma that was treated with a T9 to L1 uh, posterior fusion. Um, another chance fracture here um, that was also treated with a similar approach. Um, and in addition to using um, this particular approach for trauma cases, um, as well as for hybrid tumor cases like the first case. Um, I also find that this technique is great for degenerative spine. Um, so you can see here a patient that had a third time recurrent disc and foot drop. Um, it was treated with an ALIF and then uh, posteriorly placing these screws up percutaneously in the fashion that we described. So for with regards to stealth or any kind of CT-based navigation platform, um, I feel that it's ideal for trauma without significant compression for these hybrid video-opened separation tumor surgeries um, and can also be great for degenerative disease with primarily foraminal stenosis that we address the foraminal stenosis with the interbodies and that's sufficient. And then posteriorly, we can just provide um, the additional um, fixation. Um, I talked about how, in, especially in the case of the T4 to T12, you use two clamps and that involves two stealth stations for longer constructs with one camera at the head and one camera at the foot of the bed. It's really important to optimize your clamp placement so it's as close to the spine as possible, but not in the way of your instruments. And so I'll actually bring in sample instruments for where my, my pedicle trajectories are going to be at both the superior and inferior ends to make sure that they are not hitting the clamp. Uh, because if you move the clamp um, or touch the clamp at any point during your surgery, your navigation will be off. And unfortunately, the only way you have to fix that is to bring your O-arm back in. Um, it's a really important point to realize that your navigation can be off if you manipulate or retract soft tissue too much. This particularly becomes an issue in some of your bigger patients and some of your smaller wounds, okay? Um, so um, if you have retractors that are really pushing your soft tissue to the side and or if you find that with any of your stealth instruments, you are really pushing soft tissue over, um, if you relax your hand and you see where you are on the screen, that's actually probably where you are on the navigation um, and it can, you could can end up off that way. Um, and this is particularly a problem for us in the United States where we are treating a lot of larger patients. Um, and so traditionally, I think about these navigated MIS techniques as being excellent for some larger patients. Uh, but I have found that there's a limit to size of patients, even with MIS. So here's an example of a patient where I actually found that um, every single time we were putting in the instruments into his spine, they were so deep because of his depth that all of those balls were getting covered in blood and were not accurately seen by the trackers. So just something to keep in mind. Um, so I'm also going to talk about a technology that uses machine vision. And so this is 7D. Um, and this can be a great navigation technology platform um, to use for open cases. Uh, this is an example of a patient who came in through our emergency department. She obviously has a very bad uh, fracture dislocation and an unstable fracture at T10. She was a pedestrian versus automobile accident, and she had many traumas, including ab abdominal and aortic injuries, for which she had undergone open um, X-lap as well as cardiac surgery before this procedure. Um, so going to talk a little bit about how machine vision works. 
Um, so this is the same technology that we have in our um, in our tes Teslas or other self-driving cars. Um, so what you can see here as, as opposed to the Stealth or other navigation platforms from many other companies where they rely on an intraoperative OARM scan um, and then they register that um, to the spine. This uses um, machine vision technology. So this camera right here that go that has all of the surgical lights goes above the field um, and it takes a picture of the operative field, okay? Um, it then uses that picture to co-localize and register with your pre-operative CT scan that you've obtained for this patient. So you don't have to obtain an intraoperative CT scan for the patient. Um, so in the workflow for this, you position the patient, you'll use your C-arm to approximate the level just like you would for any navigation. Um, you will perform an open exposure down to the lamina and the TPs. And particularly for the 7D technology, it's really important to do a meticulous soft tissue removal, okay? Because this is relied, relying on a picture of your field. So if you have a lot of soft tissue or a lot of blood there, it's not going to get a great picture and you're not going to have a good registration. Um, you put a spinous process clamp near your region of interest, but I'll point out for why the placement of the spinous process clamp in 7D is not necessarily as critical as it is in stealth, um, because you can move the clamp over the course of your surgery, um, and you can perform an instantaneous re-registration, as you will see. Um, so it's one of the things that's a nice component of this type of technology. So you've placed your spinous process over your open surgical field. You bring your 7D machine over the field. You take take all of the other lights out of the field because they interact with this registration. Um, and then the 7D is going to take an instantaneous flash registration. It takes a few seconds. And what you can see here is it's taking an actual picture of the field. So you want to see good lighting near your area of interest. And you can see this right here is the spinous process clamp, this triangle shaped. Um, these are just our, our standard retractors that are in the wound. Um, so now that you've taken your flash registration, um, you have on the screen before the case, you've looked at a 3D version of your CT scan that was done preoperatively, and you've selected points that are in your region of interest that are going to clearly be exposed uh, in your surgery. Um, and so you then use this pointer um, that has these balls that are being tracked by the light that is above the field. So it's not at the head or the foot of the bed, it's above the field. So it's a different line of sight to get used to. Um, and then picking these points allows you to then co-localize. So all of these green points are points that have been thousands of points that are co-localized and registered with the preoperative CT scan. So this is very green and we know we're going to have a nice, great registration. Um, and at this point now, you're able to go and you're able to use a navigated probe, a tap, a screw, and look up on the screen and you can see these views just like you would in any of your other CT-based navigation platforms. So I use a navigated power drill that looks like this. I drill my screw trajectory. You can also use your navigated lanky probe if that's what you prefer. You've got a navigated tap to tap your trajectory. Um, and then, so this system is screw agnostic. So you can use any screw, um, any, any um, company's screw with this. Um, and so in addition to having um, so for that reason, they actually do not have navigated drivers, but you use what's this virtual K wire that's up on the screen here. So you can see that this is nicely in line. And so I know now that as I'm placing this in that this screw is going to be in place. Um, so you might think with these, with this open technology that it may not be as good for revision cases. Um, we found that you can actually, this works quite well. This is a patient who came to me um, and um, she had had prior spine surgeries, with, um, with a very interesting construct, just unilateral screws, okay, uh, that were placed above and below um, an incompletely resected calcified thoracic disc, now with worsening difficulty walking. Um, so we used the 7D navigation and we were able to register off of the one side of her hardware. Um, and then this was very useful because we were able to see, we did a posterior transpedicular approach for the decompression, um, as well as adding in, um, screws on the other side. Um, and this enabled us to see when we were complete and had you know, thoroughly decompressed this thoracic disc. So found the navigation uh, to be very, very accurate um, with the revision um, off of the prior hardware and also extremely useful, not just for the screw placement, but also for the discectomy itself. 
And another cool potent, another cool use that we've found for this machine vision technology um, is that because we're getting a preoperative CT scan, so this isn't the intraoperative OARM scan or ZEEM or other machines that you have that don't have quite as good resolution, we can actually also get a preoperative CTA or CT angio. So here's an example of an 86-year-old who had a non-healing uh, type 2 odontoid fracture for over six months in the setting of severe osteoporosis. Um, and so I opted to treat her with a posterior C12 fusion. And you can see here that you can actually get the CTA. So you can clearly see the anatomy of your vertebral artery here relative to C2 and relative to your C1 arch. Um, and so we use this in this particular case to um, make um, our posterior C1 and C2 screws even safer with regards to the critical anatomy that's back here. And you can see some of the images here. Um, from the screw placement in this case. Um, so 7D I find is ideal for open cases where large open decompressions are needed. Um, it's great for unstable spine fractures because as I mentioned, um, th that flash registration only takes a couple of seconds, okay? So um, if you're if your clamp moves, um, or if you need to move your clamp because it's close to one part of the spine and another part of the spine is completely unstable, you can just move your clamp, take another registration in a few seconds, and you don't have to do another an o arm spin. Um, but it has a lot of things that I've learned over the last few years using it in order to make sure that um, it is as accurate as possible. So you have to have meticulous bony exposure uh, with soft tissue removal. You need to get all your blood out of the field. You really have to pay attention to lighting and shadows during your flash, and you have to optimize your point picking for the best registration. So this includes at the most superior and inferior superior portions of your wound. You want to make sure that you're picking your points as low as possible because there's a lot of of shadowing from the muscle on the adjacent levels and similarly at the inferior aspects. That's where your registration can have the most issues um, when you're using this technology. Um, it's also really important. I find this especially with our residents as they're getting to use this. Um, it can be, um, we can, we're used to the line of sight for stealth and the other navigation platforms where you have a camera at the head or the foot of the bed. Um, and so we find ourselves leaning in with our heads. When we lean in with our heads, we actually block the line of sight from the 7D, which is coming from directly overhead. Um, and then another thing, which may be a bit surprising, but if you understand how this technology works is not. So some of the most challenging cases for the 7D are actually these one level lumbar fusions, because that's when you have the most amount of muscle and the biggest issues with shadowing. Um, so I actually will use um, stealth or other technologies for that. So in comparison uh, with other systems, there's an improved workflow. You don't need an intraoperative O-arm spin. It's very easy to obtain repeat flash registrations if the clamp moves and you have decreased intraoperative radiation exposure um, when using the machine vision technology, but it doesn't currently work well for MIS. Um, you really need meticulous bony exposure. You need to pay attention to your flash um, and your um, exposure and shadowing. And so in my opinion, it makes it very challenging for one or two level lumbar fusions. Um, here is some data, um, not from our group, looking at the machine vision technology versus traditional 2D fluoroscopy. Okay, this is not compared to the CT navigation that I mentioned. Main findings here are significantly decreased intraoperative fluoroscopy do dose with flash, uh, which is the 7D navigation, with equally very high pedicle screw accuracy. Um, so in conclusion, I believe, especially in certain um, practices and certain practice settings, that navigation is becoming the gold standard. Different navigation platforms have specific advantages and disadvantages. Um, machine vision image guidance can improve intraoperative workflow and decrease radiation exposure in the majority of open posterior spinal fusions. And then I want to thank our residents and our team um, at Stanford. Happy to answer any questions. And there's my email, um, as well as my cell phone. And that is a plus one at the beginning. Hello, Sam. Sam may have been cut off. Thank you, doctor. Uh, do we have any questions or comments from the panel? Apparently Sam stepped away. Okay, but I have a couple of questions. Uh, did it take Great. you, uh, did you see uh, you had an affinity for the tech and medicine? When you first started, did you really see that, hey, this is one part of medicine I really like? 
or is it kind of like you just adopt it because you had to? Great question. Um, I think that that's actually why I became a spine surgeon. Um, so, you know, I think really? um, I went into neurosurgery because, you know, the brain is amazing. Right. And I did neuroscience research and that's why I became a neurosurgeon. And I actually didn't realize that I, you know, I didn't even really know much about spine surgery and didn't realize I liked spine surgery until I started doing it as a resident, especially as a junior resident. Um, and I think that using some of these technologies um, and actually doing the physical components of the spine surgery were what drew me to spine. Um, so yes, I think that um, I think that that has been something that's always appealed to me about spine surgery. Um, I think there's always this this delicate balance, I think, especially when you're earlier in your career, like I am, um, where you want to kind of master the basics, but then you you want to know when is a good time to bring in a new technology um, because there's always a little bit of a learning curve at the beginning. Um, and, you know, especially as we are kind of coming in with more and more options. Um, I didn't talk about it in this particular talk, but I've had a lot of experience with um, robotic technologies as well. And they obviously have an entire different workflow a lot of different pros and cons, as well as different nuances in the um, in the learning curve. So I think that that's also always something that I think about in the back of my mind as well, is like, is this the right time for this technology? What's the learning curve going to be like for me, for Stanford, you know, for our nursing team, for our residents, and how is that going to go? Um, and uh, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's so much going on today. You've you've really got to edit what you spend your time on because yeah. there's so many so many things that you can go into. Uh, you know, one one thing that surprised me. I'm, I'm not a neurosurgeon. I'm just a regular doctor. But one thing that surprised me is the rapid advance of robotics. I never thought that would have any relevance to something like neurosurgery when I first was involved with it about seven or eight years ago. But that's advanced tremendously. It surprised me. It really surprised me. Yeah. But we'll see. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, and that ends it. And no questions or comments for anybody? Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Corina, for this. Oh, okay. there's Sam. There's Sam. Go ahead, Sam. <laughs> Sorry, I have uh, some internet uh, troubles. But thank you for this excellent presentation. Thank you, Professor Corina, for accepting my own invitation. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, very good. Thank you, everybody. Next, next speaker uh, is Dr. Luis Miguel. Okay. Sam, you're not well connected. Can't see your picture there. He is the last speaker for today. Okay. The next speaker, you want to step up, please? Now, Sam, don't leave me. Don't leave me in the dark. Oh, who's the next speaker? Please introduce them from a decent computer. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. He is uh, uh, believes upgrade his uh, him to a panelist. Okay, you, uh, you can. Who's the who is the speaker? Can you admit the person, Sam, or do I have to admit them? Okay, Sam, once again, who's the speaker? Sam, do you have the speaker? Oh, Luis Miguel. Okay. Okay, Luis Miguel. Let me see. Let me uh, let me get you in here, Luis Miguel. There you are. Okay. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. Oh, 
Okay, he's here. Hello. Hi, Lewis. How you doing? I'm here. <laughs> okay, good. Good. Sorry we kept you waiting. Uh, I want to... Very good. Let me introduce you first. Uh, okay, Luis. Luis Miguel Rodriguez is a frequent uh, speaker on the Latin American circuit. He's always ready to teach, and we appreciate that in Latin America. Uh, he was head of the Flank Spine Committee for for a while. He's pretty active politically, and uh, and he's going to speak us to, to us today. W welcome, Lewis. It's all yours. Hello, hello. Uh, do you view my presentation? Yeah, perfect, perfect. Do you see? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Ah, uh, thanks. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a great honor to be part of this important event. I am Luis Miguel Duchen Rodriguez, neurosurgeon from Bolivia. We will talk about a surgical indication for vertebral tuberculosis. I don't have conflict of interest. Unfortunately, there are no universal uniform objective criteria to establishing whether a case of spinal tuberculosis requires surgical treatment or not. This ambiguity is a factor responsible of weak variability of surgical decision making. This situation delays surgical treatment of leads to unnecessary surgeries. We consider, we consider that the extent, existence of the determining factor for decision-making are neurological deficit are instability. In the Latin American Federation of Neurosurgical Societies, we create a growth to study vertebral tuberculosis with neurological surgeon for the majority of the countries of the Federation. One of the group's investigation has the objective to establish the determinant of instability of spinal tuberculosis and whether this is a complete and universally applicable classification for decision-making. We do a systematic review adheres to PRISMA criteria, analysis of quality evidence to establishing determinants of instability in spinal tuberculosis, if there is any complete and universally applicable classification for this decision-making. We carry out systematic review of literature with terms than are shown. After applying the inclusion and exclusion criteria, we obtain seven articles. We apply the gray criteria mm -hmm. and we establish it short recommendation. Due to the small number of articles found, it was decided to include other articles cited by the analyzed articles. As a result, we obtained the following criteria as determinant for instability in vertebral tuberculosis. Considering that neurological deficit is an important criteria for defining surgery, we consider the first element for this decision making. The factor of instability are age, disease localization, pain, cyphosis, 
predicted cyphosis, number of affected vertebral bodies, vertebral body height loss, the spine are rig signs, epidural abscess, paravertebral abscess, cervical instability. We analyzed the classification of vertebral tuberculosis and relate one cited here. We analyze the classification of vertebral tuberculosis and related when has cited here. Our conclusion was the none of the classification included the neurological deficit and all the criteria of instability determined in the analysis of the literature. It's for this reason that we propose a new surgical classification for vertebral tuberculosis that you can download in this precise moment using the QR. I request that you download this classification so that I can to explain in the following slides. The first, first parameter of classification is a neurological deficit. It's an essential parameters in defining the therapeutic plan and take into account decrease of absent mobility, uh, mobility sensory disturbance, loss of control, anal and blunder sphincters. Even patients with established paralysis can benefit from this compression. So surgical treatment is indicated regardless of the etiology of the compression and the time of onset motor deficit. This study shows patients who have recovered muscles strength even after 21 days of paralysis. We propose these parameters and a score for neurological deficit, plagia, power grades, sensory disorders, and loss blender and blower control. Early age is a significant predictor of the progression of deformity. Just like other others, we apply a higher score to patients aged less than or equal to 15 years. Spinal tuberculosis with vertebral destruction of the junction between a rigid and flexible ratio of the spine. Therefore, we propose this score according to the locations of the disease. Pain can have different characteristics. Show the score, we suggest take these variants into the account. The surgical indication according to different others should be specified with cyphosis of 40 degrees in adults, 30 degrees in children, or with a predicted cyphosis of 60 degrees. We propose these parameters and scores it than each end. The predicted cyphosis or more than 60 degrees alone has an individual score in our classification. Multi-level contiguous tuberculosis is a critical indicator of instability. Thus, we give these scores. Vertebral body height loss greater than 0 0.75 pro produce facet joint disruption and unstable spine. We use the Rasha Sekaran methodology for this parameter. The spine at risk signs proposed by Zaha Sekaran have an important place in the classification with high score for being signs of severe instability.
respect the epidural abscess, there is a controversy regarding to the relationship between the percentage of occupancy of the epidural abscess at the neurological deficit. So, so we propose a score that could gate decision making. Paravertebral abscesses are critical, especially, especially the anterior cervical and thoracic, requiring surgical drainage. Its leg is also critical, which is we we propose this score. Cervical instability due to vertebral tuberculosis is another intendant is based of these parameters in literature and include this item in the classification. Once the score are added, we consider that that is established. No surgical zero to 10, potentiality surgical 10 to 15, surgical greater than 15. We consider that we shall also include disease modifiers that are still being studied, but could be decisive in making decisions in specific cases. For example, vitamin D deficiency, drug resistance, HIV co-infection, serum albumin levels, malnutrition, and others. This, this is the imagine of Ujuni in my country, Bolivia, and La Paz City. Thanks. Going for that, Doctor Megul, for this excellent presentation. Is there any question? Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Pleasure. At the end uh, of its EWNC Academy celebration, I'd like to congratulate you all for this excellent presentation that we have enjoyed for uh, us today. For about 20 or more over 30 hours of non-stop surgery and spine learning. I congratulate all the speakers that we have done the mission more than extraordinary success and congratulate you all for enjoying all this learning and teaching. We have reached the highest levels of education with new neuroscience and I hope to see you all next in another meeting. Thank you all. That's all for this job. Thank you. See you. It's yours, John. Yeah, I'd like to thank Lewis and all the presenters for generously giving their time uh, to teach uh, the world of neurosurgery. And Sam, when, when, is, when is our next webcast? When is our next conference? We will arrange. We will arrange. Thank you. Okay. Okay, everybody. Thank you very much. Have a great Sunday.